you've seen the Speed Chess Championship. Now it's time for the rest of us to get a turn. With no Grandmasters allowed, it's the I'm Not a GM Speed Chess Championship. Watch your favorite chess personalities duke it out in Chess.com's exciting Speed Chess format. There will be brilliancies. Lady sacking another pot. Bishop C3 and Rook A1. Oh, Rook A1. There will be blunders. No, no, he fell for it. 16 players are fighting for a chance at the eight player knockout. See old rivalries. This is how New foes. With a $15,000 prize pool, who will take home the crown this year? There and it is. that is the match. The IMSCC starts right now. Welcome everybody to the I Am Not A GM Speed Chess Championship. I'm Robert Hess. Alongside me is my good friend, James Kane III. James, we saw groups A and B yesterday. Greg Shahadi, he gets by in a nail-biter over Aline Robers. Levy Rosman had an easier task, but still some stiff competition. What do you expect to see today, James? I am excited. I'm here with Robert Chess and the chat. It's going to be amazing, okay? We got Group C and D today. We got Danny the Manny, a.k.a. the greenest of the greenest pawns. Danny Wrench is playing today, right? We got a lot of uh, lineups. We got Paulina Shuvalova, 25 Hondo, okay? Fee Day. Fee Day, right? So she's really, really strong. You got David Martinez. And we have the Big Greek. I mean, this is crazy. This is going to be a nice lineup here. And it's, it's, it's going to be reminiscent of yesterday. Nothing but. Nothing less. I'm with you. It looks sort of like Group A. You don't know who's going to win it. So, chat, get involved right now as you look at Group C. Will it be Paulina, the Big Greek, and Georgios Suletis? David Martinez, better known as El Divis, or Danny Wrench, your favorite fake titled Chief Chess Officer of Chess.com. James, these are four great contestants, players who are familiar to the audience and some who are playing more over the board but less of content creators. So as we dive into the details, let's talk about the tournament format because a year ago, things were different. If you weren't here yesterday, I don't know where you were. I don't know what you were doing, but you made a mistake because this tournament format includes four groups of four players. It is a round robin, all play all. The group winner advances. Everybody else is eliminated. So only one name can sail through to the semifinals. And the time control is such that they play six games unless it's tied three to three, in which we'll get Armageddon. But James, two games of five minute plus one second increment, two of three plus one, two of bullet. Do you like this mix of time controls? Bro, I hate this format, okay? You know what I mean? I mean, I love it and I hate it. And the reason why I hate the format is because of the two games. They made it much harder. Of course, chess.com always going to make it harder on you, right? Because you know, we want you to be better and they want it to be tougher and more competition. In a way, last year in the IM, uh, IMSCC, I made it to the finals. I was hype about that. I had three matches where it was just me and you. We just doing our thing. This is a tango. You know, it's a date right now. We're going to do our thing, and we're going to fight, and one of us is going to come out of here. But here, it's, it's three players, you know, different styles. You got two games, 5-0, five, five, oh, you know, 5-1, I mean. And if you lose the first two games, I mean, that could be it. You can, you can't do that, you know, in this format here. And as we seen yesterday, you, use, you lose one or two games, it could be over. Three and a half being a match, that makes it very scary and much tougher. As you said, that in the longer formats, for example, when Hikaru Nakamura is playing Maxime Vachelograv, he lost a bunch of games to start, and he still came back in the match. At six total games, you don't have that opportunity, but we do start with these two matchups because everyone gets to play everyone, but you got to start with somebody. And James, as we look at this, Paulina Shuvalova, the flawless fighter, takes on Divis, and then we have the big Greek, not Giannis Antetokounmpo, but Georgios Suletis. He takes on none other than that doofy smile Danny Wrench. <laughs> He's like, yeah, I am the green pawn. Hey, guys, that's me. Yeah. Yes, the green pawn, a.k.a. Danny, right? That's where he is. Of course, we got Polina Shubalova, David Martinez there. Uh, we got Divis and Big Greek, man. It's awesome to see him playing. And then you got Big Danny here. So Danny can definitely swing, guys. Don't get it twisted. The man definitely is a veteran in these formats and he's also played here too as well i think he made it through a few times in the imscc so very strong field here i don't know who is going to take this one 
And you said the veteran yesterday, Greg Shahadi. He's a uh, you know, longtime international master. He made it through from his group. And then Levy Rosman, better known as Gotham Chess, he did the same. But Danny Wrench, he's somebody who is often speaking to the masses as a great commentator. He's well-established. You know him well. But today, he's got to let his moves do the talking, as he did back in 2019 at the Denver Open. He beat Grandmaster Alexander Fishbein in the last round. He also beat a couple international masters on his way to a tie for first place. He's a beloved commentator, analyst, and lecturer. And, of course, that made-up title, Chief Chess Officer James, the CCO. That's not real, but what is real are his good moves. In fact, yeah, he, you know, he looks like, oh, ha ha, I am the green pawn. Ah, uh-huh, yeah, it's Danny. It's all fun. Ah, uh-huh, ha uh-huh. ha. And then you sit at the board, and then you think it's the same thing, and it's nothing fun around here, right? Says Danny. So you definitely need to. Hey, you see the smile, but don't don't be fooled here, guys. He definitely knows what to do on this board here, just like the rest of the uh, the participants in Group C. Yeah, Group C is really tough, and we have that mix of that youthful energy and up-and-coming players and some people who have been around for quite a while. And it's not to age them, but the big Greek, as he is known, he is such a prolific author, journalist, coach, you name it, he does it. He has 5-plus million views on YouTube, 55,000-plus followers on Twitch. So in fact, go subscribe to his YouTube Go follow him on Twitch right now. Mods, help us out. Link to the Big Greeks channels. He's also the oldest player in the field. James, he earned that IM title back in 99, not to steal a lie from Sean Kingston. Wow, nice. <laughs> yeah, 1999. I was just learning chess then, about seven years old, just learning how to play the game myself here. And he was already like, yeah, young fella, I'm an IM already. So the man has been around the block here. He knows what to do, as you see. Look at him, just stoic. Keep calm and play chess back there. This is Sparta, and you see that up there? With the with the classic walk-off, Robert. You see that Sparta <laughs> up there? Wow, don't get kicked in the chest. This is Sparta. James, you're from Michigan. I know you're looking at that like it's a Michigan State sparked yeah, in, like but that. he's the OG, right? He's got that Sparta logo in the background. You know he's ready for a fight. Oh, he's definitely ready for a fight here. I mean, he got the nice setup going. He's ready. You know, this is another day in the park. Chess is a full-time thing. And, of course, he's been doing this a very long time. I am in 1999. That's an absolute legendary beast, right? So, of course, he's going to bring a lot of that experience, as we saw with Christoph Selecki yesterday. Hopefully, it is enough for him to be successful today. For sure. And the Big Greek brings that experience, as does David Martinez, who is better known as Divis if, to the masses because he's a well-known commentator. He's also the international partnerships manager for Chess.com. Chess.com's own Divis. He's the coach of the Spanish national team of Ajedrez, which means chess. And he also is, of course, a very beloved analyst and content creator. 400,000 plus views on YouTube. And there is the man, the myth, the legend. Look at that hat. He is ready to go, James. Yeah, he's ready to go. You know what I mean? He's like, yeah, it's just it's work. You know, where you at? Oh, yeah, I'm at, I'm at work right now. Like, what do you do? I mean, I'm just playing. I'm just playing chess. Like, what do you mean? I'm, I'm working. Leave me alone. Let me hang up the phone and get to work here as he is, you know, being the coach and the head coach of that team like that, man. Hey, look, Spanish team is no joke. So having uh, the, the head coach ready to work and do his thing here says a lot about him. Says a lot about, you know, him loving the love for the game as him playing and him competing today. And I'm, I'm curious to see what he does i mean anybody is capable of taking these sections here so let's say you know he gets a hot hand anything could happen he says put me in coach i'm ready to play well he is the coach he is ready to go he put himself in there and he will have his hands full with this field so james prediction time who do you think is making it through group c Ooh, that's a good one. Okay, I have two picks. It's between Danny and Shuvalova. Of course, you can always be wrong, but yeah, you got a little Danny the Manny there. Look at him doing work on his side. Yeah, oh shoot. Hey, I got a meeting. Yep. Yeah. All right, cool. Yeah. Oh, where's that green pawn thing? All right, cool. Oh, I got to play. He's doing so many things behind the scenes and making it happen here for chess.com, the chief chess officer there. But my picks are either Shuvalova or Ranch. What about you, Robert? Oh, it's a tough call for me. I think Paulina, she is the highest rated player in this field. She's 2,500 plus Fide, but Danny, he's been working on his game. He is not taking this lightly. And in fact, chat said 48% of them went with Danny Rent. Wow, so he's not going to be a tool today. Don't mess with him. 48% mm-hmm. chat. They like Danny. Let's go, big Dan the man. 
Well, that is that's nice to see, chat. Wow. Okay. Put your pics in the chat. I see you, chat. I see you out here. Lots of details. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Robert. All right. What you thinking? What you thinking? Who who is your pick, Robert? Well, We're gonna put you on the spot here, big dog. I said Paulina Chihuahua, she's the highest rated, so let's introduce her to the fans as well because she is 2,500 plus Fide. She played in the WSCC last year. She wow. earned her IM title in 2020. That is a full 21 years after the Big Greek, but she has a list of accomplishments that rival some of the best out there. She won the girls under 20 back in 2019. She also was a youth champion in 2018 and all the way back in 2012. She won the World Youth Chess Championship under 12 girls. So she continues to rack up the trophies. She has crossed that 2,500 threshold. James, I hope this is the last time we see her in the IMSCC because she becomes a grandmaster. Yeah, she's extremely strong here. And in fact, actually she played last year. She's a veteran. Um, she played last year. Unfortunately, she didn't make it through. Only reason because uh, we played and I made you. it through. I, yeah. <laughs> I did I did make it through. I won that match. And, but at the same time, um, I'm glad I'm not playing this year because I don't have to play her again. Like, I'm good. Like, I, I don't want no trouble with her. 2,500 feet. She's definitely a beast in the field here and an underrated player for sure. So uh, it's good to see, you know, obviously the accolades here. She's playing great chess. And, of course, she's doing nothing but improving every single year. She played in Global Chess League and, like, all these events and playing great chess. So we're going to see a lot of that come out today as well. And she's the youngest player in this group by far because she's playing against the veterans. And when you're going against the vets, sometimes you need to be an animal. And she's a flawless fighter. She is willing to go at any single player. She's super aggressive. And I think that she could take this group. If she's on form, I don't see why not. Not just the field in this group, actually, but the entire competition. She is that strong. And we should talk about the stakes because only the winner goes through to the semifinals that starts after the weekend. And $6,000 per group, $200 awarded per win, $50 awarded per loss. So even if you're losing out there, still getting some money. But I think what they care more about, even more so than the dollar dollar bills, is that ticket to the semis because they want to join Greg and Levy and whoever wins Group D for next week's action. That's pretty good payday, right? $200 a game, big dog? Hold on, man. Hey, look, Chad, look, don't try this at home, but $200 per win? Hey, man, you know what? We talking kind of nice there chess.com you're talking kind of nice there but that is also also a nice incentive to hey look i need to get some dubs up and if you don't win okay you still made 50 bucks i mean hey it's a win-win situation sounds pretty good so for these players uh, they have a lot at stake but they really want to get through because many of these players they are let's call them retired over the board danny we talked about his win in 2019 in the denver open that was great to see him back at it otb classical but most of these players they're spending much of their time teaching everybody how to get better how to improve their game so paulina she's incredibly active she's one of those people who's not yet a content creator maybe she will be but danny and the big Greek. That's that first matchup, James. Who you got in that individual match? I got to go with Danny. I got to go with Danny. Uh, he didn't pay me to say this one. Of course, you know, he does pay me to say a lot <laughs> of stuff. But he didn't pay me to say that one. So, you know, I'm going to throw that out there. And, like, Danny, I, I, I'm going to go with Danny here. I do. I am a fan of his style. We're kind of like, you know, in a way, I, I actually like, a, you know, I love aggressive chess. He plays pretty aggressively. You know, I'm not familiar with his D4 repertoire, but I do know he likes Sicilians. And of course, from the white side, he plays one E4. So he's just, you know, exciting, exciting chess here. He wants to play and he, he's not playing as much, obviously. So, you know, he's just doing all the behind the scenes work. So when he does play, it's always a nice treat to see what, he, what he's going to bring and how he's going to play the game. And he has been training. He's taking this seriously. Of course, he has so many responsibilities, but he has been looking at chess, playing practice games against others. So he wants to win this. It's not something that he takes lightly. And the big Greek, we keep talking about it. He became an IM in 1999. That's crazy. Paulina Shubalova was born two years after the Big Greek became an IM. We know that he's great at explaining the game. He's also fantastic at playing it. I think that's something that people forget at times. Peter Svidler, who is not in this competition because he's a super grandmaster, I think people recognize him as a commentator, but not so much as a player, even though he's an eight-time Russian champion. We see here the Big Greek. This dude can play. He is super strong. And as you can see in his background, there's the Queen's Gambit. There's Sparta. There's Keep Calm Play Chess. His life revolves around that board game, and he wants this title. 
Bro, everything back there is. I mean, you look at them on YouTube. We got the plaque back there. That, that might, is that a hundred k? That might be a hundred k subs. That's like hundred plus something like that. Look at all the chests behind him. Like that guy is a guy that knows what he's doing. Okay, so you know the setup is real nice behind him there, and he might set you up real nice on that board as well. So be very careful with the big rig. And the chess boards may be behind him, but his best chess may still be ahead. He can give us an absolute delight today, and we are experiencing some technological difficulties with the players. We're getting them set. We take these events very seriously. And while we do that, we're just going to have a chat with somebody that's familiar to you, so we'll bring him on very shortly. But James, I mean, when you talk about this field, this competition, they're joining Greg. They're joining Levy. Do you see the winner, whoever you believe it to be, Danny or Polina, out of Group C having a legitimate shot at the title against those two and whoever wins Group D? 100%. Absolutely. Levy's in excellent form here, so it's going to be very, uh, you know, getting past that storm. And also, Greg is just a magician, as we've seen there. He made it through. He's He, he was, like, winning and losing positions, if that even makes sense. Like, he's just losing a position, but then he somehow figures out the resources, what he needs, and it's, it's going his way. Now, of course, that won't be the story the entire time. It's going to be difficult for Greg to, you know, make it all the way through like that. Levy, if he keeps up the same thing, it's going to be very hard for everybody. And, and then in Group C, Shuvalova or Danny passing through. I mean, any of those guys. Really, it's up to whoever is really hot that day, as always, always what I like to, you know, say and think about. If they're in great form that day, I mean, really, anything can happen, especially with these small matches as we have so far. Well, we know one match will be Levy versus Greg. So who do you actually see winning that individual matchup? Will it be Greg, Ooh, the magician, or Levy, yeah. who was demolishing his opponents yesterday? You know what? Based off of uh, what we've seen, Levy is the favorite there. Because Levy just, I mean, cr crushing the matches there besides uh, the Shreyas Royal one, which was kind of a toss-up in a way. I mean, I mean, he was able to win it. But, I mean, it was, uh, I mean, the first three matches was just, or first two matches were just, you know, crushing. And, and Levy, if he stays in that good form, it's going to be very difficult to fight someone in that type of form there. So, it is going to be tough for Greg, but... I mean, Greg was the, losing games he was not supposed to, or and he was winning them. Or he was winning games he's not supposed to, and, and, and you know, it's just it's a lot of it. So he made it through, but I think Levy's a little slight favorite there. Yeah, I have to agree with you on that front. Levy just looked to be in great shape yesterday, at least for those first two matches. And when you're crushing everybody, he w was spotless it was perfect score you start losing some of that momentum but he was able to get it done and well we have somebody on tap for the show we have danny wrench joining us for the show so danny welcome and how you feel today now that you actually have to play some chess the green pawn what's up uh, yeah i i honestly i don't know how, how i'm feeling um it should be it should be fun i uh have had a few late night training sessions um with a with an unnamed staff member this week um playing some blitz and some bullet and the bad news is i got my ass kicked that's the bad news and but the good news is that i i actually don't know if there's any good news here um but i don't know that i'm coming into this match super confident just being real Literally don't care. That's actually, uh, you know, have that, you know, that, that Hikaru mindset there. Literally don't care, Danny, right? Well, you look well. You look like you're well. You look like you've been, you know, you're ready to Thank swing you. today. Because you're going to have to do a lot of that, Danny. You're going to have to do a lot of that. I, I, I'm I, going to try. And I'm, I, you guys can hear me fine and everything? Yeah? Yep. Yeah, we can hear you perfectly. O okay. Yeah, okay, great. Um, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm. I'm feeling I'm feeling ready to play. I'll say that. And I, I will say this not to not to make uh, uh, whatever you got to break a few eggs to make an omelet, I guess. You know, sometimes it's good to have your, your ego wrecked before you play a chess match, because I think I tend to play better when I'm operating from a high sense of insecurity and self-doubt. And so if that was the mission as far as this week's games, mission accomplished, mission accomplished. So we'll see how it goes. Denny. But anyway, we're going to let your yeah. chest do the talking, but people want to know where where's the green pawn costume at right now? Where is that? Where is the green pawn right costume is at the office. This is my this is my house, um, a one that I, I am rarely on camera for. Um, and you can actually see the fun little fair play camera behind me there. You see that laptop right there? You guys want to see how that looks there? I'll show I you. I see that. That's fair play, baby. Yeah. I love how Danny's like having a 
private conversation with us, despite the fact yeah. that you know there's so many people watching. There you there's go. that fair play there camera. You can see. Fair play, yeah, it is. Looking like good. See it. Happens. Shout out to the fair, fair play players. team crushing it, looking hard. There you go. That's the behind the scenes look right there. <laughs> All right, there you go. That looked um, like but a where am I? I'm at my house. The, nice. the, the green pawn, the green pawn is at the office where it belongs because, as my wife has reminded me, he is not welcome in my home. That's what she said. The last time I walked into the house in the green pawn costume, she said he is not welcome in my home. Like, like get him out, and then you can come back. And then so that's that. So we don't bring the green pawn home anymore. Wow. Yeah. Happy wife, happy life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I feel like I'm saying things and you guys That's are just a, leaving me hanging. Danny here. I mean, <laughs> happy <laughs> wife, happy life. Yeah, leaving but, you hanging. Um, you guys are leaving me hanging yeah, like yeah. a pawn. No, yeah. You know? Um, Not, well, anyway, oh. I'm excited for today. Do you like that? That's the commentator coming out. Um, but uh, anyway, I, like I am it. excited for today. I'm excited to catch some recaps of how you guys commentate on my bad chest. That'll be fun. I'll see the clips later. So don't hold any punches back. Don't hold anything back. Um, and uh, and I'm ready. We won't. But Danny, why you got to be negative to start with? Why don't you hit us with some smiles and optimism and let the people know it's going to be okay, even if the results don't go your way? Well, I'm looking at I'm looking at chat and I see a lot of people rooting for the big Greek. And I was like, I think I'm rooting for the big Greek. No, but I'm I'm no look, I'm I don't compete that often anymore. And I try to keep my expectations low. You know, they say that happiness is the delta between expectations and reality. And the best way for me to stay happy is to keep my expectations close to reality, which is that I'm not as good at chess as I once was. And I'm, and I'm OK with that, Robert. I'm OK with who I am. OK. Well, Danny, I had a scorebook growing up that said happiness is a past pawn. So go get your green pawn costume, half of the time, get past, and get past the big Greek and the others, and then we'll see you later. So, Danny, go, get that you go play. All so right. Yeah. you out of this call. Yeah, we need that. <laughs> Bye, Danny. <laughs> it's always fun to get Danny on the call. Usually he is calling the games, uh, providing analysis and entertainment to everybody out there. But now he's going to do that with his moves James, you think he sounded ready or did he sound a little scared? I think he's 100% ready. You know, when Danny's in that mode and he's just, you know, cracking jokes, good energy, you know what I mean? Just being Danny the Green Pawn, you know what I mean? Everything is just a good day in life. And I think he is going to actually, you know, feel good. He had that, that as he mentioned, he got crushed by some staff member. And that's cool. Good, cool ego check. You know, it makes you feel a lot better. You just kind of keep a... Uh, you know, your, your emotions, like, not down, but, like, in a way, like, oh, I, I can, I'm good. I just got crushed here. I'm cool. I'm just going to go with the flow, basically. When you go with the flow, you become one with the green pawn. You understand, Robert? Do you understand? And if, I understand, and if we're being real, Chess.com has many very strong title staff members, so I don't right. think there's a shame in losing to every lawsuit. It wasn't me. I would be honest with you all if I was playing Danny. No, it was not me, but, I, you know, he... Got his warm up in. That's the good news, at least for him. But the bad news is he's playing the big Greek, and the big Greek always packs a heavy punch. Yeah, facts. Yeah, he's. I mean, you could say you saw from behind the big Greek how like, how the accolades was there. It's just intimidating. You're like, yo, dang man, what? You? And then you got the hundred K subs, YouTube, like that. He got chess boards everywhere. Look at the guy, man. You know what I mean? Like, just wow. You know, looking at the lips there, you know, got the, the fresh ball fade, you know what I mean? Like the Vin Diesel going on. <laughs> the man is dangerous, bro. He's a very dangerous player. Look at the big Greek shirt. Like, stop flexing on everyone. Why is he, Robert, why is he flexing so hard right now? Subtly, but so I kind of want one of those. I like big that Greek. shirt. Can I get one of those? I'm going to have to order one. So, James, you take over the mic. I'm going right. to go order one right now. All right, cool, cool. Yeah, chat. So, yeah, this is a big Greek right here. Ferocious man. Very, very strong here uh, as Robert's ordering his shirt. You should do the same. Look, he looks mean, too. Like, <laughs> I don't want any trouble with this guy. He <laughs> came. He's serious, right? So, we're going to see big Greek today. It's going to be nice to see you. We got Paulina over there, and we got Mr. Martinez, a.k.a. Divis. So, it's going to be nice. I'm, I, I don't know what to expect, honestly. So, I'm excited. Oh, games are off. Let's go. We got Sicilians on both matches, and... We have a, probably a Nidorf on the left-hand side. No, a bishop b5 check from Paulina, whereas the big Greek playing a bishop c4 system against a Rosalina that's on the right-hand side of the screen. So, James, 
we're not getting maybe the most topical theory from the players, but that makes sense because, hey, the big Greek, he's trying to catch Danny off guard. Yeah, it's really annoying. I mean, uh, facing when you're a Sicilian player and like <laughs> two anti Sicilians, like I'm an anti Sicilian player myself. I love the C3 Sicil for the kill, aka C3 Sicilian, right? Like you can, it's a, it's just different. You know, you get positions that are different and you kind of annoy the Sicilian player who wants the sharp stuff here. And both of these are nothing close to sharp. Very most positional. I think maybe in the big Greek game there. You can uh, have more. Oh, yeah. He just went Bishop F1. Look at this position. It's the same on both boards, Robert. <laughs> Except Paulina went Bishop B5 back to D3, then to F1. So I'm not sure uh, why she was spending a few turns with that same piece. But either way, she's striking on the left-hand side of the screen with A4, attacking the pawn structure. You see there's tension against this pawn on B5, trying to open up this rook sitting on its starting square. So there is life on that board and on the right-hand side. Danny against uh, the Big Greek. It looks like the Big Greek is a little bit more solid, a little bit more flexible because Danny's extended those queenside pawns. Absolutely. He has extended them. He's castle kingside. Um, his pieces are developed. He's one move away from connecting rooks, same as, as uh, white is here. So he's pretty level, but the engine gives a bigger advantage. I mean, Bishop D3 didn't like that, but I guess maybe it was more of a space having two pawns in the center. Maybe the knight on G6 is a little weird, especially after a G3, H4, H5 is going to be quite annoying to face um, for for Danny at some point, especially we get the G3 pawn rolling, play H4, H5. This is usually something you want to do when you see a knight here. Um, I do like big uh, big Greek's position here as I am a fan of having the long range diagonal here with the bishop maybe pushing E5 at some point. I think Danny is really solid though. He does have this very strong bishop and, and now he has a square for his knight. So it's it's double-edged. It can be double-edged. Like there's so, much, there's so much to do in this position. Queen D3, going for H7. Queen D3. Going for the diagonal, but I like the way you framed it, James, that it can be double-edged. Right now, there's no tension between the pieces. Not a single pawn trade is offered. Only one pawn is off the board. So both sides are just trying to improve the location of their pieces. The bishop went to f6, staring towards the center. Will Danny play for pawn to e5, maybe trying to get a break? Or will that actually hurt his position because the bishop on f6 then becomes a big pawn. It's a tall pawn at that point. So the ideas aren't totally obvious for either side, but I do like the fact that the big Greek's pieces feel a little bit more coordinated. And, and James, I think you called it right. The knight on g6, that piece is not in its optimal square. Definitely not. And I, I read a, uh, there's a book, uh, Peter Hein Nielsen actually has some newer book uh, out about positional play in a way. And it, one uh, concept was actually, I just learned, it was a really nice concept that every time you see a knight, usually on the g or the b, um, files here the moves g3 and h4 should come to mind which is really nice because you're able to attack this but we already see rook e8 and knight f8 as we pointed out before which is a really strong move what it does is just defends and the engine being engine like just says that g6 was a terrible move whatever who cares bishop going back to g7 i mean engine qu question mark like <laughs> question mark terrible move like quiet engine queen to d2 going maybe bishop h6 and etc and stuff like this maybe try to trade the dark square yeah. bishops Queen d2 is one of the most natural moves you could see in the position, just challenging that knight that was on the rim. Uh, but the black knight comes back towards the center. So I think that both sides are making moves that make perfect sense. I don't think we've seen an odd choice yet. White is better because white controls more of the board. And I love moves like that, James. It's a pawn sacrifice. But if you take that pawn, will you live to tell the tale as the black queen and bishop line up on h4? It's called H4 for the score, baby. We're playing H4 so we can play H5, and we live. So he says queen A5, and we're going to trade. He wants to trade queens as quickly as possible. Um, and then, you know, try to limit the fact that, hey, look, you know what? We have some type of attack, or white does. But he says, no, not today, bro. We're, we're not. We're going to trade queens. And then Big Greek says, no, we're not going to trade at all. But this this is uh, loosening the pawns a little bit. Queen E2. Maybe I'm going H5, question mark, again, from the engine. Uh, just disregard. <laughs> don't know why. I disregard that, guys. Like, it, that's uh, just don't, it's just not there. Queen a3? Yeah. Queen e2, you're avoiding the queen trade because you're saying, my king is safer, I'm on the attack. I don't see why that was receiving question mark. And then now that's a miss. Apparently, queen a3, h5 looks incredibly natural after playing h4. I do like the big Greek's position. James, I don't see a plan for black. I see individual moves. Mm. Danny brought his queen to a5, to a3. Great. So what? What are you accomplishing? And at long last, 
he strikes in the center. One of the best ways to deal with an attack on a flank is to strike back in the center. So I love the move E5. Great recognition from Danny. A lot of times what they say is a uh, bad plan is better than no plan at all. And I do like what you said there about the plan. It's like, what does black actually do? It's just kind of like, you know, move by move. I think they have to take it one move at a time and, and just trying to figure out, okay, what do you do? What do you want to do? Maybe we stop what you're doing. Karpov, a classic Karpov strategy of just prophylaxis. What are you doing? Let's stop it. What are you doing? Let's stop it, right? Especially if you don't have a plan here. So after HG, HG. It's white to move. Where do we go? He goes d5 first and grab a little bit of space. Make look at the bishops. Oh, I mean, do you even call these bishops here, Robert? Uh, no, because they're staring into pawns. The bishop on b7 into a white pawn, the bishop on f6 into black's own pawn. So these bishops are not doing the most, but knight d4, please take me on d4. Open please. the e file. There will be tactics everywhere. And if you take with the bishop on d4, I'm not even going to take you back. I'm going to take your rook on c1. That rook is loose back there. So be very, very careful in this position. White's pieces all are doing something, and they need to hold on to each other. Plays queen d1 and says, all right, cool. That was a little trick, buddy. I understand your little tricks there, Danny, and Danny is a trickster. In fact, he loves tricks, he loves tactics, and that was a very nice move to free some pieces up, but the bishops are pretty gross. Now, of course, uh, Engine says definitely equal here because there's a lot of play left. I mean, I don't have the greatest bishop as well, and his knight is restricted against uh, the G-pawn, so, you know, uh, sort of level, I do kind of slightly like white because of obviously you know the weaknesses around the king here but black definitely has their own you know queen side play and maybe some stuff to neutralize uh, white's threats all right so while this game looks a little bit more positional in nature not an open board let's head back to our bird's eye view because divis is in time trouble against paulina it looks like divis has the edge objectively according to the engines but as you look at the clocks he is way down on time. He has 36 seconds to Paulina's 3 minutes and 15 seconds of her own. And that's when mistakes happen when you're in time trouble. So let's go right into that game as I fear for Divis' clock, although we love his position as he's about to plant his knight in the center. I would be playing knight to d5. He plays knight e4 instead. It attacks the queen. But that knight doesn't have too many retreating squares. It could get trapped if you're not very careful. 100%. And also, as you as you uh, mentioned with the time here, I mean, that's crazy time edge. 26 seconds? Like, you cannot survive that uh, long term. Okay, so maybe this game and just, you know, get the jitters out a lot of times as we saw, like, what was it, Group A? Like, you know, hey, uh, everyone started to swing after, like, the second match there. Everybody was just warmed up. You, you just need to get a little bit warmed up here, and he needs to start moving very fast here because, you know, Ooh. time, oh, G5. Oh, we work? live, James. Bro. I'm not giving that a question mark. Get that question yeah. mark out of yeah, here. You know that what? was a Let me sweet move the engine to play. Real quick. Let me find a chord. This is ridiculous, bro. G5. That's a sweet move in time pressure. And it puts you under pressure. Look at that. I changed it. You see that? I <laughs> changed it. I have that power. You know what I'm saying? I gave it an exclamation point. Man, no, that's, no question that's mark crazy. for that move. That's Robert Chess, baby. What you yeah. mean? Okay. Takes, takes. Yeah. What? Look at this. Give me that E5 pawn. Now that pawn doesn't have a defender. If you bring your queen to f4, uh-oh, queen d1 check, scoops up that knight on e2 with check to boot. So you have to be wow. very careful if you're Paulina. The good news, James, her clock. She is so far ahead, and that might keep her in the game. Absolutely. I mean, being ahead on the, on the time is like, I always like to say, time is a piece. Hey, look, you can you can be completely winning, right? If I flag Hikaru, and I am getting mated in two, and I have no pieces and a king <laughs> and a pawn, Guess what? Who won if I flagged him? Who wins the game? Thank you. I win every single time. It doesn't matter how you get it. It matters if you get it done. And here, of course, uh, I am up time. I'm going to try to create some problems here because I am actually a fan of Black's position. But I'm going to try to create some problems right now in this game. And hopefully you are able to mess this up with your, due to your time constraint. I'm looking at this here. The pawn on e5 is threatened. So when black takes this pawn, right now white is up one. It will restore material equality. But it's not an equal position because black will have a passer. But king g1 earned a question mark. Divis does take this pawn on e5. The knight comes to f4. Don't try to play queen d4. You don't want to hang this e6 pawn. Queen a1 check. You have to probably go back. Oh, apparently that was a blunder. Mm, might be like queen c5 or knight e6. I mean, obviously, there's no checks. So, like, the queen is in the worst place ever. Queen a1, like, you just have no checks. And now white, it, it, the table's turn. Here we go. Three seconds to make a move. He makes it. Knight e6 is hanging. Yeah, this is GG. A head shake there. And, again, it's the time. It was 100% time for, for Davis here was the, the downfall. 
And you put it perfectly. The queen on a1 was in the absolute worst position. It was not giving any checks to the white king. It wasn't protecting the black king. But queen d1, staring at c2, staring at g4, the queen on f5 in the perfect place. But no pawn grabbing for you. You cannot afford to grab another black pawn because you'll lose pawns of your own. So I think Paulina might need to play a bit of a waiting game. Just come up with a... She goes king g3. She's not waiting for anything. But I guess she's trying to just blockade with the knight. And now what? Mm, maybe take a five before his hanging. Yeah, just gobble some pawns. I can dance around this knight, which is really nice, having the knight position where he is. Maybe even knight of four here. Where's your next check? Like, just ask you, where are all your checks? Knight e3? You know, again, there we go. Like, very strong knight, very strong pony there. Knight f5, knight f5. Oh, we can't do that. Maybe an LTV game. You can try it. You can try it. You know, LTV. Let's see what uh -oh, happens. Oh, knight, knight d5, five. though. That's knight d5. There it is, and that's, that's, a, that's a, a hit the button move. That is a hit the button resignation move, and it's done. Shuvalova with the first dub. She gets that dub, and she earned it because of her persistence on the clock. Divis, you just felt way too far behind. And if we look at the right-hand side of our screen, we're getting into an endgame, and that actually looks very interesting as Danny's King is going all the way in. You see the eval bar go down in Danny's favor. Let's lock into that game as both players around 10 seconds on the clock. The green pawn can be very, very dangerous if you let it. And it's a draw, a repetition. They got up out of there. Oof. Yeah, of course. It was just a time scramble that they just both were like, you know what? Cool. Mutual respect there. And and uh, it's a draw by repetition. Sip the water or juice mutual or whatever that is. Respect. Mutual yep. nerves. You could see both players recognizing that there was some danger, but Danny didn't want to, say, sacrifice a bishop to free some past pawns. He didn't want to bring his king all the way in because his pawns were weak themselves. So I think that was a fair result. Uh, the big Greek was better earlier. Danny had the advantage late, but with 10 seconds on the clock, couldn't see it all the way through. So Danny now has the white pieces in a Trompovsky on the right-hand side. On the left-hand side, Divis has, I don't even know what to call that opening, but an overextended <laughs> pawn on e5. And... A very bad bishop on e2. Yeah, it was actually a Karo Khan with a knight of three, uh, like some type of weird Karo Khan there, because black's just fine. I mean, black seems pretty good here. A5, not too familiar with. I'm familiar more with the F6 lines and trying to break in the center there, but probably is happening. Yes, yeah, she's just blitzing everything out. She moves stupid fast here. And like, you know, her, her repertoire is Karo Khan, very strong repertoire she has there. Um, it, it's a very solid opening. You know, you get very easy positions and stuff to move, so... You know, she has a good position here. Uh, it's really going to be up to, to Divis here to try to create some problems. I did like this knight e4 clearing away. Rook takes e4 now. And, uh, yeah, I like white. That pawn on e5 signifies I need to attack you, but where is that going to come from? Yeah, I'm sorry to like white in the Divis game. I am not liking white in Danny's game. Danny blundered very early in this game against the big Greek. He is down a pawn on the queen side. And this might be the issue when you play a new opening and you don't know the ins and outs. There was a queen on b6 that scooped up the pawn on b2 because the white queen was overloaded. So Danny has a chance to survive this game down just one pawn. It's an end game. If he plays this accurately, the advantage won't be huge for black, even though it's uh, quite sizable. But it won't be overwhelming is what I'm trying to say. So Danny has a chance. Divis on the left-hand side, though. He's going in for the attack. James, I know you're a fan of his style of play. I am a, definitely a fan of the attacking style of chess, 100%. You know, even uh, Eileen yesterday, and I was like, I don't know what it is about her. And I was like, oh, we are related. Because she was like, oh, yeah, my favorite player is Tao. And I was like, dang, that's my granddad. I knew we somehow was related. Like, it's just, <laughs> I saw it in the chess. I just understood the the, the assignment. So, you know, uh, with that being said here, I do like uh, Divis's uh, play here. He is going aggressively. F4 is being played. He wants to go F5. Shuvalova just said, I don't care about none of that. F5 will not be played today. Knight takes F5. Yeah, there actually, the pawn up to f4 blocked the rook's path to this pawn h4. And good awareness from Paulina. I like the style in which Divis was playing, but like, he just went all in, and he's paying the price. He lost the h4 pawn. The knight will hop right back to a safe score at f5. And white has a bishop pair, but it's not a bishop advantage. Normally, we like having the two bishops, but here in this position, it's closed, which means the knights can hop around, and these jumpy knights may cause some huge issues for white along with this extra each pawn. Absolutely. When you go all in like this, you have to have the right criteria. I think even uh, Steinus talks about this. Is like you just need to have enough pieces. 
basically um, um, what is it I forgot what he used but the, the terminology but you do have to actually have pieces that are active when you're going all in sacrificing of the h4 pawn my bishops are on the back rank I only have a knight on g5 you can't just do it with these pieces it's a close position right so it's not as easy to make things happen I need some open lines I need to be able to sacrifice pieces that are active and we don't really have a lot of that. The rook on e4 is a clunky piece. The knight on g5 can be captured at some point. Like, you know, black actually is better here. And as uh, as the engine shows as well. Yeah, just a full clamp on both sides of the board in Paulina's favor. The one thing that Davis is doing well is keeping a better pace on the clock. But his position is bad. Meanwhile, Danny... He's down a pawn, but he's the one getting aggressive against the big Greek. Perhaps he can save this game somehow as his rook on the right-hand side of the board is on g3. His knight is up on e5. James, I don't want to be overly optimistic for Danny, but I just think that the way he's been playing since his early blunder, and as soon as I say that, there's a question mark given to his move. Mm -hmm. I think the way he's been playing has been quite lovely, just trying to maneuver his pieces to active squares yeah he had a bad opening here and of course just because just because you have a bad opening doesn't mean you just lose the game it can't 100 percent be losing the game but there's still lots of chess to be played and of course queens came off engine didn't like knight g4 from a practical standpoint it makes a lot of sense you do want to just you know grab the bishop here i have the bishop here okay i may be down a pawn or whatever and it, 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 i think he's still down his pawn right here yeah, the b pawn so it's, uh, it's problematic, but he plays bishop g5 to get rid of one of the bishops to say, okay, cool, we can go into this end game. And wow, h5 will be hanging. Whoa, that was a sick move, bro. That's that a big move. Yeah. The, Dang. A big move from a the big, big, big Greek. Reach. I have to say, I completely missed this. I didn't understand why knight g4 received a question mark, but it makes perfect sense. It allowed bishop g5, and you want to trade when you're ahead. And not just that, look at how black's pieces are flowing. The rook on h8, active, hitting the pawn on h5. Pawn could come up to f6 for black. Not right now, because knight g6 would be a fork. You have to watch out for that. But the point is that black is gaining some activity, although now He's getting the pawn back. So king e yeah, king e7 was an obvious-looking move, but a mistake. Yeah, he's getting the pawn back. Like, literally getting the pawn back. 95. He feels better. Greek, yeah, big Greek with the head shake there. Danny with the classic sip. Look, I'm telling you, bro. If you watch body language, guys, every time they take the sip, they are feeling great, okay? They, like, take the sip. Yep, this is it. All right, cool. Pinky up. You know what I'm saying? Pinky up. <laughs> Be fancy, Danny. Did have you know a pinky up. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean. Like he, he is fancy, and he feels good because oh, I'm back in the game. And the thing about this game is, he was maybe trying to get fancy the opening. He ended up losing a pawn, not knowing how to proceed. But now he just made natural move after natural move. He brought his rook to h1. The black king went up to e7. I can't really fault the big Greek for playing that move. It looks so natural. But now you take away f6. That is a move that is necessary for black to protect g5. But that walks right into knight g6 check, forking the king and the rook. So the big Greek realizing that not only has his advantage gone out the window, he may be worse at a few moves because of white's activity. Absolutely, 100%. As nice c6, this is... He had to retrieve me nice on the rim or dim. He didn't have to. He could have went nice c4 too as well. But rook takes g5 is definitely just going to be an easy move to make. Get my pawn back and try to, you know, milk the position and try to squeeze water from a stone here. Magnus style, of course, it's very difficult to play anything like Magnus uh, 100%. But you can have just the right direction. Okay, hey, let's try to win this end game here. We, 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 we were losing. And now, okay, you know, we're feeling a little bit better. I think our pieces are a little bit more active. If we compare bishops, who has the better one? Obviously, white does, right? Pawn structure may not be the greatest, as the pawn is weak here on the C file. Um, but, of course, hey, we have a lot of play left. What's the time situation? Danny has all the time, Robert. And Big Greek almost has none. I like his last move, though, from the Big Greek. That rook to g and I like Danny's move Ooh. as well. Rook h4. They're both aiming at the g7 pawn. The reason why black doesn't want to play g6 is it might allow h6, but f6 is the choice from the Big Greek. He wants a swap of pawns, but this is dangerous because after ef6, if you play gf6, we'll trade some rooks, and that h pawn's a runaway passer, but black gets another pawn in the center. And e5, e4, f5, those type of moves will be available. This becomes double edge in the endgame. 100% double edge in the end game. 37 seconds for a big Greek here. It's a pass pawn, but then I got pawns too. Like, which pawns are stronger? A question mark move, but from a practical standpoint, it makes a lot of sense here because the bishop actually is blocked now. And this pawn could get a little bit weaker. This one can't get too. Oh, that might be an error there. King g6. You have oh, my G4. goodness. You know what he wants, James? 
What does he, he wants want? to play king e3, king d4, give up the h7 pawn, trade rooks, and get wow. into a king and pawn endgame that might be winning down a pawn. So that's oh what Danny goodness. is aiming for right now. He, he can just like king e3, king d4. I, I wonder if what, uh, black excuse me, is in time to save that a6 pawn. Yeah, this is Devil Rescue page 167 um, with this one here, of course. So we have to go around here, obviously, get the pawn. A6. Wait, but there is some e5. Take, take. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't even have to take. Oh, yeah, you do. You have e4 coming. And there's also d4. But, I mean, it feels like something's wrong with this move. Maybe there's nothing. You see Danny. He grabs his hair because he's, he's like, should like, I do it? Make a Danny! Moment. He plays a3. <laughs> yeah, first. First. <laughs> well, Let me I just think make it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, you're putting your pawn on a dark square so the enemy bishop can't attack it. And James, look at the clock. The big Greek has 23 seconds. So if Danny no doesn't rush it, he might actually trick the big Greek in the ensuing endgame. Mm, that's definitely possible here. As we have the better bishop, like, it's, I mean, not that it's hard to lose this, but it is the fact that, okay, I have the better bishop. Let's just not mess this up, right? But I have a better bishop. And let's try to, you know, maybe make some things happen. He goes with king c5 after just improving. Play a3, put the bishop on f3, and now at e5, in some cases, I can take this. So very smart maneuver from Danny there. King b6, king d6, take a6. Ooh. That's getting dicey in the end game, but he wants to defend is. passively. He's going to put his bishop on c8 and say, maybe we'll make a draw, king b6. Bishop c8, king c7, bishop d7. Back and forth we go. That is possible. Danny's playing for a win. He's looking at the clock. He's looking at the position. And the big Greek's not sure. Can he? Oh, he made a losing move. Oh, king d6, and he's in there. King oh, c7. Oh, he the bishop. King c7. He's, he's in the heaven. The oh, my goodness. He had oh, king c7 been... immediately. But I, I guess it's still there. Like, okay, what are you doing? Wow. What is he's he doing? He's pawn hunting. <laughs> it's he's like, I'm going to take all your pawns. He wins the game. I don't care. Danny. Sip. Look at the sip. Look at the sip. Look at the sip. Wow. Oh, my goodness. Danny Wrench gets the win. Meanwhile, Divis is in time trouble. 2.1 seconds on his clock, but he also has a losing position. I just want to shout out Danny once more. He made a blunder early in the game, but then he fought perfectly from there. So you feel as a chess player, I didn't deserve it. It wasn't my best game. Okay. Meanwhile, Paulina wins on time and on the board. But to finish my thought, Ooh. James, when you win a game like that, as a chess player, you're like, oh, I didn't deserve it. I played badly early on. But he played super well after that. That end game was finesse. Some great technique from him to keep the game going and earn a full point. The problem is Danny played a, a, I don't know, a garbage show, but he just plays what he's... Like, if he plays what he regularly will play, Danny's going to play some really good chess uh, from there, especially stuff that he's very familiar with. He played a Trumpowski. Obviously, he just wasn't too familiar with it. He dropped the pawn very early. Was losing the game slightly. I mean, down a pawn, you're not actually just losing the game, but it was really... It wasn't the greatest game. Then he in-gamed him here, and now he's up, and he's looking to, you know, uh, do it again. If I win this game, two, and then two and a half, I need one more. I'm at three and a half. I win the match here. But if I'm Danny, I'm feeling confident, as we saw in the sip there, the confident sip of whatever that is in that cup there, that green pawn juice stuff, and he's 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 feeling good. He's feeling real good there. Shubalova, same way, 2-0. Yeah, Shivalova should be feeling great. Paulina, the flawless fighter. That's her username on chess.com. Such a great speed chess player in addition to her 2,500 plus in classical chess, her FIDE rating. So she's good in all time controls. And right now she's in great shape, up two to none against Divis. She has the white pieces. She's playing a solid setup. And the time control is shorter. Let's remind everybody. It's two games of five minutes plus one second increment. Then two games of three plus one before we get one plus one. So they're in the three one time control. And James, as we look at the left hand side, closed position. If we look at the right hand side, closed position. Danny, I like how he's playing this. He's keeping things calm. The big Greek probably hungry for that first victory. Meanwhile, Divis, James, do you think he needs to win right now? I mean, this is one of those mindset questions that are difficult to answer. Yeah, he definitely needs to win right now. Just or at least get a draw to like stop the bleeding type of thing. I mean, like actually, I started uh, in the finals last year um, um, when I play on reason. Oh, actually, to answer that too, somebody in chat was like, "Yeah, why didn't you play this year?" Well, I didn't play this year, guys, because I made it to the finals last year. So I made it all the way to the finals. Played Eric Rosen. I beat actually Shuvalova. I played uh, two other players too as well. Two strong IMs, and I made it to the finals. So I proved a lot. I don't. I didn't want to play this year. Also, it's harder. This is not a format that I would be too happy in. I actually started 2-0. Down 2-0 against uh, Eric Rosen. And, you know, I, I lost by two in the end. But you have to remember, guys, that if you're down 2-0 here in this match, that's it. Like, it's very tough to come back because there is no real comeback. Three and a half wins the match. 
So it's important to get a, at least stop the bleeding immediately. Get a half point, do something. You have to stop the bleeding or else it just gets worse. And hopefully you, the psychological part you can get out of your own head of losing and like, can I, am I going to lose a game? Can I win a game? You need that. He needs to stop the bleeding and it needs to happen right now. And his position is very good from the black side for Divis here. Uh, you see that he has two excellent Fianchetto bishops. This bishop on d2 not really doing anything for white. And look at this move. Knight to b4 opening up that strong bishop. Keeping the queen in line with the pawn on c2. Because you can't go queen e2. You drop that pawn there. So what to do for white? I'm not seeing an easy plan. A move like knight e4. She plays that comes to mind. But can't black just play f5? Kick that knight out of there. That is a great move. In fact, f5 and we live. Maybe knight g5 and we have our sale. That's why he plays h6. Yeah, f5 is definitely coming. That is coming up next. So, yikes. This is just gross for white. Like, I don't have any, I don't have any squares. Is she going to sack? No, that's not and even he's, possible. He's playing this so cautiously. I think that's one of the things that happens when you lose two games in a row. You're not trusting yourself as you would in... A first game of a match but here comes f5 he still gets away with it knight g5 check that might be a try because there is a fork on e6 at the end i know black gets two minor pieces for a rook and one pawn but the resulting position after say knight c3 it just looks too easy for black to play at least knight g5 it might complicate matters a little bit yeah you're right you're right knight g5 and yeah, knight c3 is so like it's just ugh. and if you go knight g5 i mean you are down a piece you get a pawn for you get the exchange after 96, yeah, I mean, I guess we just get the exchange there. Queen C8 takes takes. This just still feels like I'm missing something. And you are. Like, you're just missing a piece. Like, you are missing something, in fact. So she goes back to C3. H5 maybe is coming. The clocks are even in this game. That's really important for Divis. He kept trailing on time by a minute plus. Now we see the clock's in his favor. He's ready to play E4 at any moment. Maybe F4, depending on what happens next. I'm looking at this. I can hardly see a move for white. And for black, knight of six next. Knight to g4. Pawn to e4. Very obvious moves for black. I would hate, hate, hate to have this position for white. Strike through. G5. Here are the oh pawns come, goodness. James. Yeah, you know, it's funny, too. I saw the confidence sip there from Davis. He played rook a to e8, and then he took the coffee mug and sipped it. And I was like, oh, yeah, he in the zone. He's in the zone. When you see that, a lot of times, you don't want to be on the receiving end of them sipping whatever they're sipping there. So it just depends. Obviously, this is a great position. Now, the game's not over. There is still chess left. But 100%, black has initiative here. Look at those pawns on the king side. Look at white's pieces and the coordination or lack of um, on the back rank there. It's really rough for, for Pauline Nett in this game. I'm going F4. Don't hold anything back at this stage. Push F4. Of course, white does not want to take on F4 to open up the king. And after F4, G4, that doesn't look very good. In comes my knight to F6, attacking your very fragile king side. I would hate to have this position for Polina, but what I do like for her, from her perspective, is that Divis now is trailing on time. F4 was a move in bullet. He would have played instantly. James, he's being a little bit too deliberate for my liking. Yeah, I think he's doing a little bit too cautious. We saw this yesterday with Mary, who was just, I mean, crushing. She was getting some crushing positions, but then her time allowed her to lose games that she had no business losing. If she had more time, she would never lose those games. But because of her time... She lost some games that were just 100%, you know, uh, not unlosable, but time creates it and makes it a loss situation. So he needs to be careful with his time as he's lower again. But he's breaking through right now. Jeez. Yeah, he's playing fantastic chess. Every move with a purpose. As you were mentioning, him drinking and off in the cup, it does seem like he feels it. He's feeling the position. He's got the rhythm. And now he's once again up on time. So we see a quick trade. He needs a pre-move. He needs to you know, have better mouse skills against someone like Polina. And right now, she's fighting back. Her knight will come to F2. And James, I'm not seeing an immediate checkmate. And that Black King isn't the safest either. So you need to be really careful if you're Divis. Oh, yeah. You got to be careful here. I mean, look at the time. 20. Well, this is about even. 20 for a second. Okay. 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 94. Queen check coming. No. Whoa. What's going on in the other game with Whoa. Danny? Uh-oh. Danny's king might be in some trouble. By the way, in the left-hand side, the eval bar went right back to the middle. It seems that suddenly it's even between Paulina and Divis because the queen moved up to d2. On the right-hand side, Danny now is better, but both kings are vulnerable. Queen h6 is trying to go to mate. There is no checkmate, so Danny, his queen saves the day. Wow, and then Paulina on the other, I mean, shoot, we keep paying it. It's hard, like, I'm watching both games. It's like, oh, wait, which game? What's going on? Like, you have to watch both of these at the same time. Wow, is White just crushing? Takes, takes. 
Rook over. Yeah, Danny might be going oh. down this game. It's a time scramble, though. Oh. Although Danny, he's doing well because he has a pass pawn of his own, but the king is in the center for white. So white, I think right now, is up a pawn, and the black king in trouble because the f7 pawn mm. drops. Danny looks like he's about to lose this game. Meanwhile, Pauline on the left-hand side with the white pieces, suddenly she is the side for choice. Divis' clock seems to doom him. Yeah, 100%. I mean, we, say, we saw this story yesterday again with Mary. I mean, she was just winning and, like, having some crushing positions, and then it happened, and then, like, oh, well, like, dang. You know, you get in time trouble and you lose, and we're seeing that happen again today with Divis. Unfortunately, it's just not his day. Wait, wait, we got two seconds. Hold on. Anything can happen here, but, yeah, it's just not looking good for Divis. And meanwhile, the big Greek, he did take that game. We expect that to happen. He promoted with checkmate, and Paulina, she's trying to do the same. This pod is one square away, and that way the black work had to take. This is beautiful technique swapping rooks mm -hmm. winning end game with the minor pieces beautiful technique from paulina right now she was completely crushing completely oh she was getting crushed in fact now she's crushing in this game again the time thing time is serious it's really annoying if you just can't get your time under control there it's easier said than done of course as this format is very grueling only having you know so many games that you can play here look at the knight ring around the rosy there You can go after this bishop. You have an outside pass pawn. And she went knight b3 just to keep the enemy king out. That this is sick. a really strong technique. Takes, takes. And we got She's the... Gonna win. Yeah, we got the two juicers here. Very easy. And you might even be able to win with just one of them. But two of them, it's too simple. G7, up a piece. Resignation time. Paulina is a half point away from winning her match against Divis. With Divis putting up a serious fight, just like we saw yesterday, James, where, for example, Dawid Sheriff and Aline Robers, they lost their first match. There's still time because it's a round-robin format in the group stage. You can beat the other contestants. That is correct. Like, you still you lose one match, okay, it happens. I think even Greg. It happened to Greg Shahadi in, in Group A. He lost the match to Aline. And then, but then, you know, won his other ones and still made it through at the end. So it is very possible. You can lose a match. Okay, cool. It is what it is. We get warmed up and we go from there. And hopefully the rest of the matches go in our favor or else we will be uh, knocked out. And we see in the left-hand side, Divis, he needs to win. He has no choice but to win all his games. On the right-hand side, it's a tied match. One and a half, one and a half. But Danny once again in some trouble from the white side. His white openings have not been doing him any favors, and he's in a critical moment. So why don't we dive into that game a little more closely? Because in the game between Danny and uh, the big Greek, Danny he needs to find his footing. His position is worse. Black has the pair of bishops. I'm liking the big Greek's chances. Yeah, yeah, I, I like Danny's choice here of sticking with e4 here. Um, and then the Sicilians is always a combative opening. Like, oh, it's just 100% combative, especially the open Sicilians here. It can really be double-edged, go either side here, which is why the anti-Sicilians are not scoring well, but you're, seeing, uh, you, you're just seeing more of them because you just don't want to go down these lines of the open Sicilians so much and giving black exactly kind of what they want. We love an open Sicilian being a Sicilian player. You love an open Sicilian with the black pieces. It's happened. It's done. I think this was a Tomanoff or something like that. And blacks just have active pieces. And we have the bishop pair in an open position here. So pretty nice. Black is definitely for choice. Queen of b4. Now what? I like that move. Queen b4. I like, I like queen this. b4 because it protects the rook on e1. So that way the bishop is free to move once okay. black inevitably doubles on the e-file. And if... All the rooks come off. I don't think white has any real problems anymore because in order to win against isolated pawns, a2 and c2, you need more pieces to play with. And so the d4 pawn is no stronger than the a2 pawn, for example. So both sides have their weaknesses, and that's why the bishop slides back to g7. James, the sign of a great player is someone who can acknowledge, okay, my last decision wasn't great. I do have time to rectify it. The bishop came back to g7. Yeah, that's a strong, it's, it's sometimes strong. I was working with some coach one a long time ago that was like, yeah, one thing that's hard in chess to do is admit that, you know, the move isn't right or the piece isn't right. And moving bishop f8 going back to g7 is just something, all right, cool. It, it's not best place here. We're going to place it where it needs to be done. And, you you know, you kind of listen to the board and what the board says as opposed to what you actually want to do. So queen to c3. Queen takes c3 is going to be quite annoying and then allowing maybe something coming in the d2. At some point, obviously, the knight is defending it, but we can try to get rid of it at some point. You did mention a rook trade, and it's going to kind of, you know, hey, yours are weak too, but 
You know, this pawn is quite annoying here, Robert. That's a super strong pawn. I'm a bit surprised that Danny went for this. Rook d2, that's already an option for black. Because if you take oh, on yeah, d2 after can. c takes back, oh my goodness. you're not stopping the pawn. Rook d2 anyway, big dog. Here it comes. On national television. That's a sick move, bro. Rook d2 is ridiculous. And rook d1 it's check played, was But the engine says, really what is wrong choice. with you? What is wrong with this move? I guess. How F could this possibly wait, be Wait, that doesn't make any sense. Oh, my God. The engine says F3. And I was like, this doesn't make any sense. But yeah. after takes, oh! you take the rook. That's sick, right? That is insane. That's crazy. That's some, yeah. No, nah, that don't make no sense. There's no way Danny was going to find that. But yeah, that is such that a chat. nasty resource. Wow. That is F3. really wonderful stuff. Bishop takes. Then you take the rook. Right, the rook, and then takes, and then bishop takes, and then now you get to cover the square. I mean, what? That is just wow. wicked. That's wicked, bro. It's, it's very it's, it's very, very crazy. So, okay, rook d2, king g1 happened, and here's the live position. Okay, that was a brilliant opportunity for Danny. I don't blame him for missing it. Rook takes c2 might be met by bishop d5, and that's what the big Greek is calculating. So he goes back. I don't think he should repeat moves, and he doesn't. Bishop e6. You mentioned this idea, James. Very good spot by you. That now bishop takes b3 becomes an idea. Rook d2 to follow. F2 is loose. C2 is loose. And so if we get opposite colored bishops, good drawing chances. But the big Greek trying to maximize here. He does not want to let this advantage slip. Absolutely not. I mean, he, he, time's getting lower, too, as well. I mean, these guys have been really, honestly, evenly matched. I mean, they've been in time trouble every single game, both of them. Uh, and it's been it's been wild. It's been wild. It's not has been close. Whoa, engine. Oh, bishop e4. I mean, d5. Gg. 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 Oh, oh my no. goodness. Bishop d5. You can't stop that, everything. Oh man. And there game. it is. Let me see the face on Danny there. And yeah, it's a quick slight head shake. King goes to g7. He's thinking, what do I do? If I push the g pawn, there's bishop e5 check. You can hit the button immediately. And then f3. I just take. How do you get out of there? Bishop takes. You have to you push don't. the g pawn, it's Robert. You push the G-pawn, and then you take on H4, or Bishop My E5 goodness. leads to direct mate. And look Ooh. at Danny. You can see the frustration on his face because he was surviving that game. And to lose in that manner, not to lose because of a Rook D2 and all this brilliant stuff, but to lose because you put your Rook on a, or your Bishop rather, on a bad square to open up the diagonal. That's the type of mistake that hurts you. But it's bullet now. It is bullet on the right-hand side. That is good news for Danny, I believe. I think he's a little bit more active in bullet chess, especially right. after his training session this week. So right. anything can happen. He's only down one point. Yeah, he's only down one point here, of course. And you just have to short-term memory loss. Carlos says that a lot. You have to have short-term memory loss when it comes to these ales. It just get back to it. Literally, don't care. You just have to, hey, look, it's over. Okay, play the game in front of you. And, and hope for the best because if you think about that last game you're not focused on the game in front of you so it's important to do that so hopefully he's able to get over that really fast here as they are into the bullet portion now one second increment does make things a little bit different because it's not true bullet you do get that one second increment man divis time today has just been the story of the match in fact shuvalova advances and the match is over 4-0 in Polina's favor. Look at that last move she made, and there you see her on camera. She's not even smiling. She's still focused. She's probably analyzing, using game review to get feedback on her game. Uh, but that was a nicely played game from her when she only needed a draw to advance. She, in fact, gets the dub. So we'll tune into more Polina Shuvalova games later because she has more matches to play. I think she doesn't even realize she won the match. <laughs> She's like, bro, she is there no more games? Or maybe like, yeah, right. Maybe both. <laughs> like, There's no more games? Bro, come on. I thought this was a match. What is this? Yeah, that's funny. That's <laughs> funny. Something's going on there. But uh, congratulations to her as she won her first match here. This one's heated up. One point match. One point game between them. Okay, let's look at this position that we have. Uh, James, this looks absolutely terrible for white, especially in a bullet game, because Gross. king safety is paramount. White is up a pawn, but the king is in such a bad way. And here come more Jeez. firepower from Danny. He bringing he bring everything. Danny is mad from that game. Hey, Danny. Hey, relax, buddy. Relax. Okay, and then he did. All right, well, queen d5 for some reason just wasn't right. Looks good, though. Looks pretty good. Queen e4, he plays it. Knight to d2. Okay, so what's happening here? Um, and knight d2 hit mm -hmm. the queen and protected f3. James is close. It feels like black is so close to winning the position, but white yeah. is up that pawn. This is kind of annoying. Knight f3 checked. Uh, 
But the key, but the key, but the key. I mean, I have to move with. Is there a double? I mean, there's double checks, but he runs away. <laughs> like he runs away. Like he can also just go to g1 too as well. But like, wow. So knight takes e5 check. You give up your queen to win the queen on g4. No, he goes back to h4. He wants the attack to continue. No queen trades offered. <laughs> what a beast! Like put the king on h3 voluntarily. I don't care about none of that. King h3. Yeah, come get me, big dog. And he's coming for you. In fact, knight g3. And rook g1's coming. Got to bring the rook over. There it is with ideas of knight h5. He says not today. g6 played it anyway. Knight f6 is coming. Knight f6 can be played. Takes, takes. h4. Knight f5. They played it. Dang. No, where they find it? That means, that means speed. Woo. But look at that bishop on e3 and those triple isolated f pawns. That's not going to help you out if you're the big Greek. f6 is about to drop. The king on h3 is wide open. And Danny wins on time. Not Danny on wins on time. The big Greek doesn't see the clock. Danny wins on time. Here we go. This is a crucial game. Chat, who do you have? We got some big Greek fans, and we have Danny fans in the chat. Who do you have? This is a very, very good match, okay? This one game, whoever wins, whoever wins, wins the match. If there's a win, you know, if there's a draw, then they keep going, obviously. But who do you got, chat? Right. Yeah, chat, get involved. Let us know who you think will take it. One game for the match, or if it's a draw, we get... The tie breaks of four more bullet games. Right now, in this position, Queen's Gambit accepted. The Queen slides back to B1 out of the Rook sights. But that's an awkward-looking move, especially as Black might swing a Rook to B8 and then play Pawn to B4. But said the Big Greek plays in the center. Plays in the center with E5 here. It does weaken the D5 square. Could put something there. But, I mean, as you pointed out, like this Queen is just ugly. Like, my piece is, you always want to think about, you know, the future, I think, when I'm teaching... Uh, or coaching some students and I, I remember teaching this they always say teaching is like learning twice so it is in, important to understand like hey you gotta think about the future of your pieces if you put the queen on b1 later on you're gonna have to move it anyway and you're gonna have to get these pieces out so now this is stuck in the corner but at least he's, he has something he's trying to get out there was a bishop f3 there i think but rook to d8 playing very quickly takes takes did he hang his rook on d1 with check wait did oh he just oh my gosh that was oh he did yeah he did he just Hung a full rook on d1 with check. He saw the rook on a8 was loose, but I guess didn't realize that his own rook was captured with check. And the big Greek, he mm -hmm. lost that game, but he rebounds in style. This is a crusher. Yeah, yeah. And you know what it goes back to is, you know, I don't know. Danny's just, he can play. You can play any opening you like, but he just plays, he plays mostly e4. You know, bullet chess, you got to play what you really know. Right, he played d4, d5, and like, uh, and then the queen got the b1, and it was just a disaster out of the opening there. But man, we thought Danny was going to bounce back there. If you're a Greek fan, well, you're raving right now as he wins the match. And this is his version of raving. You, that's him really pumped up. Ah, you see let's it on go! His face. Oh yeah, my goodness! This is Sparta! Sparta! And big Greek. He takes down the chief chess officer, who was all smiles before the match, but will have a frown on his face to end it because the big Greek took both games in the three plus one. You see it here. It was one nap half in Danny's favor in the longest time control. In the middle section, it was the big Greek. Then Danny wins a bullet game, but the big Greek wins last but certainly not least to take the match three and a half, two and a half. That is Georgios Souletis. Danny Wrench will have to bounce back in future matches. James, man, that was epic. That was epic. It was uh, it was exactly what I I, I expected because this. I mean, Danny can definitely throw those punches. Big Greek can throw those punches. Shuvalova can throw those punches. Javis can. Like, you don't know who's gonna hit who and how and where and and like who's gonna be knocked out. Who who isn't? Like you know, it could have been an upset. It could have easily went the other way in Shuvalova's game as well. So or a match. So it's very exciting chess. And we got you know a few more of these matches as well and another group today. So I'm excited. It's a lot of chess going on today. Yeah, I think the one takeaway that we have that we can say for sure is that Divis needs to play more quickly. He was getting in time trouble, and Paulina, she was in excellent form to win 4 nothing in that match. But we will have two more matches for each player ahead. This is the I Am Not GM Speed Chess Championship, and more action on the flip side of this break. Do not go anywhere.
Let's check. Let's check. Peter. Peter. Let's check. Let's check. I'm oh, sorry. I didn't hear you say anything. I thought Padana played extremely well, very, very solidly. Didn't make mis didn't make mistakes and made good positional moves all the time. Uh, the last time I was wiped out by a woman was by Nona Gaprin Dashvili in 1966. She beat me. She beat you. Two, wow. two wins and one draw. Nice. Now yeah, I'm retiring. We return to the I'm Not a GM Speed Chess Championship. I'm Robert Hess. Alongside me is James Canyon III. James, we just saw Paulina and the Big Greek take their first matches. And that leaves us with two people atop the leaderboard. And guess what? They are facing off. It's Paulina versus the Big Greek, Georgios Soledis, in their next match. James, who you have as the favorite in the upcoming matchups? Ooh wee! I have a that's that's tough there. It's a tough matchup, of course, but I'm definitely gonna I'm gonna go with Paulina there. She's uh, usually very stoic. She just plays her same repertoire in classical in blitz. It doesn't matter. She's gonna play what she knows, which is great chess, great stat strategy. It's been working for her so far, and this it, it could work again if Giorgio uh, gets in time trouble here. It's definitely going to be you know a tale of the the entire match. We see Paulina on the screen in front of us. She remains locked in. It feels like she's just looking at chess in between each and every game, and she wants to take this group and move on to the semis. So she had a great first match, a perfect 4-0 score against Divis, but we know that the big Greek, he is in good form. He beat Danny Wrench in the bullet, and I think that's where people normally get nervous about some of the older players is that they won't be able to stick with their younger opponents in the quickest of time controls. See, that's why it's important, Robert, to actually play bullet chess every day. You know what I mean? All day. No, of course, don't try that at home. You can definitely you should play it at night or after you've done your regular studies and etc. But the bullet portion definitely does uh, make or break champions, right? That one right there. And it's also not true bullet. It's the bullet that you get one second increment. 
that is a little bit different. So it is something to hear. Hopefully, uh, um, Georgios is ready for that, or you know, Paulina maybe maybe she's not ready. Like, we'll see what happens. This is a ma this is a matchup that we are anticipating here, especially after they both won their matches here. So they're feeling good. Confidence is high on both of them here. So it's gonna be a nice match. And Danny and Divis, they get to square off, and they both lost their first matchups. This is just how the round robin of the group. The pairings worked out, uh, but for them, they have a shot to get some confidence, some momentum going, because they will have a chance to play. For Danny, he'll still get Paulina in the third match, and for Divis, he'll get the big Greek. But we are off. We see a Sicilian on the game on the left-hand side of her screen. Paulina, she was playing bishop e5 check against Divis. There's no check to be had, although now there is after the move d5. Yeah, something different here. d4, okay. Bishop b5, so some type of... I mean, this is a weird C3 Sicilian because the pawn's on C3. It's not supposed to be there anymore in this line, actually, believe it or not. Um, yeah, you're supposed to go knight. Okay, but well, this is good. She's playing against the isolated pawn. And then Danny's game. Oh, is that a... What was that, Rosa or, or... Let me see. Was this knight or... Oh, yeah, this is... Yeah, I'm a big fan of these. These Bishop G5 lines. This is what I'm talking about. This is the Danny that I actually know, in fact, is uh, the Danny. It looks familiar now, playing very sharp openings, E4 and going for your opponent. Yeah, the board on the right-hand side of your screen between Danny and Divis. This is very much Danny style. Let's get active. Let's bring our queen out. We can castle in either direction. The game on the left-hand side of the screen, that's a little bit more positional in nature. We have a bishop for black, but that's not going to find an active diagonal, or at least a particularly useful one. And then the knights, we might see dark square domination. The knights want to use the dark squares that are on the opposite color, of the bishop so we'll see how this game continues on the left hand side and it feels like one where the big greek has a good understanding with that move c5 no dark square control for you i'm going to fight back i actually thought that move was i mean it showed a lot of class there i'm not even gonna lie c5 was a really strong move because of how weak the dark squares are and something as simple as knight to b3 would have literally chomped down on the c5 square and then we put another knight on d4, and we just try to take over to c5 square, get a knight to c5, and we just have a very good position. It's just welcomed. We have more space. But after c5, now knight b3 doesn't have the same merit. We can first go c4. We could also go queen c7 or queen d6, defend the pawn, play bishop b7, and play d4, and use that bishop for that long diagonal as much as we want to. It's a very, very nice move from Big Greek there. Very impressive. Queen a4, though, which is a very active move from Paulina, and she's going rook d1, playing against the pawn structure, which is a really nice book. I think uh, even if you're watching U.S. Championships, Alice Lee mentioned the book, which is very nice from Mauricio Flores about pawn structures. This one is actually, it's called Grandmaster Structures, the name of the book, but this one's nice. Hanging pawn structure is what uh, uh, Georgios has here, the Big Greek. Big Greek has the uh, hanging pawn structure, so we have to play against it, which I think she's doing a great job of doing that so far. Yeah, it's a pretty dynamically balanced game. H3, another useful move, giving luft to the king, no background checkmates. And for black, the, the hanging pawn structure, uh, these are critical decisions. If you ever push your hanging pawns, then the squares that were previously under control are your opponents for the taking. If you play C4, give me that D4 square. So these are difficult decisions. I like the rerouting of the queen. James, I won't be surprised if G4 happens at some point and she goes for the kill on the king side. And that's why the big Greek says no. Not going to happen on my watch. Let's trade those queens off. He said trade them off right now. What do you mean? 95 is a strong move here with the intention of... Oh, she played Rook E5. Oh, put something on E5. Not the knight. The Rook. The Rook on E5. That's nice. Mm -hmm. That was a nice one. I was actually playing 95 automatically. Rook E5 is what she chose. But she chose Rook E5. She was threatening the knight on F5. But after knight E7, knight G6 was a fork. That's why she retreats her queen to e3, spying on this pawn on c5. And after knight g6, will we see an exchange sack on e6? And that might be a threat in this very position, trying to take twice on e6 and go after this king on e8, this pawn on d5. Black's pieces are a bit loose. I definitely like uh, this exchange sack because, yeah, man, you have to, I mean, I, I mean, you can go rook h5. That's the only other move. But rook takes e6, and I get two pawns because after king h7, I do take d5. c5 is weak. I think it's actually equal after that. I think it's actually just equal. And if she goes for it, takes, takes, king h7, queen d5, and in eval bar says equal. Yeah, I'm a fan of this. I do like the, if I keep the queens on, I like white. But 
If I trade queens, I don't at all. So we need to keep the queens on the board here, which is the problem. Maybe queen h4. I don't know. You have knight of four. Yeah, the accuracy required here, I think, is maybe too much for white. I like the way you framed it, though, because if the queens come off, definitely white is in some danger because the rooks do have open files. So the knight and two pawns, that's good compensation. Five points to five points, a knight and two versus a rook. But the issue is that black controls some very important lines. And here, I would try to get the queens off, but I'm not sure how. A6 is loose. C5 is loose. You need to be very careful. Maybe queen f4 because you're threatening rook takes mm. two to get Ooh. two knights for that rook. So that might that's be an option here. Yeah, queen f4, I'm going to have to just block immediately. Rook e4 and just like, nah, bro, not today. And then maybe we can take on a6. We also have rook e6 here too as well. Rook e6 right now, big dog? Hold on. Queen b5, Ooh. queen e4? Wait a second. Would it give it a game? Oh, yes, like queen d3. Yes, queen d3. Yeah, that's kind of annoying. Wow, that's a good move. Yeah, we have to go a4. Looks... You might even go queen g4 just to get on the attack oh. over here. Like, go right for the black king. James, yeah. I'm with you. Rook e6 does look powerful. There might be a rook d6 to save the mm. day, but it still looks very suspicious. And whoa, whoa. she hey. voluntarily trades queens. You're going to have to chill, okay? This is a family channel. We don't do that kind of stuff over here. <laughs> queen e4 is a crazy move in practical sense. I mean, just because, like, hey, oh, he didn't take it, but I'm... <laughs> Hey, I'm not trying to trade queens here, of course, just to give black, you know, uh, let him off the hook in a way. Queen f6 hitting c3. Wow. Okay, well, this game, it continues to be one where black is slightly better. The rook outclassing the knight and couple pawns for the moment. c3 is loose. The knight trying to get into f4, but can't do that with the white queen on e4. But I'm looking at our other game as well. So if we can back up to our bird's eye view, that one is really heating up as the players are giving it their all. They're playing fighting chess. Look at the position on the right-hand side of our screens. Whoa. Black has the diamond, the zipper of pawns from F7 to E4 over there. And well, I guess it's not a diamond. It's more a zipper. I don't know why I said diamond. That's a different shape. <laughs> but you look at the position. White is up a pawn, and white's king feels safer. So what do you make of this, James? I'm actually a fan of initiative, right? Time and activity. E3, ooh, that's a nice move. I still maybe have to take on e6. If I do knight e6, you take on f2, I go king h1. There's no mate yet. Oh, it's so close because knight g7 would be mating, but it's not mate yet. Wow, that's a good move. Initiative is, is very strong, very powerful. Time and activity. Sometimes you can be down three, four pawns. I mean, you can look at the Shesnikov Sicilian in particular. You can be down three, four pawns and still have enough compensation and initiative with the black pieces to be winning. Even you can see this with pieces and exchange sacrifices as well. Big fan of the initiative here. And they both, I think, initiative is on both sides. Like Black has initiative and white. That's very rare that they both have some initiative here. But it is uh, double-edged for sure, Robert. It certainly is, because you see Divis pushing that pawn towards the white king, but Danny, ahead on the clock, has his own queen on h5, and the black king is sitting in the center. So the worst thing for black is those rooks aren't connected. The c8 rook, the f8 rook, they're not teaming up as rooks need to do, but I like that move e3 going right after the white king. So Danny, he's sitting here and thinking, do I take on e3? Does that give up an important check after the recapture? Is my knight on d4 loose? How do I... Evaluates and he takes on e6 and the engine hates it. But knight g7 is checkmate if that queen were to move from the c3 square. I think the problem is you just can't get it off the c3 square, Robert. You can try. We can try maybe rook c1, the a rook to c1, that is. So maybe we have to go king h1. Apparently there was a miss there. Oh. I'm not sure what happened. I thought it was king h1 too. What is this? I don't know. I have no idea what the move is. Is rook h8 the move here? Kicking the queen rook off the H8. diagonal so you can pick up the knight next. That's the stupidest thing ever. If rook h8 is the move, like, you got to be kidding me. Wow. I mean, look at the eval bar go all the way down, my guy. And rook h8 spotted and found. What do you even do? Okay, so I moved the... Oh, I guess just the piece thing. Danny here is looking right. I mean, it doesn't feel that bad. Like, maybe Queen E2 and Queen E6. From a human standpoint, like, Queen E2, get, get out of there. I mean, there may be something stronger than, like, taking the knight, though. But Queen E2 with queen the AP. Or even just took on F5, which is kind of the same. Oh, Queen G3, yeah. But queen not G3, now. H3. That's why he took on F5. Yeah. Queen G3, Knight G7 check, and the Rook on C8 is hanging. So Knight G7 becomes a threat in a position like this. You need to be very careful if you're Divis. Don't overcomplicate things. 
maybe just take the knight on e6. The only other idea I have is to go after the king on h1. I don't see how you do that. So I would take the knight, snack on it, and then figure out the rest later. He did. He snacked on the knights. I appreciate it. But he also, you know, he's getting snacked on right now in the time. And, of course, uh, the eval bar changes immediately. We probably have some type of perpetual here. That's probably what it is. It's just checking to oblivion. Check, 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 check. He played h3. He said, no, I not like today. This. I'm going to play against that, the clock. That's not a blunder, James, because the clock is so heavily in Danny's favor. He should have done queen g6 check in first. But the point is that I think that he has good winning chances just because Divis is down to 11 seconds. But Divis is playing this well with the rook on f7. He is making sure his king finds some semblance of safety. And this is actually, you know, uh, a reminiscent of his last match. Uh, his... I Meaning Divis here, I see a slight head shake there from Divis here as he just realized I'm down time. It's not good. Yeah, of course the eval bar says absolutely completely winning, 100% man is done for. But the time, if we are able to create something here with the white pieces, uh, being Danny here, being up to time, you know, in a double-edged position here. Yes, practical chances are really anyone's favor here. Oh, queen, queen b5, b5 check. check, king f7, rook d7 there. Ooh, that would win the queen. Oh, Rook D7! It Rook wins! Rook D7? Rook D seven easy, but there's something with maybe not. No, we don't have that. Rook C five. Oh, we just take this rook first. It takes. Queen B three. Yeah. And then rook F one. Queen B three check of rook F one. And as long as black queen can't G3. protect the F2 queen G three check, game over. Oh my goodness. The time! The green pawn does it. The green pawn. And Divis could not have defended that better. He really played an excellent game, but his time continues to be his kryptonite, and Danny was very smart not to force the draw. It was much more difficult for Black to play. Danny earned that victory. And the other side, look at this. The big Greek has two big rooks against just a couple knights, and I see the eval bar saying that Black should be winning. I can see a future where this gets a little bit tricky, especially if this h6 pawn is one. If you get rid of this pawn, then I put a knight on g4, and how mm. does black win ah, that position? You are so right there. That's so cool to even think about. What That's like study-like, in a way. Like a, some type of you know chess study. Where like, if you get rid of this pawn, yeah, okay, you got both the rooks versus two knights, but like, yeah, knight g4, what do you do? Yeah, okay, and just says you're winning. But how? I don't believe it by far at all. If you're not an engine, you're not winning this with the black pieces. It's just not happening. And now after that pawn's gone, yeah, this is a draw at least. I might be playing for more, especially if I can fork you with one of the knights, you know. Uh, yeah, just this take a rep. Just rep, it out. The boat, rep it out. Both players know it. Rep it out. And you still get the big Greek. He is flustered. Oh, <laughs> I think he might have let out an expletive. He might have said something in... Uh, in it, maybe adult language, okay, this is why we have it muted, because we just, this is a family channel chat, do we do remember that? So, of course, he may have said something adult-like there, and he goes into the next game. That was great defense at the end there from Polina. She recognized that the two knights could defend one another. And you mentioned this term by Jeremy Silman, the late Jeremy Silman. Of course, we give our condolences to his many uh, family members and friends out there uh, you know, who miss him dearly. But he, in Reassess Your Chess and in all of his books, he called them superfluous knights when they're yes. fighting for the same squares. Oh, but so. those knights were not superfluous. In fact, they did everything necessary to protect one another, to protect the loose pawns. So that was good defense by Polina and an unfortunate slip with that advantage from the big Greek. And as I look at these two positions, they look, both of them, very entertaining. On the right-hand side, it looks like Divis, he's going for Danny's king. Yeah, and, this, and it, he needs to be faster, too, as well. I think Divis knows that at this point, you know, for so much, it's just like, yo, hey, look, I'm tired of losing on time, so what do you do? You play faster. But that could cause some trouble, obviously, as you're going to make, you know, more mistakes or you're going to miss things here. So you have to have that healthy balance here. He is down a minute on time here right now, but he has to speed it up a little bit, especially in those positions. I mean, he was just completely winning the last game, but time got into into his, uh, uh, his time got low, and it caused him to make mistakes, which has been the story of his first match as well here so danny got a nice break there and we'll see you know kind of what happens there big greek is trying to you know bounce back from what just happened that last game he was definitely furious my man's was furious we saw it there on the screen so uh he's trying to redeem himself in this game 
I see two question marks on the screen. One from Paulina with her queen retreating to d8, and the other was bishop e4 and Danny on the right side. Bishop a6, give him an exclamation point. Give me those light squares on the queen side. Give me a uh, pressure. I, I didn't like rook d8. I thought he was uh, going to put to c8, but no matter what, he is trying to control the light squares on the queen side, but on the left-hand side of our screen, look at the big Greek. That control with the pawns in the center, with the bishop pair, with that knight. Don't let that hop into b6. You see me drawing the arrows and the highlights on the left-hand side. I worry for Paulina. Her position, it's very passive, and I don't see how she gets active at all. It actually is extremely passive. We also have a weakness on a5. You know, b7 could be weak as well. The knights are superfluous, as we mentioned before. Um, I mean, the bishop on g7 is probably the best piece. Yeah, and, you know, it's funny. Like, everything is developed, right? Like, all of Black's pieces are out. But it's just not. There are, they, are, they are not on their ideal places or ideal spots here. Queen b4, I think that is a fancy move. But what if I take, play bishop d6, you go bishop f8. Okay, okay. That I'll is a fancy move. Point. That's me. That's, that's, that's me nice, bro. That. Yeah, that's, really, that's nice. I really like it. Yeah, because you are offering a trade, and now your pieces, look at that pawn. I'm not, I didn't even mean to give that one exclamation. I'm going to clear those. But no, stop it. Too many exclamation points are on the <laughs> board now. But what I'm trying to say is that after the queen trade and the A pawn took, the rook would have had an open file to work with. So queen c2, I think it's a great move from the big Greek, not opening up pieces for black and just continuing to clamp down on the position. I like what the big Greek's doing. I like his time. But I also like Divis's position on the right-hand side where knight g4 just hit Danny. Ooh. And he better be very, very careful. His pieces are dangling. Look at Divis over here, Divian. He's he working right now. He's actually working. Rookie 5 is the threat. You do have f5 there. But no, h4 is the threat right now, Robert. Whoa, pawn h4. And he plays h5. But I could still go h4. But I guess you're saying I get one, you get one. Like we both get one, I guess h4 oh man h5 was a nice move from danny there quite annoying if i'm playing white here i wanted to play h4 he kind of stops me not really but he will take the knight at some point uh even if i win his knight on f4 he wins mine so he goes back to e5 probably was something better there Aaron. it probably was something there is a check and we can trade queens and yeah it's kind of annoying because now the c pawns weak it is possible i love that now uh, james you're on the right plan here knight h3 check trade the queens off the black king suddenly is very safe and then that c3 pawn is loose i am completely with you i think that danny can even turn this around and look at the left hand side of our screen the big greek is cruising how do you stop Whoa. this pawn sheesh oh wait oh damn. yeah he made a huge mistake why dang. i thought he was just gonna push the pawn but he missed that his rook is hanging with check over here so he can't take on d5 which looks like mm. it wins a rook but instead it loses a rook Thanks to the intermediate queen takes rook on e1. You can see my highlights on the screen there. That rook is hanging with check, and that was a big missed opportunity for the big Greek. Shuvalov also with the, the confidence sip, and it was a longer one too, like a few sips. It's like, you know, play rook takes d5, sip, sip, sip. You might be in the wrong seat when that happens. Something may have went wrong, or they may just be thirsty. But at the same time, you know, that sip there, <laughs> it, that says a lot. It says confidence. Rook takes d5. Shuvalov is like, I got this. I'm good. Now you might have to play c6, but that might run into a rook to c5. It is actually quite different here. a3, he's just giving up the pawn. I'm sorry. Takes, takes, takes. Yeah, that's an extra pawn in an end game. And this pawn on b2 is on a dark square. So you mentioned this piece earlier that black's only good piece was that dark square bishop. Now it's a great piece. As are the rest of black's pieces, this is is falling to pieces for the big Greek. He's very upset. I think there's some lingering effect from game one where he was quite upset he didn't win the game. But now Paulina, she's well in charge on the left-hand side of our screens. And meanwhile, on the right-hand side, James, it looks scary for Danny, but he's rerouted the knight from f4 to mm. d5 to e7. He wants to wrap it around to f5. And those hanging pawns are looking quite loose as well. Exactly, with knight f5. And it would be so nice to play a g4 here. But this h5 move that Danny played earlier was really, really nice here. And a nice c6 hits the rook. Okay, hitting the rook. Maybe we have some d5 possibilities. Trying to create this pass pawn and just push it through. Yeah, because d5 actually defends on c4 as well. So Danny has to have some type of caution here. 
He does. And on the left-hand side of the screen, it looks like Polina has put all of her ducks in a row, or should I say all of her heavy pieces on the D-file. You see them all protecting one another, and Bishop C7, that hits the A5 pawn and the Rook on D8. So that is a double attack, and I think the best way forward is to play cautiously for Polina. She does just that. She knows when to slow it down just to defend this pawn on A5. I would get rid of it from the dark squares, play A4, and she's clamping down on this B2 pawn, a long-term weakness. But James, D5 was captured by Danny, and it was given an exclamation point. Are there some back rank tech? The pawn takes D5, queen takes Whoa. C6, and that back rank checkmate is going to kill oh, White. Oh my goodness, you can't take it! So, okay, but there's also a counter pin. So, mate, oh, but this is the oh. same thing. Queen he, takes C6, right? He walked right into it. Yep. Yeah, queen just, C6 just should end the game. Wow. Let's see if he spots it. Has Danny been doing his puzzle Danny? rush today? Come on, chat. Has, has Danny <laughs> been doing his puzzle rush? Put your puzzle rush score in the chat. He played it. Queen takes C6 and G4. Whoa, okay. This is getting spicy. Bro, this is getting spicy. That's a sick move. What yeah, the heck is this? Like G4. He recognized that there was a back rank checkmate problem, so he plays G4 a la tempo against that knight on f5 so it's getting very double edged in a way and look at danny he's fully conscious but divis look at that clock james he's always in time trouble yeah that's the problem if he continues to have this type of time trouble he just won't have any chance at all um and he needs to he, he wants to get on the board i think he's lost every game so far and it's difficult it's easier said than done obviously but it is it's just it's annoying of course because you, you get positions you know you're winning and then the time and then the time and then the time and then the time so you know you try to fix it and it can only do so much so hopefully he's able to fix this maybe even in the next game where he moves a little bit faster has a little bit more confidence maybe and then uh, we can do something there but danny in the think tank here where do we go robert I've never seen Danny so quiet and so concentrated, <laughs> but he is trying to figure out, does he move the knight? But if he does that, the f7 pawn is in the rook sites. Maybe the queen can be captured on c6. So Danny, he's working through the complications here. He plays queen of six. Now pawn takes f5. He's going to play g5. I, I thought that's where he was going. And his pawn structure is better, but white is super active on the d file while black is active along the e file. It's anyone's game except for the clock. Queen g5 check was probably really nice there, connecting the pawns. Uh, but, okay, queen f4, and the time's getting low. Just two seconds, one second, bro. He got to move. Like, he just, it sucks because he has to instantly move now. You only get one second yeah, increment, and that one second goes so fast, it's ridiculous. You were right, though. The queen g5 immediately was good because now the bishop was able to scoop up the f5 pawn. The bishop can sit on e6 or g6. He goes to e6 to trade more pieces. When up material, you often look to trade. And this should be a winning endgame if Danny doesn't botch it. And I think that he can go after all the pawns. Like, take rook d1. D6. Oh, rook d5. He wants the g-pawn. Yeah, he can take the g-pawn, it seems like. Maybe rook down. I guess he missed. He might have been pushing or something. But then rook takes anyway. Maybe king f4. Who knows? Rook f. Yeah, who knows? Yeah, there, there are so many opportunities, or options, I should say, for both sides. And when Divis has no time on his clock, how is he supposed to find the right choice? The rook will go to d5. The pawn pushes to d6. Now the rook stops that pawn from behind, and the h pawn is free to run. I think Divis knows that mm. this game should be Danny's. Oh, he didn't take d6, which was hanging. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was just hanging. It was just hanging there. But I mean, he's saying like, "Hey, how are you going to queen it? Like, I'm going to take it when you try to queen the pawn." And it's happened. It's there. Wrench wins on time. And man, six games. Oh, and six right now for Divis. Of course, Divis fans around the world are like, "Come on, Divis, let's go. Come on, bro. Come on," type thing, right? So it's hard out here. It's definitely hard out here. Um, but there's more games and there's more matches left. But kudos to Danny for keeping up the pressure and winning so far in this match. He's a point and a half away from going forward. We got a dragon. That's about to get sharp. Okay. They're getting sharp over there. And look at this end game on the left-hand side. It's one that requires uh, proper technique. And, well, Pauline decided to take on A3 too soon. It would appear the engine goes right back to the middle because after the swap of bishops on A3, the B5 pawn will be captured. And this end game, two on two on the king side, one extra pawn for black, it should not be enough. You just get your rook behind the passer 
and this should be a draw because it's hard for black to make progress here. And the engine, sometimes it doesn't see all the way through, but now it's in the middle. It says zeros. It says should be a draw. The black king is cut off. It needs to be on B2. Good luck getting over there. Good luck getting over there. And oh. good luck on your time as well. I mean, shoot, king h2, yeah, I mean, makes blunders. Now, king h2 didn't seem like, I guess, because the king just walks over. Like, who knows what you should have done, right? <laughs> Go back to Devil Rescue page 800, you know, like somewhere in there you're supposed to win it. but Or draw it here. It takes... Push rook over. I think mm, the problem is, James, that you need to attack the pawns earlier. Now black is ready for the bridge. A2, if you go rook to E1, there's rook B1. If you go rook A8, there was rook A4. There's a win for Polina Shivalova. But the big Greek, his endgame technique, it left a bit to be desired there. Uh, he had what was a theoretically drawn endgame, but he was shuffling back and forth. He needed to attack these pawns while his rook was behind the enemy passer. That would have been the way to save the game. He didn't have time, though, so I can forgive him. Yeah, he needed that. He didn't have time, exactly. It's just like kind of the story today in like uh, both parties here. Whoa, and then the eval bar on the right just went crazy after A6. Trying to figure out what is going on. Is the queen trapped the queen. or something? Bishop b6, the a3. Trapped. The queen! Oh my. Bishop b6, gosh. a3 after queen b4 for the score. Get him off the board. Start a new game. And Danny sees it. I, you saw it on his face. He was like, are you, are you sure about that a6 move? Because after bishop b6, you point out queen b4, a3 traps the queen. And if queen e5, there's pawn to f4. And at best, Black has to sacrifice a piece just to save the queen, and that's not going to do it. Divis, look at his face. He knows it's over. Mm, mm -mm. Head shake. Nothing happened yet, though. Danny in the zone. Does Danny see it? He must. He has to, right? And why is there only one question mark on that move, right? That feels <laughs> like you lose the game with it. I I'm usually nice to the players, and right. I have so much respect for Divis. I recently saw oh, for him. Sure. Uh, such a great person. But he would be the first to say, no, that deserves like eight question marks. And there it is. Bishop b6 played. And he takes a deep breath, looks down, head shake there. You can just feel the pain here from Divis. As you want to play your best chess as much as you can. He started moving fast. Like, you know, he's he's doing good on time. And then you make a mistake from moving too fast. Like, it's like, can I... Can I catch a break? I move fast, I lose because I'm moving too fast. I don't move fast enough, I find good moves, but I don't have time. So it's hard to have the balance sometimes, but that takes a lot of practice, obviously, here. And, you know, he's focused more on the Spanish team, stuff like that, which is good. But being projection more of, of himself to help others, right? So him playing as much, maybe it's just something that he needs to do more of. Is just playing more Blitz games, stuff like that, to be ready for this event maybe later. And it's still another match to do as well. So Queen E5 happened, F4 played. And that, my friends, is a piece. Knight takes e4, a little niftiness, but does lose material. Yeah, it was the best try because you get two pawns for the lost piece, but that's not going to do it. Just put a rook on d1, bring the rook to d7. That bishop on b6, it stops black from playing bishop e3, which would pin the rook. It also keeps the knight on d8 as you're highlighting, saying, no, you're not going to fight me for that one open file. And Danny, he goes direct. I like that too. Knight to d5, hitting e7. This should be over. Yeah, this is tough. This is another tough one. Bishop check. I mean, sorry, knight check. And then bishop c7 looks good. I mean, you can do anything. Knight f6 check, bishop c7. Like, it's g, g, it's g, g. It's a fun master. Mike in the chat. Chat com meetup part two. Knight d7, knight takes e5, coming. Very nice maneuver. Just grabbing the central pawn. Why not? You are up a piece, and now it's going to be for one pawn rather than two. And you can see it on Divis's face. He wants to resign, but he's willing himself to play on. And All right, bishop takes d8. That shouldn't be too difficult, because after knight takes e5, sure, black will win the rook on f2. That's the good news. And Danny doesn't even take the rook. <laughs> he didn't even take the rook. I wonder if he just, like, you know, he sees it, right? Like, you know he sees it. Come on, Danny, take the rook, right? Take the rook, Danny. Take the rook, Danny. Take, what are you doing, Danny? Take the rook, Danny. There it is. Okay. I was going to lose my mind here, but we're good. We're good. He took the rook, chat. Knight d3. Bishop b3. Brings the knight to safety, and you'll get the rook back on f2, but white is up a piece for just one pawn, and that is more than enough for Danny to win, especially looking at the clock situation. I'm not concerned about his chances, and the other game uh, between the big Greek and Paulina, that one for now is level. We'll, of course, uh, keep an eye on both. But 
there was a missed opportunity earlier in the contest. There was a blunder from Paulina that was not spotted by mm. the big Greek. And now we just have a position with chances for both. Oh, double edge there. Three, five, three, five. Okay, two rooks, two rooks, two knights versus knight bishop. You have a knight on d4. A very strong knight. Now it moves to b5, hits the rook. Maybe I go rook f3 here. Maybe reroute to f4. Gotta be careful. Uh, rook e3 might be a little bit too much. Danny wins that game. 3 and 0 there for Danny. All he needs is a half a point to win his match as they start the last game. Knight to c4 hits the queen for Shuvalova. Queen goes where? Maybe b7 to defend a6. Gave that a6 pawn defended. I'm going to quickly back up in this game as both players approach one minute. Because earlier, at this point in time, the move knight e5 was played. And you wow. see the eval bar go all the Whoa, way down. Shoot and the all reason the way why down. is not, not so obvious, knight e2 check. This rook can't take the knight because the rook on d1 would be hanging. And if you move your king out the way, I right. happily swap. And at the end of this, knight c3 with a four. Oh. That's the big point. Yeah, that was Man, a that's shot. wicked. And yeah. Not, not super easy to see because you're not looking at the e2 square. It doesn't really seem available. But once that was missed, I'm going to go to the game continuation, back to the live board. It seems that Paulina, since then, she's the one who has some good chances as these a6 and c5 pawns are both vulnerable. Very vulnerable. a4 was a nice move there. I like uh, how the rook defends on the third rank there. King is on a2. I mean, I'm actually really safe here. There may be, a, well, no, even the knight on g3. Everything's placed well for Suvalov, I think. The knight, the knight on g3 defends h1 because at some point there could be some bishop takes h3, believe it or not, in some cases. And also a rook h1 with queen g2 ideas, right? So that would be sick. But the knight on g3 covers all of that. So it's really nice. Okay, pawn hangs now. Pawn's gone. And where do we go? Should we have a check? Yeah, this knight is also what happened? loose over here. Right. So where, where's the queen going? I was just seeing the same thing. Um, whoa. Oh, queen a4. Okay, hits the rook. Obvious. Oh, nice. I missed that completely. I'm going to yeah, be honest, right. James. I was looking <laughs> at this like, why can't I take this? Why is the bar not reacting? <laughs> the rook is hanging. The rook. That's nice. So where's that rook going? Maybe back to d5, and then the queen slides back to e2. Now, this feels like anyone's contest, especially considering both sides at about 20 seconds, and that usually favors Paulina, and up she goes with her knights. Mm -hmm. These knights, as Hikaru says. Knight f5 is coming as well, right? And I kind of... Well, why is Kanti not playing this event? I'm not playing this event because, and shout out to you guys watching too as well if you're new. I'm not playing this event because I almost won it last year. So I was like, I finished second place, lost Eric Rose in my two games. So I've approved a lot. So I was like, you know, hey, let these guys play. And the format is much harder this year. So I'm happy to be on the sidelines watching these guys go at it. F6, fine goes tripping right now. This is a gross move, right? No, it's not. <laughs> it did work though. It was, it was a double exclam move getting into this end game. And black Whoa. suddenly with an advantage. Wow. Look at Greek. Look at Big Greek. Look at Big G. Oh. Look at Big G over <laughs> here, man. Dang. That was a sick and in-game transition. Now, now it's apparently equal because the, while this pawn is lonely, the bishop can always defend it. So this could turn around. This black king is very close to the queen side, and if it runs, the carpet is rolled out for it, and that's why she played f4. She wants her king to be active as well. g5 takes, takes, and okay, so now it should be draw. But no, that was a nice in-game transition. Yeah, this should be draw. Don't do nothing crazy. Wait a Just second, wait a second. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay, okay, okay. Ooh. Sorry, it's hanging. Yeah, we're good. This, yeah, we see the capture, and then the last pawn will be captured. A lone knight can't deliver a checkmate. The nice. game is a draw. That's good news for Polina, who keeps a one-point lead. And in the other matchup, Danny Wrench is wow. about to go 4-0. and oh, You see that eval? Oh, I spoke, and he made a mistake. <laughs> but it still looks very bad for Danny. Yeah, that's very bad. Wait a minute. Okay, Queen D5. Uh, yeah, look at that. That's pretty gross. I mean, you got the C file come. Okay, so in opposite side castles, we always know that whoever gets to the king first is going to win. We already know that. But... Here, it looks like black is already ready to get to the king here. Now, I'm very curious on this taking of the bishop here. But I guess he's saying queen a2, and, you know, 
watch what you do. Like, you, you're just not getting out of there, I guess. That's a sick find from Danny here. Engine doesn't uh, obviously finds everything. But after pawn takes, this queen a2 move is really sick. If there's a queen c3, obviously rook c8 is coming to the file with a smile there. It's going to be a wrap. Queen a1 looks nice. I mean, like, this is ridiculous. So you really need to be careful here. I wonder if you go, like, oh, c4 hangs made in one. Like, my goodness. You know what I mean? Like, this is a very bad position for for D D Divis here. And he's down on time once again. Plays b3. B3, which... The best move. That is a very hard move to find. Let's wow. actually go into this game because it might be the final one of the match. All Danny needs is a draw. And B3 is an extremely hard move to Ooh, find. The geez. fact that he played it. Oh, my goodness. He's, 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 it's brilliant. He's, he's brilliant. The green pawn is brilliant. Unbelievable. Wow. And this position is unbelievable because another exclamation point from Divis. I hope the content team is watching. I, a video, maybe five videos could be made on this one game here. Queen e5 for black stops knight takes c2 because of checkmate down the diagonal. And he so finds how it. does white react here? Sheesh. Not in the right F4 way. F4 was not the move apparently. Um, but okay, how, what's the follow-up? Let's just, uh, okay, he just goes queen e4 and says, what do you do? Wow. Oh. Is there knight a2 check anyway? Oh, Is man. Knight a oh, it didn't work, though. It doesn't work. Engine didn't react oh, the way that we felt. You know why? James, there was simple idea of knight takes knight on c2 because when the queen took back, the e3 bishop was hanging. So, oh. oh did, did Divis just pre-move something? Man. Let me see. Um, well, it's it's still the same so far. Still the Got same. It. Okay, sorry. We just went back for a second. Yeah, we just went back. Oof. Yeah, we went back okay. just to see. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that knight takes c2 would have distracted the queen from the bishop on e3, but it's so natural to plant your knight on c3 like this, and the game is drawn, and we talked about this, right? You mm -hmm. don't need to win if you're Danny. A draw wins the match. Divis does get on the scoreboard. That's the good news for him. But Danny wins his second match, and if he can beat Paulina in the final match of the day, he will have a chance to win Group C. That is going to be the hardest thing he's going to do today, besides even playing in this event, is beating Shuvalova kind of on the mat basically so this is going to be a very very uphill battle for him it's, it's just hard because she's really strong and of course uh you know danny didn't win the first match there he won this one so he needs to beat shuvalova who is not going to go down easy at all but that was a nice display especially in this last game very attacking very danny like look at him feeling all good there just being danny <laughs> and saying i won danny being danny we saw duo in the background a little owl on the shelf and look at the big Greek. You saw him put his hand up? He's mad at himself. And I wonder why. I guess he overlooked that the rook could come to c4, as it just did. Uh, you couldn't capture it. You wouldn't want the pawn to take. But now the knight comes back to d2, kicking the rook out of the square. I don't really dislike white's position, but I do think that it's easier to play black because the d4 pawn. We talk about pawn structure. A pawn chain is only as strong as the base pawn. This is the base pawn for black. Good mm. luck getting to f7. But d4, that one sticks out a little more, especially if we can get a knight to c6. Suddenly, three attackers on one pawn in the center. Was this a Carol Khan or no? I know she plays a lot of Carol Khan. Just curious. It was a Carol, yeah. Oh, it was a Carol. Okay, so, and the reason why, I mean, I know her repertoire, but I also do know as well... Um, the, the the d4 pawn in these cases especially when you when you trade off the light square bishop you actually are able to uh have a french a very good french in fact which is carol Khan is kind of a cousin of a french so you have this french type structure here where the d4 pawn is extremely weak as you mentioned and she took with the queen here nice c6 was there something wrong with that i'm very interested in that but she took with the queen here i guess she said i want the c file bring the rook to c8 and then bring the rook queen down to c2 i just have a great game excellent great you know uh, game for black here and white on the other hand is having a lot of trouble not to mention my time queen c4 look at how quickly she played that move she understands the end game transition is good for her that's a clearance for the knight coming to d5 a pawn push to b5 a rook to c8 james mm. this is bad news for the big greek he's already been upset with himself this is just going to be a great end game for black which is why he slides the queen but now the c file the only open file is completely in paulina's control yeah, definitely. You're going to have to try to fight. Yeah, King G7 was so classy because my idea was to go 91, Rook C2, and Rook C8. 
with check and then win the queen obviously of queen b3 but it did not happen king g7 will not allow any of those tricks to happen knight a1 not every day do you put a knight on a1 at all so that's a nifty move he wants to put the rook on c2 okay good decision from the big greek he only has 13 seconds though and i love that move you give a big question to the big greek he does not take he did not allow, allow the pawn to c4 instead plays b3 let's keep a symmetrical pawn structure rook c2 queen c2 the knight looks silly in the corner but it's protecting b3 and now you just protect d4 bring your knight out james i think that white is holding on White is definitely holding here, especially after you got the queen to c3, knight comes to c2. I mean, the strangest knight maneuver, knight a1, like, but, oh, yeah, that's a sick find. Brilliant! Look at that move! Queen e2 is brilliant, like, unbelievable. I mean, not unbelievable, but it's just so cool that queen e2 is unbelievable. It's like a brilliant move. Jeez, that was sick. What it a gave, find, bro. That was sick, girl. It gave Dang. up the knight on c6. Because knight e3 check would have been devastating. But the knight on c2 protects the square. So do not blunder your knight now. That knight is, in fact, hanging. She should move it maybe to e7. Maybe if she's tricky over to a7 trying to get to b5. But it does feel like white has all the pieces together. Suddenly, the big Greek is defending himself. He is definitely defending quite well, too, as well. She takes the trade, says knight b5, and we lie. What are you going to do? That's a pawn! And that's the game. That's all it takes. What? And there it is. And big Greek... Yep, says something in Greek there, and yeah, this is a wrap. <laughs> <laughs> this is a wrap. Oh. Yeah, that's over. That's over, boys and girls. Masterclass. And Paulina Chuvalova, she got into an endgame that was favorable for her. I know the Eva bar said, oh, it's just even. There's nothing major happening here. There was something major. Only white pawns could be attacked, and the big Greek. Georgios only had a couple seconds. He made a rush decision, and he paid the price. He lost one pawn, and then a second. And now we enter Bullet James, and it's the Philidor defense. The big Greek cannot even allow a draw. Yeah, he should. I mean, he probably should have chose something else. I ain't gonna lie. Philidor defense is, uh, well, if you play the, the aggressive lines are very fun for White here. This one, okay, you're fine. You're fine. I mean, it's super equal here. Yeah, I mean, I always take White in these positions here. Always. You know, you just get the pieces out very easy, but now it's just super equal. Eva bar, nice C6, nice C6, nice C6. Mm hmm. Okay. Missed for a turn. And James, that's the problem when you only need a draw. Sometimes you're not actually really playing the full board because when you need a win or you're just playing a normal game early in an event, you're looking at all the tactics. Here she's just like, ah, whatever, it's even. I'll make a draw if I <laughs> don't do anything silly. Yeah, just don't do anything crazy. Play real good chess here. Develop the pieces, trade everything off. Make it an easy game. Yeah, this is like, I mean, how are you supposed to play for a win from black here? Like, <laughs> like this is just, man, you're going to have to take some serious risk here, which where do you even take those? I I wish I could tell you. You asked the yeah. question. I know it was rhetorical. I'm going to try to answer it. How <laughs> can black win this game? Yeah. Um, mm. uh, I mean, power mm. outage, maybe if she has a power outage or like, <laughs> maybe like, you know what I'm saying? Somebody cut the lines on the back end or something. I got nothing. Yeah, I'm trying to think of something, but there isn't. There are only two open files. White has control of one. Black has control of the other. Both kings are perfectly safe. There are no targets. This a4 pawn maybe sticks out a little bit, and queen c6 was played, but b3, that defends the weakness. I don't see anything, James. I'm trying very hard to... Oh, now I take. Okay, now we're talking about winning chances. You take that pawn, you bring a rook to b8, and black will be a pawn ahead with some prospects down the open file. I also do like the G5 idea, of course. It's like, you know what? I'm just, who cares? G5, G4? It is what it is. We're just about to go for me. G5, G4. Maybe move the knight around to F4 and rook G6. A6, classy move. Trying to, if we get to an end game, that pawn is going to be real. A real problem. And the queen goes up. The king does the same. Gets out of the check. I think that white is doing just fine here, but I would have preferred to trade if I were Polina because when I look at this position, the queen on b8 looks threatening, but you're leaving your king a little bit vulnerable. Queen a4 suddenly hits the a6 pawn and the rook on d1, so she brings a queen back, and that, he could have played queen b5, hitting two pawns at once, and instead he walks Ooh, right into attack sheesh. that ends the game. Yeah, he hit the button right there, my guy. It's just not your day. It's just not your day in this match. In this match. That's all good. It is what it is. That was a sick move. Knight h5. Okay, so knight h5, queen h2. Maybe I just take the queen and take the pawn. No, I mean, simple. Okay, <laughs> fancy. Oh, she gives up. <laughs> oh, 
fancy. Gets the queen, gets the queen back, and yeah, apparently nice. Black isn't dead. Lost right now. Rookie two. Suddenly this could turn around. Wow, ninety four. She stopped it though. She's like, yeah, ooh, I let him in a little bit. Let me stop that. C4 is hanging. Now we're going to take it with the knight here, defending B2 at the same time. Rook C8. Very nice. 93 checks coming. That's a resi. Oh, he just lost on time or something. That's a, yeah. It could have been a resi, but she wins on time. It doesn't matter how it happened. As long as she got the job done, Paulina Shuvala, she hasn't smiled once, but she is <laughs> dominating in Group C thus far. She has won two matches in a row with games to spare. So, Paulina, we know she's 2,500 plus in classical chess. She's great. She's really, really strong. And with one match to go in the group, she is in charge. And look at that final score, four to one. She won the longest time patrol. She won the middle time patrol. She won the last game. All three phases went to Paulina. Yeah, she's playing extremely strong. She's getting a lot of experience too as well, playing in all type of events. I'm just seeing her all around the world and playing a lot of chess here. And it's definitely showing today. The more practice you get, the better you're going to be. And she's definitely showing out here, trying to win the very final match here. It's going to be a very strong match. Danny's going to be fighting an uphill battle here, trying to take out Shuvalova and maybe even take it in the tie breaks. And we see the cross table where Polina in first place, she beat the Big Greek 4-1 after beating Divis by four to none. And Danny, he scoots up into second place. He lost a close one in the final game to the Big Greek, but he wins three and a half half over Divis. Meanwhile, the Big Greek with one match victory to his name and that up being the close one against Danny, he loses to Polina, but he will get Divis, who is struggling mightily, has only a half point from the eight games that he has played. So we know what we're left with. James, Polina, if she wins the match, she controls her destiny, but so does Danny, because if he beats Polina, he catches up to her, and that means that we'll have to have another Armageddon just like yesterday that we saw between Greg and Aline. So before we head to break, any thoughts about what we've seen and what's to come? It's crazy. I'm liking I'm liking what I'm seeing here. Danny's, you know, stepping it up. Polina's just crushing right now. She's trying to win her last match. And also I think Big Greek, would that be a that would be a three way tie, wouldn't it? If uh he wins his match against Divis? So then it'll be bullet chess. So, I mean, there's like so many factors here that can happen. But one thing is for certain, there's a lot more chess coming up. So I'm excited for it. There definitely is. You will not want to miss this. Danny Wrench against Paulina for the top of the group standings. The Big Greek, his name is in the mix as he takes on Divis. We'll be back in a few with the players. It's the third round of action here in Group C of the IM SEC. The way I understand it, there are two spells. You can freeze a three by three area of the board, and then you can mark a piece that you can use to, to jump. Um, so we're gonna start with the Sicilian here. Now I'm threatening to take his pawn, because I could freeze his knight and then potentially take the pawn, but I'm out of the freeze, so I guess. Oh, and he froze my uh he froze my pawn. That's very smart. Okay. I think that's how it works. Um <laughs> Okay, so that means I lost a piece here. So can I jump through this piece? I don't understand. That jump I still need to figure out. Maybe it's on the other piece. Can this piece jump? No. That is the tricky one. It's the jumping hmm. thing. So I'm That's down a minor piece. Wait, why did... No. Oh, James... Wants to jump over and attack G7, so I'm going to castle. Can I jump through this? No. He was attacking my pawn on G7, because the queen could have jumped no, over to take my pawn. with this jump piece. Oh, of course, he, he probably will play bishop H6, and then I'll have to play G6. Okay, but now he can set a jump on G6 and play queen G7 checkmate, I'm pretty sure. And I don't have my freeze, so I think if James figures it out, he mates me. Yeah, this is why I'm not good at variants. <laughs> I'm, good at, I'm good at chess. Um... Okay, he missed it. He missed it. I think he... Oh, and he froze me, so that's annoying. Can I jump? What if I put it on his piece? I'm just curious to know. Do I bounce off of it or something? Like, what does this thing do? Oh, wait. Okay, he gave up oh. his queen for some reason. 
Uh, yeah. What okay. is he preparing to do? Yeah. Ah, uh, no, 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 no. He's gonna take my queen. I guess we're done. Like, there's no more freezes. We're just playing chess. Okay, if we're playing chess, then I lose. GG. Nicely done, James. Danny Wrench won his match against Divis. He has one match victory to his name after the first loss to the Big Greek. He's taken part in Group C and he has his hands full because up next is Paulina Shuvalova. And Danny, we know him. We love him. He's a commentator extraordinaire. He was doing commentary before commentary in chess was even a thing. But he's also the chief chess officer of chess.com. And he's won over the board classical events ahead of Grandmaster's the 2019 Denver Open. He beat several IMs and Grandmaster Alexander Fishbein in the final round to win that tournament, the 2019 Denver Open. So shout out to Danny Wrench, the green pawn. He's a superhero, but he also is now trailing Paulina. James, he knows what he has to do. He needs to beat Paulina Shibalva. There are no other options. Yeah, there is just no other option. He has to work. He has to work hard. You got to see everything. You have to spot everything. You have to take your chances where they are because you understand. Of course, obviously, put that pressure aside. Yes, you know, no pressure. But when you do have that pressure, or like if you, you approach it with a, uh, hey, just play the game in front of me, you know, you can have good results from that. If he focuses more on, hey, what I have to do, then, you know, you could get sidetracked, maybe miss some moves there and let the pressure get to you psycho um, psychologically. So hopefully we'll see Danny, you know, uh, flourish here. But then again, hey, Shuvalova does her thing here. She's just going to punch the ticket immediately by winning the match. So it's up in the air. That's true, because Paulina Shubalova has won both of her matches. She beat the Big Greek just now. Before that, she beat Divis. And for Danny, he gets to face Paulina. He controls his destiny. If he beats her, we likely will have four games, a bullet between them as a tiebreaker. And the Big Greek, I believe he needs maximum chaos. He needs an Armageddon between Paulina and Danny for Danny to win an Armageddon. And then the Big Greek himself needs to win 4-0 against Divis. Unlikely scenario, but perhaps possible. Meanwhile, Paulina, she says, don't talk to me about anyone else but Paulina winning. That is who is trying to get the job done. And I see a smile there, James. I yeah, she was laughing at you, bro. I've seen her smile today. Yeah, she was laughing at you. She heard that comment. <laughs> and she just I was like, yeah, you're right, Robert. Ha, ha, ha. You're so funny, Robert. You're so funny. <laughs> All right, and then now she's about to get back to work. You see her roll the sleeves? All right, like, let me get let me get to work now. Let me get let me get this money, right? So she has to, uh, you know, do her thing here as games are about to start. Let's see what happens. 
and the games are live. We see on the left-hand side of our screen, ooh, we're getting a bishop b5 check against what could have been a Nidorf. So it's going to be a positional affair between Paulina and Danny. I think for Paulina, she knows that she's safe at least to have a tiebreaker match, but she doesn't want any part of that. She wants to win this group outright. She wants to go three out of three. She definitely, yeah, definitely wants to go three out of three here. I do already like her position as that knight is moving around like crazy here. There may be some pushing up in the center. Okay, so knight c7, though. I don't see the kill shot yet, and that feels very good if I am black here because I'm just kind of ripping open your center, which is white's, you know, uh, pride and joy here is this very strong center that is now attacked twice here. So it's sort of modern-like, as you would see in the modern defense and stuff like that. So takes and takes. Yeah, I wonder how we take this. Takes, bishop takes, takes, knight takes. So he took that way to keep a pawn on e5. What if he takes on e5, though? Ooh, these positions are getting spicy. I mean, you look at Danny. He's thinking here. Both pawns are loose in the center after Polidic stole a pawn. But as we look at that position, this knight on c7, that's the awkward piece for Danny right now. And he's deliberating. If I just take back on c5, what happens? He chooses to take back with the knight. And the computer loves white's position, probably because the king is castled. And there may be a rook d1 with a pin on the d6 pawn. I was definitely thinking that too as well because I was trying to figure out like why is white just like you know just better clearly here but of course rook d1 looks good we are castle and you know we have a very flexible a very nice flexibility I mean even showing she's showing that right now flexibility and you know what we can take first and then go rook d1 I'm a fan of the tempo maybe c5 b4 is hanging so I'm a big fan of the tempo I worked with a Russian chess coach so it was like yeah I just love I love the tempo but okay he like he like he loves the tempo a lot <laughs> so it's very important to hit pieces or hit do things with tempo gains time so b4 was really nice bishop b2 that's a tempo hits g7 engine didn't like it but from a practical standpoint i developed a piece for free i do like this choice from danny just saying you know what cool take the pawn take it paulina definitely take it so he wants some action here it's much more danny style instead of getting positionally squeezed he wants an open file for his own pieces and queen B2, apparently not the best move. I think Danny should bring his queen out to E7. Protect the bishop with the queen. He's getting ready to castle queenside over here. And the black king, let's be honest, it won't be perfectly safe. But the white king is never going to be fully safe either with a rook on the semi-open line. I'm not going to lie. That was a very nice practical choice because it is kind of annoying to face what's down the G file. But if I think about it, I would be more scared if you had a light square bishop, which you don't. So... I can actually be okay with it. Let's just say, think about defense here. G3 from white, and I'm just, I'm feeling good. I'm okay. At, at some point, if I need to, I can play G3, and I'm totally fine. On the contrary here, if you are casting queenside, I'm going to move my knight to maybe D2 or C3. C3 does block the connection of the queen and bishop. So maybe knight B to D2. I play rook B1, and your king is on C8 if you're casting that way. A3 is going to come in with a, a nasty punch there down the B file. And she starts with a3, pushing the bishop back. It goes to d6, defending this knight in case the queen wanted to take on b7. That loses a piece right now as the knight defends the rook in the corner. And c5, she's going full Jeez. on aggressive, but the Bro. engine hates it. I mean, yeah, man, me too. Like, whatever. C5. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a very aggressive move, but I just don't understand the context or the follow up here. I mean, maybe we just go knight d2, or maybe I'm not sure what she's trying to do with with c5 here. I guess open lines, it makes sense. It does make sense practically. I think maybe knight d2 to c4. Like, you have some practical chances. Maybe put a rook on a c file. Yeah, practically makes total sense, especially if you are going to put your king on the c file. Yeah, we want everything open right now. So. Great practical choice, I think, but definitely was off the radar. Yeah, she's just throwing pawns, opening files. That's the good thing when you lose a pawn, you open a file. And so queen takes b7, hitting the knight. The knight protects the rook, so that knight can't move. Rook takes g7, will be met by queen takes knight. And then the point is well taken. The black king will not have true shelter. Maybe eventually it can run away to g8 castle by hand. But this is getting spicy. She just shook her head there. It was a head shake. From Shuvalova, I'm, sure, I'm curious to know what was the head shake there. Oh, Danny with some moves here. That was nice. Queen f3 was the, was the idea, hitting a1 as well, but knight b to d2. And, yeah, man, look at my king's safety, Robert. Like, you know, one of the things we say in chess here is you got to worry about your king's safety, right? Castle the king? 
I'm in the center of the board. Bishop b6. King stays in center. It attacks the queen. The queen slides back, hitting the rook. Knight e4 next. The knight on f3 is actually defended in this line. James, your point, very well taken. There's a pin down the g file, but the queen defends f3. It's so after knight e4, knight d6 check. The black king is simply being hunted. I do not like this one bit for Danny. He got a little bit too ambitious. Definitely did with that. Of course, that, I mean, I like the idea of not sitting passively and waiting um, at all. I think we talked about like Korchnoi and Polievsky was talking about like pawn. Like they would rather give you a pawn and fight for initiative than defend passively. Right. So that's what we saw from Danny there. But here it is just not working at all queen g2 i mean or queen g2 is made obviously but so what's the idea like what's wrong with this like what knight g3 apparently there was something much stronger i don't know what it, that is probably mm. just because i see the eval bar reacting like a knight h4 move which hit the oh, queen that's sick. and defended the checkmate at once but the thing about this position is it still looks good for white the, the x you missed something. That's true. But I don't think Paulina thinks about it like that. She doesn't know she missed a plus five move. She's looking at this saying, uh, what attack were we talking about? Uh, my king on g1? Perfectly safe and sound. Your king on e8. Good luck to you. Knight e5. Well, now it's knight e5. Immediately. Can be played. And we also saw a confidence sip there from uh, Paulina there. It's always annoying. When that sip comes out, it's pretty serious. So, okay, knight takes e5 is also is very playable right now. You could also try to keep the tension, maybe a queen a4, don't trade, and go rook d1, and try to go rook e1 and really pile up on uh, everything um, that black has, right? So, But she shows the, the in-game route. Totally easy to play. Eval Bar is losing his mind right now. Why is it? Ooh. Oh, that's a, that's a that's wrap. That's why. That's a wrap. But rook g6? That's why. What happens on rook g6? In 97. Boop. Oh, she hitting both your rooks, bro. She, <laughs> yeah, that's that's sick. That's that's nice. Very nice from Paulina. James, I don't know when I've ever seen a knight fork rooks <laughs> while sitting directly in front of a king. <laughs> yeah, that's the first. That's probably the first in chess history. Actually, in fact, it's probably <laughs> just no position ever that you will find except today, guys. So you know, history in the making here. Ninety-seven and knight takes g six and move the knight away. And this is clean extra exchange for Paulina. She's also up upon as if the exchange weren't enough. So two rooks versus one rook. And then there's a bishop for just an extra pawn for white. So unless Paulina blunders, which I don't see happening as she has nearly two minutes on the clock, she is going to take game one. So for Danny, I wouldn't resign just yet. You see the frustration on his face. Yeah. I'd probably let that frustration out and then get ready for game two. That's it. You have to just, you know, you have to get over it fast and play the board. Play the board. Continuously look all around the board. Look for tactics. Look for your chances. Try to stop your opponent staying. It's always easier said than done, obviously. But at the same time here, that's just, you know, what you have to tell yourself and what you have to work towards. Especially when you have such an ex a strong opponent like uh, Paulina here. As she, uh, There's a resignation from Danny. One game up and one game down from Paulina. So Paulina takes the early lead. Danny resigns. And chat, let's get you involved. Do you think that Danny can bounce back? Can he win this match against Paulina? He is down a point. She is super talented, 2,500 plus Fide. And she just took a sip of her beverage. So you know she's oh, feeling good. Yeah, that's always when you see that power sip, you know what I mean? You know, usually if somebody's losing, they're not out here like, let me sip my water. Let me sip my tea or my coffee. They're like, I'm about to throw this coffee mug across the room, actually. In fact, so... You know, very confident from Paulina there. Danny is going to have to bounce back, and he's going to have to do it very fast and very, very quickly here. And we see that knight on e4. It looks like a good square for it, but it was given a question mark. That means the d4 pawn can be captured. We know that because we see the question mark. Do the players know it? Paulina yeah, grabs yeah. that pawn on d4. Was this a, was this a, uh, I'm looking at it, I actually kind of missed it again, I was looking at the uh, Big Grease game. Is this a Panoff, Bodfinick, um, Carol Khan? It was. It was exactly okay. that opening. So it started so, as a Carol yeah. Khan, and now it's an extra pawn. Yeah, and and usually when that happens here, after no personal experience, I'm not doing well with my, like, I'm not doing well. When you lose this pawn, there's tactics involved where you can, like, take on F6 and then D4. But the rook is far away from that. Like the rook could go to d1, and like you can have all this cool stuff happen. But this, I'm just not. I'm not fast enough. And he plays it, but it's, it's just not fast enough. Black's just gonna be up a pawn. 
Now, of course, we see, we did see um, him do this to Big Greek. He was down a pawn early in the opening. He got that game or that end game where he actually ended up winning and getting the pawn back. But this is not the Big Greek. This is Paulina. But at the same time, um, it's the same situation. I've been here before. I still have some activity. Yeah, you have to go for it if you're Danny. Go for the Black King. And the worst part about his position isn't even on the board. It's on the clock. And now it's getting worse on the board. We see the eval bar dip. But he's spending time and he's in a questionable position. If you're going to bluff, if you're going to play speculative sacrifices, you need to follow up relatively quickly. And quite honestly, the five-minute time control may not be the right time control to sacrifice pawns if you don't know with a high degree of certainty that it will work out. Well, after F6, and fine, though, says, what did I tell you? Never play that move. Never and play Apparently, it. Danny chose the wrong diagonal because knight F4 at some mm. moment, maybe this moment, ain't going to feel good. Yeah, you're right. You're 100% right. But, okay, knight F4, I have bishop check. Maybe there's a bishop E6 because my queen's hanging. I'm going to take, take, maybe queen C4. Yeah, that bishop. Okay, so one thing that is going to be a dagger for the rest of the game is the bishop on d4. This bishop, you can't oppose it. I mean, how are you going to oppose it with your bishop? It's on the wrong side of the board. Only way to get rid of it is to sacrifice. What, a rook on d4? You have lost your mind. So it's it's just really, wait, is that a, what did I miss here? Uh, um, I don't know. Divis, Danny. by the way, just Divis. got his first win. and Divis with a dub, yeah, let's go. Holidays. Yeah, I think that's just hanging. And Danny, and yeah, you can see the head shake. Yeah, he just resigned. Okay, yeah, he's out of it. Yeah, Danny's out of it. Danny is out of it, guys. That is just, that's just, I mean, it happens. It's hard. It's tough. It's tough, tough opponent, and he just dropped a piece there. Yeah, it's a tough game. And I wonder if Danny is doing game review right now because he's <laughs> looking at the computer screen, trying to figure out what could I have done game differently. Review, yeah. Was my pawn sacrifice good? And sometimes that's all you need, right, James, where yeah. you look, 94, nope, the computer doesn't like it. All right, if I get this position again, I will not give you the pawn in the center. Yeah, that's exactly right. I would, I would do that too as well, just to look at it, make sure, okay, hey, you know, where did I go wrong real quick? All right, cool, don't do that again. You get a little bit of confidence boost. Maybe some moves are good. Obviously, some moves are bad. And we just keep moving, you know, through there. So, Danny is an uphill battle here. He has to win a lot of games in a row. Three. And a draw. It is possible. We've actually seen it happen with Eileen. Versus, uh, who was she beat in that? I forgot. But it was like, she, she needed like two or three games in a row and she did it. It is possible. But it is hard to do. Against uh, Deweed, chair. Deweed, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Correct. All right. And look at this. So Danny's playing a sketchy opening because he feels that he needs to strike. And it's three plus one now. So if you're going to play some dubious openings, don't do it in classical chess. Don't do it in five minute. You can get away with it in three minute. And he's ahead on time. I believe that's the first time we're saying that about Paulina. She's losing on the clock. And there's a weird knight on e7. Should Paulina play d5 or does it actually play into black's hands without knowledge of this opening mm -hmm. the decisions are very difficult i actually like it i like it from danny i like the choice here i think a lot of times and this is just a, a learning uh, for the chat here is if you face stuff like this you just it, it, good things happen when you develop your pieces so immediately i'm going bishop g5 or i'm going you know, maybe knight b to d2 but i did like bishop g5 and it made me around h4 and g3 she went with the queen e2 route and pushing d5 maybe we'll go c4 and knight c3 to just get our pieces out no matter what the opening you're facing you have to develop so here i didn't like giving up the bishop pair you know so i'm annoyed by that by from the white pieces white side here but i do like that we can play maybe knight c3 and if allowed to play pawn e5 as well maybe even right now but uh, might be too much pawn e5 yeah yeah he tripping yeah yeah danny danny just moving too fast you've asked me in a previous game about fianchetto bishops and if i like them and when there are pawns in front of them no i do not <laughs> i like the pawns in the center this knight is a donkey on b8 not getting out and thanks to this d5 pawn so white has every piece on a perfect square danny he was doing well on the clock playing instantly I think he kind of needs to keep it up. Even if he's bluffing, he needs to keep the pace. And that way, he has a shot to get her in time trouble. You're right. In fact, yeah, it may be a bluff and it may be bad, but move real fast. Like, I remember uh, it's uh, we have players here actually in Michigan or like even just seeing, you know, if you're playing OTB and you just want to make the move seem like it's good, you slam it. You just slam it on the board and it could be absolutely 100% garbage. But you slammed it and the intention of it seemed like it was good. 
but it's just not a good move. Now here you can move qu very quickly. There are some pawn breaks, which uh, we even learned this from you a long time ago. Actually, Robert has uh, Robert teaches uh, for a long time. Chat Robert been teaching a lot of people, right? Uh, just from doing commentary too as well. But I remember one thing you said. This is a long time ago. He's like, yeah, whoever controls the pawn breaks controls the game. I am Robert Chess, and I'm like, oh my goodness, that's crazy. So you know he's correct. You know, whoever controls the pawn breaks controls the game. And here there's a lot of pawn breaks for Black. I can't even keep track of all of them. I'm trying to draw the arrows, and I can't do it quickly enough. All of this tension between the pieces. And Polina's thinking here. She's down by 10 seconds. Knight takes d6. Looks like a move, but then d takes c4. And then maybe this bishop <laughs> takes f3. So Danny, <laughs> he's, he's going for trying it. to quicken up the pace. He's going right down that line, too, as well. Let me take with the c4. Ooh, but then bishop f3. I mean, he's making it messy. You know what I mean? I'm making it messy. Knight takes b7, takes on d3, though. I think that's the clean route is take, take the bishop. And then take on d3. It's a cleaner route. c5 is also hanging. I'm with you. That's a really good line. And Pauline is doing the right thing by pausing right now. But Danny up 40 seconds. So the evaluation is important. We're not going to pretend. Paulina, she's in charge. She's playing great chess. But then you start looking as she dips to a minute on the clock. That's Let's when go, Danny. happened. So she, she made a mistake. She played pawn takes c4. She was uncertain about uh, getting into a position where... Uh, she would have her knight on b7. But now Danny has to keep up the speed. We might see a queen trade right now. The knight will come to c6 afterwards after the swap. e5 is loose. Danny, he won't be that much worse even if the computer says that white is better. You know, sometimes nonsense works. You know what I mean? Like all the weird gambits out there, like the elephant gambit or Lat Latavian gambit, the weird stuff that, you know, if you know what you're doing, then you're good. But if you don't, or like, you know, you mix things up, make it messy, things can happen, especially when you're up time. But he has to try to keep this time edge for sure. Or else, you know, if I'm shooting over here, I'm actually feeling a little, I'm, I'm feeling more confident. Okay, I'm even, right now, yeah, I'm feeling good. We've evened out five seconds is not a time advantage. And now we're at the same amount of time. So we'll, we'll, regardless of what's really going oh. on, I'm feeling good. Oh, Whoa, Bishop E5, Danny the man, he's he it. Bro, what? No, he giving no, up no. the whole room? And oh, I'm, national. Get out of this. I'm giving that a I'm giving that a bombastic move because the point is he's trying to create a mess out of this position. He doesn't just want uh, to say, "Oh, I'll make an end game. I'll be slightly worse." He says, "If you take my rook, I'm taking on h2. Then I'll pick up your knight, and your king has to walk into the center. That looks very dangerous." Paulina down to 30 seconds. She, she gives blunders. up her own rook. Wow. And isn't this knight hanging after queen takes is. rook? It definitely, uh, yeah, shoot, dang. Yeah, it's hanging. Look at Danny making the mess here, like just making it happen. You know what I mean? Make it happen, Captain. Queen takes d6 and takes c4 move. No, you have bishop e2. Okay, that's cool. That's cool. But black Look is up that. a pawn. The up king is pawn? very safe here. Just bring your queen to b6, protect your pawn, then knight c6, knight d4, and black is better and up about 20 seconds. So Danny, he needs to keep up the pace. I, I'm not sure what he's thinking about here. Queen b6 to me looks quite natural. I'm not saying that white is worse, but black's play seems straightforward. Bring that pony to the center. Absolutely, bring the pony to the center. Make the pony dance here. Knight to something. C4, we got a pass pawn. Pass pawns, finish the sentence chat. Must be pushed, 100%. Absolutely, and that pawn is pushed there, and Danny is trying to level Okay, maybe not level, but make a make a point on the board here because he needs down two games. But he needs this would be a start. Knight d3, hitting f2. I mean, look at this comeback from the weird opening, weird opening Ooh. stuff. Ooh -hoo -hoo. Nice Did you c5. see that knight? It finally developed to a6, to b4, to d3, back to c5, hitting <laughs> the queen, hitting the a4 pawn. Paulina doesn't have time, and after knight takes a4, Danny is up two two full pawns. pawns. C3, two pieces. Rook b5, c2. Rook c5, rook c8. I think that that should ice the game. And here goes that pawn. I think white probably has to make a sad move like bishop d1 or bishop e4 here. Bishop e4, okay. Yep, knight in. Maybe bishop c2, knight a3. Knight a3. Knight a3, and you can hit the button. And she will. Whoa, Danny wow. with a dub! And he sips. There's the confidence sip. Danny the dub. It honestly gives you that much confidence when you outplay 
a player who is higher rated on paper than he is. And Danny, he said he's been putting in the work. He lost the first two games. And he said, you know what? Let's go for it. It, it doesn't matter if I draw a game. I need to get those wins. I can't afford to give Polina those half points. So I do not think we will see knight e4. We saw queen e4. There it is, James. He mm -hmm. looked at this variation after that previous loss. He improved it. In fact, there is a lot of uh, files on this, a lot of games on this too as well, where it does go both both sides. If black gets fully developed, it is quite annoying. Um, and white has to just try to attack 100%. I do like this from white because like all you're doing is just attack the whole time. But pieces that trade off, you're going to have some problems. So 95, I think, is a move. And after knight takes, you take with the pawn. That's his whole idea here. He's yeah. really going at her. Just trying to improve the structure, open the D file, unisolate a pawn, and woo, knight takes e4, knight takes d8, what's happening there, knight takes c3, knight takes e6, check, the bishop, okay, there, I'm gonna just do the Hikaru thing. Right. Takes, here, 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 takes, here. takes, 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 bishop takes a2, Qu uh, question producer. mark? I'm, I'm not producer. sure. I don't know. It's I'm too complicated. Producer. And wooden shield. Yeah. Knight takes, 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 not too complicated takes, for takes. Polina. Oh, he took there. Interesting. He didn't take on this... e6. He did take, takes on c3 right away, but black is clearly not worse here. That's c3 pawn. James, we've talked about backwards pawns. That's going to be a problem in just a couple moves. It is. It's just annoying because, like, I under, like I've, I've played this a lot too as well. I've actually, believe it or not, sure, I've had like four or five games OTB with this opening. And it's just, you just, hard. it's hard to win. It's very hard to win when they know what they're doing with this. The panel of it's just difficult to play. At a higher level, so it is. Um, you know, it's difficult here, especially when you trade the pieces off. And I, I mean, look at this. Like, you have this the worst pawn, the backward pawn. Now, there's a backward pawn on e6 too as well, so it's more level. But this is not what we wanted out of the opening here. We'd rather go another route. Even the exchange variation I found to be a little bit more venomous than even the pan or bobinek. So king e3 is uh, is good. E5, okay, maybe rook d3. This is a position where black is clearly better connectivity of the pieces, uh, the healthier pawn structure, and rook d3. So now all rooks on the third rank. If pawn takes d4, I think Danny will take with the rook. And rook e7 threatening e takes d double check. So the king should scoot away probably to d2, but of course back to f2 is an option. Yeah, it's going to be annoying. I have to move the king around. I'm trying to win, you know, like it's just uh, it's a rough game. But it's time. It's hard to win these type of positions. Obviously, here I do have to pass pawn the D one. What do we do? Rook B four now. E four takes takes. Rook E three. I'm good. Okay, so Rook B four played, but I can't touch that pawn yet. Such a difficult choice when we're talking about pawn tension. If Black takes and this Rook takes, what happens in a king and pawn game? So the Rook comes to C four, still inviting pawn takes, and then probably uh, even pawn takes is okay. Or not, B5 oh, was available yeah. to black. Mm, B5, wow. Oh, okay, he didn't trade rooks either. Pawn takes, takes, rook back around. We have an F4 coming. Black's just for choice. Like, you have to hold this D-pawn, which is super annoying. And this D-pawn isolated, the A-pawn isolated, but the king is more active for white. And this rook may release, the king may slide up to the C4 square, and suddenly we might be talking about a game that white can play for more. Though I do see that this rook can go from A5 to D5 and back and forth. It should, with best play, be a draw. The number one thing that Danny is doing right is the clock. He has 20, now it's about to be 15 extra seconds. He's been speeding up, and it's been helping him. That's very good. Yeah, that, that, that clock, right? That's what happened in the last game. He just played some gibberish. He just threw some pieces across the board <laughs> and just throwing some stuff out of it. Oh, it worked, right? Got her in time trouble, and it worked. I guess that's the plan here. Just play some gibberish to, enough that does not get you crossed OTB, and, like, you're good. And, and then you, you get them low on time. You get them low on time. And Rook E7, that Rook is trying to go to E2. That would be a problem. I would start... Potentially with a move like rook to d2. But I could see some issues with the rook sliding a5 at the right moment. A white nut needs to be careful. And king d2 is played. But excuse me? Rook g5, anybody? Give me that g2 pawn. By the way, a quick update. Divis won a second game. Divis won. Whoa. It's 2-1 to one over there. Divis has finally woken up, to say the least. A little bit too late, but he definitely is... woke up. 
Yeah, great news for the Divis fans, and there are many of them uh, because he's such a great entertainer, a great personality. He's also a fantastic player, so his start was not indicative of his level of play, and now he's improving on that against the big Greek. Meanwhile, Danny, he improves the locations of his rooks. He might want to trade at some point, but the d4 pawn is loose. His king will slide up to d3. James, with the king potentially coming to e4, black better be very careful as his f4 pawn, it sticks out like a sore thumb. Right now, king e4 might force g5, but black is getting a little bit iffy with those pawns pushing up the board. It definitely is. I think this is more close to a draw than anything else as the time is getting closer as well. Here we got to be careful. King e4 is definitely a move I wanted to play here to hit f4, but now it's just completely defended. I guess he was just saying that's why I didn't go king e4, quick g5, okay, whatever. Rook on a5 is, you know, it looks like it's passive, but it actually is just hitting a4. I can never move off of c4. And it hangs. Rookie two hits the file now. The next question is, what is the next move? Rookie four and then rook c6. You need to start attacking some of Black's pawns. And oh, Black has some things to worry about of her own. She's she's down to 35 seconds, James. She's in time trouble. She's playing great defense right now, but she needs to find some accurate moves. Rook c6, double attack. Danny trying to make it happen. Rook c6 is there. Two pawns are attacked. What are you going to do about it? 29 seconds and counting. Takes, takes. Down goes takes. h6. Wait a second. Watch out for rook h7. That would win a rook. And rook c7 check. There's rook c6 to block or king up to d6. That black king oh is a my huge goodness. danger. Danny might win this, guys. This is crazy. I mean, I really did not. D6. See, I saw it coming, but like, wow, I didn't think it was actually going to happen like this. It's happening in this game? In this game. Oh my gosh. In and game. Don't blunder. A check on the 6th reign. It's the one thing Danny needs to avoid. If this rook slides down to c2, watch out for rook b6. Polina down to 5 seconds. She doesn't know what to do. She does not want to allow rook to e7 check. She sits up she goes rook to b7. But now Danny can swap rooks off the board. He's up a pawn. And his king will help escort the d-pawn to the other side. Will he take it? Will he's he take it? He's thinking. D of time. Polina with 3 seconds. 3.5 here. 1 second increment. Oh. He throws in a couple checks. He wins the A pawn. So he's going to swap on B7 now and maybe take this A5 pawn and then use the D pawn. Up two pawns is Danny Wrench. Takes, takes. She's going to have to win the G2 pawn, which she goes for. So you're going to try to take the G and the F and then try to move the king to win the H and then push the pawns. This is the plan. <sighs> yep, and that might happen. That might happen. King over. The eval bar did go king down up. here. King E6. Rook F3, D6. How is this yep. a draw? It doesn't look that easy. Yeah. Yeah, it's the easy oh. draw. Easy draw. Easy. Oh, my goodness. King H5. King H5. And... Yeah, King H5. That was the only move, Rook James. Up. Oh, wow. Really? King F5 didn't work? Dang. I mean, I saw King H5 myself. I wanted to go there, but that's crazy. All right. Uh, takes, takes. And this, is, this should be a draw. I mean, let's say should King. be because, like, this could get scary. Oh, he got... Yeah, this is actually... This could be difficult for Black. You might make a mistake at some point. Rook f4, for example. G. Oh, it's winning! Oh it's my winning god! Because the king. The king can't go to king h3. F2. The king f2. And if f2, rook f4, and Danny Blank. wins the time! Danny wins! Danny with the fist bump. Anything is possible, says Danny. Anything is possible. Danny gets it done. Oh! The only move was pawn to g3, rook takes f3, and then king the H2. only move is king h2. Yeah, that is so. so difficult to find with seconds wow. on your clock. So it's all even here. Paulina, for the first time in the IMSCC 2023, she's rattled. Yeah, that is, that is, that's a good thing for Danny. They're in the bullet portion now, too, as well. So let's see who has the better bullet skills right now. This is where it really, really matters. Let's not forget, James, that once Danny beat the big Greek in bullet, he immediately lost the next game. So sometimes too mm. much confidence happens when you win some games. You need to be able to stay stable. You need to be composed. And he goes knight to b8. Speaking of composure, to reroute the knight like that, that pony is was on c6, not doing much. Now it's improved. We have a hedgehog structure. By the way, uh, real quick, David won again. <laughs> Davis is three to one on big greek right now so he just he woke up it's just a little bit too late but divis is here divis is finally here divis has showed up for the divis fans out there it's three to one in uh divis's favor versus big greek 
So Divis, he's making the fans proud. He's fighting to the very end. And this knight has just hopped into e5 for Danny. So we see on the right-hand side of our screen, Divis is up 3-1. to one. We're getting a slower affair in that one as uh, now for once there's some pawn trades. But that is standard fare in the, on the right-hand side of the screen. Meanwhile, on the left-hand side screen, f4 is played, going for the score. But James, Ooh. that could backfire because the white king isn't perfectly safe either. And that is correct. In fact, you know, I would love to go G4, G5. You would see this a lot in like the English openings or Bobnik Englishes where you go just go G4, even Vienna's, G3 Vienna's that is, with King H2 and you go G4, G5 and you just go for mate here with your King on H2, believe it or not. But this diagonal from the B8 to H2 diagonal, believe it or not, that's just a huge X-ray that you can see. Now, whoa, um, G dang, that nice trapped. But it's nothing wrong. Oh, nice tactic, though. Oh, Look at that. She's chill. Six. You got to chill out with that. Ooh. Whoa. She oh, might Paulina too many has tactics. no chill, James. That's she has crazy. no chill whatsoever. All she knows is how to play crushing chess moves. And, well, this is still a messy position. Whose king is weaker? Uh, the pawns look bad for black, but that A2 pawn is loose. And the E4 pawn may also become a problem later in the game. That was a nice tactic there. Nice spot. We love tactics here every day for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And he definitely just hit him with a nice one there. Bullet chest, though. Anything can and will happen. 20 seconds for both, roughly. Uh, closer to 30 for Shuvalova here. She's up time in this one. There was a rook g4. That was missed to win the e4 pawn, but bishop d6, 4 c e5 makes sense. James, the bishop on G b2, no longer that strong of a piece. And in fact, with the bishop being locked out of the attack, Danny is going on the offensive over here. You need to be careful, queen d2. You need to be careful, rook g4. What do you play here as white? e6. I just open it up. I don't even care about none of that. e6, but okay, maybe queen takes. Like, I can do nothing after that. But e6, maybe just open it up and be very annoying to your existence e6 anyway oh my goodness oh it could have i think it worked okay. yeah e6 anyway because the bishop's hanging on c5 in many cases queen e6 is check queen e6 is check that's it. essential mm, yeah that is check that is check and daddy down to eight seconds he needs to find a move he plays queen takes e6 takes with the pawn so it's even material but white is the one on the offensive oh <gasps> oh no the oh G bishop pawn. g3 oh rook g3 is coming we might be going to oh. Armageddon here, boys and girls. We and might have our There's Rook one Some type it's of It's a free piece. Give me the piece. It's a free piece. Oh, he's, he's getting Danny it done. Danny Wrench. Danny is getting it done. Leads I'm out of here. For the first time, he rolls up his sleeves. He gives a fist bump. And as we said, Paulina Shuvalva is rattled for the first time. She is a superstar. 2,500 plus Fide. She'll be a grandmaster in the future. But right now, the chief chess officer... He CCO. is putting the chess down on chess.com, wow. and right, he is a draw away from sending this to a tiebreak match to see who will win Group C. Danny is bringing the heat, Mr. Green Pawn himself. Okay, he is came and showed up today, guys. Wow, where did this come from? Out of nowhere. The one, the match that really, obviously, they all mattered, but in terms of like, you know, what really matters right now is how strong this match is. This match matters the most. Uh oh. You lose, uh -oh, you're out. He hung a pawn. Oh, shoot. He did he his before, He just hung that too. pawn on. Yeah. Yeah, this is not good, right? He Against the big Greek, he won the first bullet game, immediately lost the second. This is collapsing so quickly. He lost a second pawn, and uh, what is this configuration of pieces? Yeah, this is our... Pauline. pretty ugly. Dang, that bro. That shows resolve. Sheesh. Crushing it. Absolutely crushing it. And the knight is wrapping around. So Danny will play on because in bullet, there's always a chance. Someone might blunder a checkmate. You don't want to move your knight away from f6. But Paulina is too good. And even though she lost three games in a row, the fact that she's quickly able to bounce back in a game like this, it shows how strong she is. Oh, definitely. Very, very strong. She's trying to keep, well, you know, I think she is definitely, as you mentioned earlier, rattled. Like, you know, you can see the hand on her face here. She looks like she's a little bit more tense. Um, it, it, absolutely, a hand on the face, like really trying to make it work because she she dropped some games. She's now down for the first time. Like imagine being up every single game, every match. Now you're down. That psych is really gonna hit you a little bit. You are down in the match, and you need to come back here. And you're so close to closing it out. Woof, queen takes. And what's happening here? Danny uh, is down whoa. a rook, but all Cold he needs thing. is a draw to win the match. But there's no draw you're to be found. For it. Knight b7 would be good. 
Straight two. Watch out Ooh. for that. That would be a win of the queen. When two pieces on are on the same line, watch out when the piece in between gets out of the way. This should be clean yeah, up now wrap. for Alina. That is a wrap, bro. That's a wrap. Jeez. Dang. There's nowhere to go, right? Yeah. But it'll be tied at least. And we got tie breaks. So, shoot. Like, we got to, I mean, hey, guys, more chess. We got tie breaks. Because this is exactly what's probably about to happen here. Oh, it she is possible. She oh, my check. goodness. She, and he didn't take they it. They both yep. missed it. That, the nerves. That the nerves. Was hanging. With check. Nerves. It's hanging. It's, it's, hanging, it's hanging. it's hanging. Queen takes it. Check. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh. <laughs> and, and now white is up upon james i cannot believe what we're witnessing here oh, oh my, my goodness knight of seven he's going i can't to check i me. can't believe this bro i can't i just can't believe this going on right now i just couldn't i just can't Qu believe it six seconds for danny he could be in trouble there is a pass on his queen e4 check i think that's a great move it might force a draw if the king goes back to g8 is that Oh, we, yeah, because the knight's hanging. Queen, so G6? Oh, take on D4. Wait, but now black can only lose. Like, this is... Black's oh, down the pawn. Danny might win it's this a game. It's a wrap. And Danny is going to force... So, wait. Oh, let me, let me, you hung the queen. Oh, my wow. gosh. And what a collapse. Danny wins four straight games. What a tail. Look at it with the hands. Like, I don't know what happened. I don't know what's going on here, guys. I, I, I literally don't know what happened. <laughs> I literally don't know what happened. Like, wow. Oh, fist and pump. And you see the fist bump. Danny goes on a tear. He wins four straight games against Paulina Shuvalova, the highest rated player in this field. And Danny, as you can see on the scoreboard right there, won the three plus one and the bullet, the one plus one, without giving her a single point. Now, to be fair to Polina, a draw in that game would have been a loss. That's probably why she played on. I think in the moment, I didn't recognize that fully. So she does deserve a lot of credit. And there we see in the other match, it looks like Divis. Uh, he was getting the job done against the big Greek. So shout out to Divis for playing to the very end. Play to the very end. He's like, you know, I got to get some points on the board. I know how to push these pieces too. Yes, I had two bad matches, but this third one, yeah, I got you. Come here, big fella. Like, right, hold these, and Big Greek went down in this one. Now, of course, I think that knocks them both out anyway. So it will only be Danny versus Paulina here to take it all, Robert. Look at this cross table. Paulina, she was two match victories to her name, but she suffered her first defeat against the person you see in a tie. In second place there, Danny Wrench beats Paulina Shubava. Four wins on demand. The big Greek lost to Divis. Divis's overall score wasn't great, but at least he ended on a high note. He gets to celebrate that match victory against a great treasure of the chess world in the big Greek. But it's down to two. We know that we have Paulina. We know that we have Danny. They're gonna get right back to it, James, in a second here, they're going to be playing more bullet chess. Who do you have as the favorite now that we're down to your two pre-tournament predictions? I'm always a fan of momentum. Now, of course, a lot of times, and here's two things. I'm going to go with Danny here. Even though Shuvalov was my pick, I'm still going to, well, I said Danny or Shuvalov, so kind of both. But Danny actually has that momentum on his side. And that momentum, when you just lost four games in a row, like you're mad. You're like, how did I let this happen? And you got to get out of your own head before them games start. Because if you don't, you can sit back down and it could just be more of it. A lot of times, too, also that pause is important. Like, you know, you see somebody get on a roll and then they pause or they take a break. And then they come back and they lose that. So hopefully it doesn't happen to Danny. Maybe it does. Maybe it doesn't. But, of course, Danny right now has a huge momentum on his side. He does. And he had to play this KG dodge, dodging her opening's chess. Now he can play normal chess because it's zeros. We're at the beginning of a new match. It's the group stage tiebreakers. We have four games of one minute plus one second increment bullet. The first to two and a half points wins. The colors alternate with each game. And if they're still tied, we will have five minute Armageddon. That's very important. It's bidding Armageddon. And we saw that yesterday between Aline Robers and Greg Shahadi. So James, let me ask you a question. In a four game match, a bullet chess, 
Do you think it matters which color you have first? And if it does, which color would you rather start with? Uh, you know what? I'd rather start with uh, the white pieces here, one with white, draw with black. So if you, I mean, obviously that's the high level chess thing. But if I win with white, then cool. I get the black pieces. Cool. I win that one too. So I like to start, you know, obviously with the white pieces just to kind of mix it up, especially in bullet chess. I have a wider range of, of, of openings that I can play. Let's say, you know, we play D4 here. I'll play E4 here. Or I'll, I'll mix it up a little bit just to make you think. A little bit and try to take you out of what you already know we already playing you know bullet chess at that so i'll take white pieces there the standard way of doing it the professional route is take the white pieces and then uh and go from there well we'll see who starts with white in game one and it is going to be paulina actually uh, she is the high rated player of the two she gets white in game one in this bullet and for danny as you said momentum matters He's probably feeling more confident, but there's going to be nerves because before he was in this must-win situation. Now it's just these two, and it's for all the marbles. So we are off. We have a Sicilian again. James, you liking the opening so far? We got a Rosso. We got a Rosso. I am not a fan from the white side. I just never was like big fans of the Rosso Limo. I've studied a lot of theory on it from white sides, but I just was not, not a fan. Like, I'm an aggressive player. I never felt any type of aggression from Rosso Limos, as it's just not. I mean, it's a very positional opening here. And I think Black always has some good chances here, but chances are quite level uh, for both sides here. Yeah, I just don't like I have to reroute the bishop so many times. Like bishop B5 and then F1 and then D3 back to C2. <laughs> so not the biggest fan of it. But anything happens in bullet, they're flying through the moves right now. It kind of looks like a Spanish where they trade it on D4, then they're just maneuvering their pieces. And Danny had this pretty much exact position against the big Greek. So Paulina... She must have studied Danny's earlier games. And Danny, hopefully he studied that because he was in a tough position at some points. His knight is on f8 rather than g6. We like that. He can play knight to b4 at some moment if he wants, but the bishop will slide back to b1. I feel like white is just much better coordinated with all the pieces lined up in promising positions. Very nice coordination, uh, as you pointed out there. I do, yeah, everything's developed on the third rank there. D5 question mark move, but practically seems like it makes a lot of sense. I think the problem is after takes takes, maybe the D5 pawn, well, not even maybe, it is a weak pawn. And maybe something like knight b4 could be annoying to that pawn on D5, hit now twice by the bishop on b7 and knight on b4 if that is the route that Danny goes. But he needs to move, bro. You got to move. You see what I'm saying about that? Taking that break? Like, you know, he's not fast at all. Bro, you down 20, 30 seconds. You got to move, Danny. It's bullet. You have to move. And apparently, he went for a losing variation. It's probably because there's pins down the E-file. She did not take full advantage of it. She had bishop D4. Bishop G5, on the other hand, would have done the trick. But the king, it's wide open. There's a bishop on D4. Maybe bishop A1 with queen B2 to follow. Instead, she was queen C2. She's playing very meticulously. Yeah, they're very meticulous. Right. Oh, there's no sacrifices on G6 yet. Knight to E4. And yeah, Danny, Danny's time is just, it's its very concerning here. It's going to be very tough to try to defend these type of, even queen d2 right now is super annoying. I just want to go queen h6. Like, queen d2, put the queen on h6. Like, what are you going to do, king h7? I mean, that's ridiculous. Like, it doesn't even feel right. It feels like I'm just winning. Here it is. Queen d2, king, and then queen h6, and I'm chilling. Well, knight g3, okay. She didn't go for queen h6. Knight g3, she just wants to shatter the pawn structure directly. Uh, knight e5, Danny's getting desperate over here. 1.9. I think you can just take this... Yeah, you just start taking things in the center. White is up material with the attack. E8 hanging? Whole roof. Not even checked. Yeah, yeah. Freedom. He had no time. He had no time. He's out of time there. That's the first game down. I think that momentum, yes, he had momentum, but you know how they say, like, you're on streak when you're on streak. But then as soon as you go, you know, get up, go to the bathroom, go get some water, you come back and it's different. It's just different. And I think maybe that might have broken some of the momentum for Danny here. Let's see if he's able to bounce back. Or else it's going to be must win if he does not win this game. And Danny going to his trusty scotch. He loves this opening. Even though it's caused him some painful losses, he loves it. He knows it quite well. And we see that black has the pair of bishops. White has this open C file. You want to try to go after those pawns. You can trade queens here. Put a bishop on E3. Put a rook on C1. Go for these bad pawns. Mark over. That's a nice move. Oh, Bishop C2, he tripped. Yeah, yeah. It's the momentum. Yep, yeah. He lost the momentum, guys. He lost it. And it sucks because, like, he was playing really, really good. And then a small break, and it changed 100%. Yep. That, yeah, is that tough. little timeout. That little timeout. Little timeout. Just that little bit. It did, that's all it took. a world of good. Yeah. 
And yeah. wait a second, this position, what's the material count? Black has a rook for a bishop, but white also has an extra pawn. The real issue for white is this pawn on c5 is going to be a weakness. You can't save them all. You'd much rather have, say, this f2 pawn on d4, and then we might be talking about a kind of fortress. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's not over yet, but yeah, it's tough to play this. I mean, even at some point, black can sacrifice for some of the pawns. Like, take on b2, and then take on b2 again. e5's hanging. I got the 7th rank. Yeah, even d4. Take on c5 now. This is just Wait, a wrap. Where's that rook going? That's a good question. Wait uh -oh. a second. He said, I got it back. That's... Yeah, but it, yeah, she okay. did what I was talking about. Sacrifice, but okay. But she's... Yeah, okay, right? Not bad. Yeah, bad. She, it's only one pawn, and they like to say that all rook end games are drawn, and of course that's not true. But it C5. is only one extra pawn at the moment for black that does give Danny at least some hopes, even if not realistic chances. And yeah, that's C5 move. Ouch. It's just, it's just ouch. Yeah, you can't even do anything about it. And that's then mate. Of takes A3. That's mate. Watch oh, out. F4 goodness. was mate for white. <laughs> <laughs> Good trap. <laughs> what a trap, bro. That's so funny, dog. Oh, man. F4 mate. <laughs> like, I mean, shoot. The way it's been going for Danny, that definitely could have worked. Rook takes a3, rook check. I feel like it would have worked if Greg was playing, but because yeah, Danny, yeah, it he doesn't get the yeah. same magic. Oh, it's Danny? Nah, nah. We gave him enough today. <laughs> king e4, Get rook you. check, king d3. Did just king, rook e3, drop mate. Oh, it's not mate. Uh, it is simple. It's rook b2, pawn a2, rook mm -hmm. b1, and you get a uh, queen. White has to get yeah. the rook. This is game over. There's nothing he can do. I'm sure he sees a check. Give a check. There it is. Resignation. Two. <sighs> well, Alina it's tough. But needs just a draw. Mm, mm, mm. Danny needs to win on demand. Okay. Well, and the good news is bullet. There are a lot of wins in bullet. Not so much forced draws, nothing of the sort. But Danny's going back to this opening where he's been getting disadvantages in his games. And right now is another example of that. He might just get blown off the board here. Uh-oh. This king is in the center. <sighs> Sheesh, 96 is coming. Queen h5, queen h3. Oh my goodness. After queen h3, you could just hit the button, bro. Yeah, just dropping this pawn on e6. There's nothing same. you can do about it. So apparently, queen g4 is a mistake. There must be something to do with this pin here. 96. Oh, so there's no 96 anymore. Okay. Oh, shoot. That's pretty sick. Oh, because queen h3 was holding it. Queen h3 was defending, at least. That makes sense, though. G3. We're back into a position where the position is objectively bad for black, but it's not mm -hmm. clear how white wins the game on the spot, and that will give Danny chances. Watch out for bishop h3. That's clearly one of the ideas here. I guess bishop h3 isn't the end of the world. The queen slides over, and the advantage is gone. Wow, Rick f is coming, too. 96, okay, not anymore. It's like, ah, psych. Takes, takes. <laughs> Knight something. Knight six? six? Yeah, might be six. And Bishop, Bishop C8, C8, watch out for this exactly. move. That will win a piece. It wins a piece, right? Yeah, wow, I mean, it's true. Well, Queen G4 is the only move I have to defend it. Only move, right? Queen G4, move. what an ugly move to play. Where's the win yeah. for black? I was just thinking that. I, I don't see it, it yet. Like, yeah, I can oh, see it either. He doesn't have time. Oh. But, you know, those are those moments where playing as quickly as Polina does really helps her out. Because if the time situation were reversed, she probably would have lost that piece in the game. But she survives. She only needs a draw. Danny has chances with the two knights against the knight and bishop. But Polina is stabilizing and this knight might pop onto the d5 square. It's definitely going there. And knight c4 play. But b3 was my idea here. Um, but I guess... He wants knight a3, which is really strong. So she takes on b4. Whoa. Sack the piece. Sack the piece. Yeah. Take on b4, give up the knight, and take on f2. Oh, but I have king g1. But okay, yeah, you got some comp. Rook takes b2 as well. Five seconds, four seconds, three seconds. It. Knight d4. He goes knight Oh, he's going d4. for mates. <laughs> Woof. Yeah, what is mates in there? Just the double question mark. White's only move is rook takes c4, otherwise you lose material. So the good news for Polina, her moves are forced, but she's getting down in time trouble herself. Rook takes f2 check. Danny needs to have a move. h5. Where's that bishop going? Because knight e2 check would hurt. Dang, boy, he's swinging. He's swinging right now. He's swinging Pawn takes c5. Real. Oh, my goodness. I don't even know what you do, bro. I really don't even know. But she don't know what to do she either. Takes and 
The advantage is in Black's favor, and Rook takes B2, and then a second Rook can join the party, and White's pawns are falling. Rook F3 now, take on A3. Danny is fighting for his life, chat. This is what you see right here when you just all, we go all in. I don't care about anything. We are going all in. He can play check. Rook he some... can play D2. D2 <gasps> he lost possible. the time? Oh my he goodness. He lost the match on time in a oh, winning position man. to Paulina Shuvalva. Her defense pays off, and she wins Group C. That's crazy. That's crazy. Shuvalova wins. That was amazing wow what a match danny was on the brink of a comeback he made it and made it to tie breaks there but it just wasn't enough there i think that break definitely messed up his momentum and shuvalova was able to stop the bleeding and come back strong and win her group congratulations she played some great tactical sequences, some fantastic positional games in earlier matches. She really did earn match victory, but Danny Wrench gave her all that she could handle. In the end, Paulina Shuvalova moves on to the semifinals. It was close, but close was good enough for her. She gets through three nothing in the tiebreaker. So she sweeps that, but that last game there, Danny's gonna be kicking himself for not moving faster. Yeah, it's, uh, he was, he played very well there. He made, he made it happen like, you know, oh, I need to win. I need to win. Won four in a row. Got it done. But it just was not enough after that short break, that short like, oh, I'm in the zone. I'm in the zone. And then he got out of the zone just for like two minutes just to get ready for the match. Put the bid or whatever. Not the bid, but like to play the four game match. Took the little break and it happened. And Paulina was able to convert. Wow. It was very close. It was very, very close there. It really could have went either way. That was really nice. And credit to Polina for regaining her form after losing to Danny. She earns her spot in the semis. We're going to take a short break because we'll have Polina and Danny after her on for some interviews, chat, ask some questions. Hopefully, we can ask them and feature your thoughts and questions. And we'll be right back to be joined by Polina Shuvalva, winner of Group C in the IM Speed Chess Championship. But she's not going to move it because it's defended. Oh, <gasps> she did it! <laughs> I just you predicted it, Levy! I just checking? said, don't go there! <gasps> we need a compilation. Chess.com social media crew, look through the Pog Champs oh, games. Oh, baby! Let's and go! Find how many times I called the move Let's before go. it happened. I mean, <laughs> okay, Levy, you asked for it. Here we go. It's almost a Jarvis stalemate. Jarvis knows what he's doing. He's gonna oh, try to force Andrea, it. Andrea, there's a stalemate coming. Pawn here, take King G4. He pushes and it's a stalemate. Oh my goodness. Well, you, you clearly, you, I'm sure you taught Frank about stalemate. Oh. No. Okay, just no! don't push. This, I blame you for all of this. This is oh your manifestation. Goodness. Oh my See? goodness. Bishop takes, pawn takes, queen takes, loses the bishop. And if that happens, I will be heartbroken because you could have just... That was your heart, I mean. Is it feeling okay? Heart? <laughs> How is it? You you can't even script this stuff, my man. Oh, ah, defend the bishop again! <laughs> I just forgot! Okay. <laughs> okay. Ah! His position is, is hard to lose as long as it stays how it is. Yeah, for sure. Unless he starts going totally crazy with something like Pont de G. <laughs> what is your ability today? You literally said that in real time.
We are thrilled to be joined by Paulina Shubalova after a very tough match against Danny Wrench. Paulina, congratulations. That was a really fascinating, epic finale there. Uh, question for you is, did you think that Danny would be as tough as he was? Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, well, I I thought uh, actually that uh, Danny has much more racing on Chescon than than he has. Um, so yeah, of course he um, he would be um, a good opponent. Very good. Congratulations, Shuvalova. You're back again. It's good to see you playing again in this event. Uh, my question to you is: What kind of preparation did you do? for this event and what is the next tournament you have coming up? I know you have a lot of tournaments coming up. Uh, well, I don't know if it was a good preparation for for this event, but I played a uh, Russian championship uh, for the last two weeks. So uh, I'm not sure if it helped me or not, but uh, it was uh, <laughs> almost all. Well, Paulina, you really gave the audience so much enjoyment to watch. Um, how did you like this format with the groups versus uh, the pure elimination bracket as you've played in the past? Um, I found this format um, pretty good. Actually, I, I, I love uh, double elimination. I think this is like one of the most, uh, most fair systems of uh, playing. So this format with mini matches, it's uh, it's uh, pretty good. Mm, well, if you like having an easy match, you can play just like four games, and if it is a um, tough match, then it will it can last for a lot of games, and it is um, very interesting for for the audience, I think, also. Paulina, who do you want to fight? Put you on a spot here. Who do you want to fight in Group D? Or in any of the groups, period. But definitely in Group D. Uh, I'm not really familiar <laughs> who did one in, in the group or who will play in the group. So um, whoever wins, I, I, will be, um, I will be happy to play. And Paulina, I mean, you say you'll play anybody, you're happy to play. Uh, we have a question from the chat, from Practical Chess. Uh, they want to know, how was it playing the chief chess officer of chess.com? Um, pretty tough, <laughs> actually. Okay, I, I won the first two games. Um, well, one of them was, was mouse slipped, but uh, yeah, it was um, pretty okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I, I did not plan to like lose uh, for for next games uh, and uh, yeah, but then uh, okay, I managed to uh, to put myself together and somehow win. But uh, I think uh, Danny plays uh, really good like speed uh, speed chess uh, speed formats this uh, bullet section he played uh, very fast and uh, he's uh, quite uh, sharp tactically uh, so yeah it was not easy we have a question here from super from the chat super ginger 2000 says paulina are you aiming to get your remaining gm norms soon Um, well, I, um, I hope to, but, um, I, I don't know where I can, I can make the norms. So, yeah, it would be nice if I had a chance, but I'm not sure. Of course, Paulina, and but, uh, I always also, love watching you play, uh, yeah, and I say also, this, oops, sorry, go ahead. Uh, yes, yeah, so, uh, I just mean that if I gain GM norms, I uh, will not uh, anymore able to participate in this event. So it would be quite frustrating. 
<laughs> you, you stole what I was going to say because I was going to say that we love watching you play. But personally, I don't ever want to see you in this tournament again because I'm rooting for you uh, to become a Grandmaster uh, ASAP. But we will miss you in this event when you do become a GM. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> well, Paulina, we know it's uh, late by you, but you have so many fans out there who are continuing to root for your success. We'll see you next week for your semifinals match. But until then, get some good rest, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. You heard it from Paulina Shuvalva, winner of Group C. It wasn't easy. It was fun, but it was tough against the likes of Danny Wrench, who finishes in second place. James, I always like hearing from Paulina, such a strong player, and we do hope she gets those GM norms soon. Absolutely, 100%. I mean, she's, wor she's like, you know, working very hard. You can see the ratings already over 2,500, which is the, the minimum that you need for FIDE here. So it's very good. She's playing great. She's, she's playing lots of events and just looking to norm where she can. So... Good stuff. We'll definitely see it from her very soon. And love uh, hearing that she likes the double elimination and this group format. Uh, but we're going to bring on somebody who has a say in what the formats are like. He is none other than Chess.com's Chief Chess Officer, Danny Red. So, chat, give us some questions. We might feature some of them. What do you want to ask Danny? Let us know. We're going to take a quick break. And when we return, Danny Red joins the show for a post-tournament interview. Stay tuned, everybody. We'll be right back. It's a pleasure to be joined by Danny Wrench after what was an unfortunate loss in the tiebreaker. Danny, how are you feeling? Did you enjoy yourself getting back to the board? I'm feeling I'm feeling good. I, I'm disappointed because I I think I started off today not not really playing very well and, and my nerves were really getting the better of me in that in that first match um, versus uh, the big Greek. Um, but then I felt like I found myself in a rhythm. And then I, and even though I was down 2 0 going into the three minute, like I was like, I was like, all right, like I got this, like let's go. And I, that was my mindset, as crazy as that was. And so um, I'm disappointed by how quickly I fell apart in the, uh, in the overtime. But overall, obviously, uh, Shubalova, uh, Polina deserves all, all the credit. She, uh, I, I think it's, it's really easy to underestimate how hard it is to lose several games and like kind of give up a lead and then gather yourself and, and, and she did it. Um, so she kept her nerves in the overtime and I didn't. 
Um, and, uh, and ultimately, so she, she was the better player, but, but I will, I will admit, like, I feel like, I feel like if I had that first match back against, against, um, Georgios that, uh, then may, maybe it doesn't go to overtime, but I, I really did not play well to start today. So anyway, but I had a blast, had a blast. Yeah, man, it was good to see. It was fun to watch. We were so hyped, especially when he was coming back there. It was like, oh, he's coming back. This is insane. So, like, what was actually working for you when you got in the groove there? And it was starting to work, and we was, you was feeling yourself, and we like, oh, my goodness, Danny's going to do this thing. And then you made it to the overtime there. What actually really kind of worked for you the best, you would say? I I don't know. I mean, I, <laughs> I honestly, I... I lost, so it's hard to say anything. Anything really, really worked in the end. Um, but obviously, I found I, I found myself in the match with with Divis, right? Like I was I was playing pretty well, I think, in that match. And and um, even though that last Dragon game ended in a draw, I'm pretty sure I was I was winning in in more ways than than one. Um, and in fact, I could have even just not played Knight A2 check and took the perpetual. I could have played Knight Takes C2 and won the Bishop on E3 with check. So I, I knew I was winning, but I but like that felt good to like rebound from a match that in my mind I should have had um, against against the big Greek. And so to beat D the Divis cleanly, even though the match with Paulina didn't start well, like I wasn't not confident. Like I was like, all right, like just keep playing chess and you'll figure this out. And I and I managed to um, you know, to get some of the victories to go my way and force overtime. But it's hard for me not to reflect on the things that didn't go my way right now. Honestly, I, I think one of the things that this reminds me of is when you when you play chess and you haven't played in a long time. It's not just that your tactics aren't sharp or, or, or you know, perhaps time management where I where I lost some games. This this last game, for example, where I lost on time, even though I was I was in an OK spot with the rooks on the second rank. Um, what I realized is that. You also just make bad practical decisions that you wouldn't make if you were feeling it, right? Like, why in the world did I not just play E4 and play the Scotch in that last bullet game against the Big Greek? Like, why did I play D4 when my nerves are shot and go into a position that isn't, doesn't matter what you want to say about the Scotch. And Robert, I don't want to hear your opinion about the Scotch. That's not even, I'm not even teeing you up for that. What I'm saying <laughs> is it made no, it made no sense it made no sense for me to not play my openings, right? I know you would say that as a coach. And then there was another game where I against Paulina, where like I, I just played it. I just played an opening like that I would never play. And and in hindsight, those are the things that I kick myself for actually more than more than maybe tactics or or more than the time management because I think that. Those are things that when you're playing a lot of chess and your nerves are in order, you don't put yourself in a bad spot. And when you're lose, when you lose like the flow, you make bad practical decisions. So I'm looking at the whole day as just kind of um, of some some rust that should have been shaken off in a different way. Not when the match started. Well, that really makes a lot of sense, Danny. Choosing openings that meet you might not have if you were in better game shape or at least playing more frequently, but you played this last year. You had a good event. You made it to the semis. How do you compare the format, the typical SEC elimination format, to this one? Did you have fun with the format this year? Um, I liked I liked playing different people. Um, but I, I I need to reflect on it and see how I feel about it because I think that there's also something to be said for having having the opportunity to to keep at it with one opponent right to like learn from your losses to 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 kind of reflect on an opening that's not working and perhaps make an adjustment this is very fast and furious right and so it's not the same format when you're not playing the same person in three different disciplines right and like cuz there's part of part of match strategy that goes into the SCC in terms of something you might play in the five minute, you might hold back for the bullet, or you might try something early on and it doesn't work, but you still feel confident in that type of position against that player. So you switch openings and, and you start to see better results because, because you were right, maybe that, that you won an open game. So I'm just saying like, there was, there wasn't a lot of time to think there wasn't a lot of time to breathe or to, or to really consider like, like what to do. So, um, I really I like the idea of the pool play. I like the idea of getting more than one opponent, um, and I appreciate that uh, that that might even be more thrilling for the fans. I I don't know. I don't know how the fans feel about it. I haven't really seen. But as a player, I don't know. I don't know how much I like it. I don't know that I wouldn't have rather have had 
an hour and a half against one person with an opportunity to like really, really grind and, and see if I can figure out how to beat them. Right. And in and, and this and this one, it feels like a little bit of a shootout. And then before you know it, you know, Bob's your uncle and you've lost, at least in my case, that's that's how it feels. So uh, but it, it was fun. I, and I did I did like playing different opponents. That part was fun. Danny, we have three players making it through with Group D coming up. Who do you have taking the whole thing? Who's taking it, Danny? What's your call? What you call it? What you put your uh, money? I think the winner. I think the winner between Levy and Greg is 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 the is the is the, is the favorite for sure. I think. Um, I think you know Greg has made it deep in in this event before. So has Levy, right? Obviously, Levy Levy you know played played Eric Rosen for the final. So I think that I think that you know just by evidence of the fact that you know they both play a lot online chess, right? I mean Levy beat Ferruja the other day, which of course is one game, and you know gives him something to brag about on Twitter as if he needs anything else to brag about on Twitter. Levy, it's like get over it, man. We're tired of you bragging on Twitter. Um, <laughs> but um, it, it is it is a big deal to beat Ferruja. And and so, like, I think Levy is is playing a lot and he wants to win. And, and, I, and I can see that. Um, but I also agree with Levy's take that Greg is a no nonsense opponent and might be a difficult out for Levy, like stylistically. So I think I think that's an interesting matchup. And I think whoever wins that probably is the favorite um, going forward. So there's my there's my hot commentator take. Dan Danny. Before I ask you the feature chat question, you didn't talk about Group D. Do you think Lawrence Trent is going to win Group D? Oh, I, you were asking me the overall favorite. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I, I jumped immediately to Shahadi. <laughs> um, I don't believe. I don't believe that Lawrence Trent is capable of winning any group that he's in. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I love you, Lawrence. Uh, I. Um, <laughs> I think I think Lawrence is Lawrence is okay. Lawrence is okay. Is that what you want me to say? Um, he's he's probably one of the more experienced favorites there. So I'll give it to him, even though I don't I don't want anything but sass to go Lawrence's way. Um, but I do I do love him. I love him. I love him even with the bald head. Like he really he fully committed and embraced it. Look, we're all losing our hair. So can we give a shout out to Lawrence for just committing to the bald look? Shout out to you, Lawrence. Like much love, bro. On that. Well, I don't know why I give myself the right when I'm well, in this I'm chair to just say all the things that I would say. <laughs> I, I probably shouldn't say the things I'm saying, but I'm saying them anyway. <laughs> hey, when I'm in the player, player's chair, I feel like I can. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, Denny, as a player and not as the chief chess officer, this is going to be my favorite question maybe ever. And it's a feature chat question from... A. Broham Lincoln. I think we got to give that person membership just for that yeah, username. But A. Broham fine. Lincoln Whoa. asks, Danny, do you blame chess.com for not taking your move in time? Which game? I, I don't even know that I had a game the where I was game. in a position where I could. Uh, no, I don't blame chess.com at all for that. I don't even think I made a move. I, I don't even know that I made a move. I. Honestly, I've been looking back at that game, and 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 rook rook f c two would have been a phenomenal move instead of d three, like a real strangle move to not allow bishop c eight. But the truth is, you know that last game was one of those that looks really like sexy for me because you've got the rooks on the seventh rank. But the knight and the king are the most irritating effing duo on the planet, right? The queen and knight are the most dangerous duo. The king and knight are the most irritating effing duo, and I just want to freaking scream when I'm trying to do some good stuff and the knight is protecting the king. So no, it has nothing to do with chess.com. I appreciate I appreciate the bait and I would like to say I've earned enough credit that when it is timely and needed to throw my own company under the bus, I have done so many times. But this had nothing to do with chess.com. This was yours truly at the wheel, which is a dangerous thing and, and I've lost those chess games myself. So I've been there you in go. many car rides with you. It's not a dangerous thing. You're a great driver. You also <laughs> have everything to do with chess.com. So, Danny, thank you so much for all you do. You brought a lot of joy to the fans today because they love seeing you play. We know you got meetings to attend to. We'll let you go. But seriously, awesome to talk to you in this dynamic. It's new for us. I think we're evolving in our friendship here. I love it. I love it. Well, thank you, guys. Um, this is awesome. Thank you to chess.com <laughs> for having me. And um 
at some point I'm going to get to the finals in this event. I, I'm going to do everything I can to not to not prepare. But at some point, like mathematically, enough people will have won and I will I will be the favorite. It'll be by process of elimination. So thank you for having me. <laughs> of course. Danny, good to have you. Thank you so much. And have a good day. I will talk later. But Danny Resch, always a good interviewee. Always having fun with the chess. Unfortunately, his chess didn't get him through in Group C. It was Paulina Shuvalova in the end making it through. She deserved it, as Danny's own words indicated. But we will have Group D coming up next. Lawrence Trent is at the top of the ratings in that group, but Chess.com's own Rakesh Kulkarni, he's of course very involved with Chess.com India, and he's a very strong player in his own right. Kostya Kavutsky of Chess Dojo Live, and Daisy Corey, international master from Peru. It's going to be, once again, tough sledding in Group D. James, I know it's been a whirlwind of a day thus far. Kind of any final thoughts of what we've witnessed and what's to come? Well, there's more of it. I'm excited to watch it. I'm going to just be watching more chess today. I'm going to have my screens up and be watching more chess. You should do the same at home here, of course, because we got another group of double headers, just like we had yesterday, where we're going to have a fourth person go through one person, and then all of them are going to fight it out, obviously, soon enough. So it's really good to see. It's great to see, you know, the back and forth stuff here. Danny almost made it through, but then Shuvalova was uh, the winner of the group. So good chess. I mean, something reminiscent of Group A, as we saw yesterday so can't wait to see what group d brings us uh later on today group d will start shortly of course that's the final group of this event we then get to the semifinals after the weekend but the chess doesn't stop just when group d does we will have much more chess for you this weekend in fact we have a fantastic event on tap join us on sunday october 15th in celebrating the game that connects us all Judith Polgar's Global Chess Festival will be then, so tune in for an exciting triathlon where powerful teams compete in puzzle battles, tandem chess, and bullet chess. It'll be featuring our very own Grandmaster David Howell and other prominent players. Use the command Chess Fest in chat for details on the event that is Judith Polgar's Global Chess Festival. But for now, we say goodbye more like see you later, if we're being honest, because Daniel Naroditsky and Casa Corley will have the call for Group D of the I Am Not GM Speech Chess Championship. Thank you all for watching. Come right back. Refresh yourselves. There's more chess to come.
Anyone who has played even a small amount of chess, especially online, is familiar with the concept of an opening trap. We've all fallen for one at some point or another. In many cases, a failed opening trap will leave you with a terrible position, but not always. We've compiled 10 opening traps that are not only guaranteed to work, but if your opponent doesn't fall for them exactly, you'll still have a decent position. Number 2. Legal's Mate this opening trap, if your opponent cooperates, can lead to one of the most beautiful and famous checkmates in chess. Named after Sire de Legal, it dates back all the way to the 18th century. It occurs in an Italian game, and in this position we play knight c3. Black might play bishop g4, pinning the knight to white's queen, and we can play h3, forcing black to make a decision about the light squared bishop. If they retreat with bishop h5, this allows the brilliant knight takes e5, where a free queen is offered. If black takes the bait and grabs the queen, can you spot the famous mate in two? That's right. Bishop takes f7, king e7, which is forced, knight d5 mate. So, if our opponent does not take the queen bait, is this a dubious position? Not at all. Black's best response is knight takes e5, allowing white to win the light squared bishop with queen takes h5, and after black takes the bishop on c4, white can win the piece right back with a queen check on b5, picking up the knight on the following turn no matter what black's response is. White is up a pawn with control of the center, a great place to be out of the opening. I've been a member since 1986, nearly 40 years. It's just a beautiful building, very nice staff, lovely place. My name is Peter Lee. I am 79, 80 later this year. I won the British Chess Championship when I was 21. And I played in the England team for about 10 years. Um, my name's Padana and I'm aged eight. My rating's around 1800 and I won the World Under Eight Girls Rapid and Blitz Championships. Ladies are allowed in now, but they used not to be here until 20 years ago. Would you like to see a bit of the club, Dana? In theory, no one under 14 should go in the club. So I've always been into problem solving everything I do. I do, um, I play bridge as well. I do crosswords, I do number games. I'm a medical statistician. I call myself a problem solver. Um, I started liking the pieces and I wanted to take them and keep them. So then my dad said I could play chess instead. When I gave up, when I was about 31, two, I was two, three, 90 and I've only played one graded game since then. What did you say your rating was? 1900? 1800. 18. Even if you're not, not, not ahead of me yet, you'll be ahead of me in two or three years' time.
Bonjour. Well, she played, she played a lot of very sensible moves. <laughs> Did you think you were winning at one stage? Maybe slightly better. Slightly, maybe slightly better. Yeah, you probably were. International Master Danny Wrench back again, Chief Chess Officer, bringing you chess terminology. Let's dive right into one of one of everybody's favorite tactics, if I might be so bold, because it's surprising. It's something that never never fails to deliver shock value and excitement, whether you're watching a broadcast or just reviewing some famous chess games. And that is the process of an under promotion. When you move a pawn to the other side of the board, almost always you're looking to get a queen. But the rare times where it's better to get something else or perhaps even required in order to maybe not stalemate your opponent or keep your winning chances alive are some of the most fascinating, exciting moments in chess. So with that, let's dive into what under promotion is and show you some of my favorite examples. Under promotion, as we said, is the process of promoting a pawn, but not to the most obvious or most powerful type of piece, which is usually the queen. In this famous example between Nakamura and Vladimir Kromnik, the fact that Hikaru was winning is only because he under promotes on c8 to a knight. That move comes with check on the black king so that on the next turn, white can capture the e2 pawn. It should be noted that if Hikaru had queened, black would actually go on to win because now black queens with check and ultimately Kromnik would have been able to not just save but actually win this game. An under promotion tactic provided to me by our own Sam Copeland, Vice President of Content. One of his favorite examples is the move d7. And after bishop to e8, the only way to win the game is to under promote to a bishop. Under promoting to a bishop doesn't happen that often. In this particular study, it was designed to be so. The point is that if the bishop moves over to h5, we check and mate along the a4 e8 diagonal. And if the bishop moves anywhere else, white actually plays a subtle move, bishop of seven first and there is no way to prevent checkmate on the next move. Shout out to everybody watching this video. Thank you for tuning in and enjoying our breakdown of under promotion, and we'll see you on chess.com. We are live in Oslo, Norway. It's a beautiful day, a beautiful summer. You know the drill, we've done this before. Ma'am, do you mind if I ask you some questions real quick? When I say chess, what's the first word that comes to your mind? Game, puzzle. Puzzle, that's brilliant. Chess, horse. Smart. Black and white. <laughs> Black and white. That's two words, but I'm going to let it pass. If I say chess, what's the first word that comes to your mind? Um, I, I don't know if I have any other questions for you. Okay, when I say strategy, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Puzzle. Puzzle. Oh my god. Magnus Carlsen. Chess. The answer was puzzle, actually. That was the correct answer. That's okay, though. Okay. Yeah, I love chess. You do love chess. Yeah. Where, do you play chess? Yeah, sometimes. You, you play chess online? Yeah. Where do you play? Uh, chess.com, of you course. You play on chess.com, yeah. of course. Do you know who Magnus Carlsen is? Uh, no. Okay. Could you name any world chess champion? We sure not. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> Obviously, you know who Magnus Carlsen is. Sure. Right? He's um, a hero. You know how good he is? The best? Yeah, he's, he's the best, right? <laughs> yeah. Has, has Norway changed now that Magnus isn't the world champion? Yeah, it's kind of a bit more sad. Why? Yeah. Do you know that he's no longer the world chess champion? I did not know that. Yeah. Oh, so you didn't know why you felt sad, and now you know why. Yeah, I guess so he'll he'll get back up. He'll there. get back. Do you know why? No. He left chess to become a footballer. Actually. Yeah. Actually. I think it's very different chess and football. Yeah. But he's an athlete, so he can pull it off. Makes sense. It makes sense, right? I don't know who he is. You don't know who Magnus Carlsen no. is. Okay. <laughs> He's a professional footballer, one of the most well-known in Norway. Okay, okay. Okay, so. He... Sorry, I'm not from here. Okay. I heard there was a huge um, chess tournament thing where he accused another player of cheating. That's true. Do you know anything about that scandal? Have we done our job, Oslo? Oslo, they are an educated chess city, a city of deep thinking people, a city of beautiful people, a city where chess comes to life. Hi, I'm Grandmaster Anish Kiri, and welcome to Latvian Repertoires 24. The so-called Latvian Gambit is horrible, a5, knight takes e5. This is not how chess is played, he played too many moves with pawns and the queen, um, and didn't develop his light pieces. And if knight e4, this is a very important trick to remember, many people fall for it actually. Knight to b5, brilliant idea, a, b, and queen g7, and after rook f8, bishop h6. 
Queen C5 and F3, and surprisingly, Queen F2 is almost checkmate, but it's not. If your opponent wants to be solid, we go for uh, the aggressive for the kill. If your opponent wants us to go for the kill, we play simple chess and just use the fact that we have more space in the center, clear cut plans, and uh, nothing uh, to worry about. And Queen somewhere, you're just gonna figure out where to knock him out. In 1.3 seconds, I'll oh barely get it off. Both of these players are just almost losing on the spot. Queen D4 check, Rook D7 coming Rook, up. Yeah, Queen D5 check. Queen, Careful, oh, Queen D1 trade, mate. Trade, trade every. <gasps> Queen, Queen D1! Mate. Queen D1! Oh my gosh, and let me spot it. What a swindle! It. Oh my gosh. What a swindle because Robert, all he had to do was play Queen takes F7 with a check. It's still completely winning for Black. And now Rook D is again a threat, and oh. she allows it. But F G5? Queen H8, Rook D! Queen H8, Rook D! Oh my gosh, she can play F6? Yes. How did she lose that? What a 1964, it's a free piece! Oh my god! Wow, what don't blood check me! Oh, he oh, lost the time! time. Oh, no! Oh, he won a piece, but he lost the game on time. Oh my god. I can't god. take it anymore. 98, I think this is just a draw. Black time! Oh my gosh, Greg lost some time! He won the game, and Lawrence knows that means he won the match. There's a minute left. Lawrence can actually fully celebrate, as that is a three-point lead. It's over, look at Greg. It's a good sign of life from Greg. Why would you not do that? Well, because you want to waste some... I think if you're Eric Rosen, you really do want to waste time off the match clock. Oh my gosh, stalemate! That's why you don't resign! That was stalemate! Oh my gosh! Although she... Oh, oh! in those situations. <laughs> oh my goodness. He wants to get takes B2. Oh, it's check. <laughs> Wait, that's oh! me trying to check me too hard. No, no. Oh my gosh. And did he just give him the wave? Did he just give him the Jordan pool? Oh. Bye bye. Knight of seven, what is happening? King A4. Knight six, knight D4 was winning. No, wait, no, don't give up your pawn. G4. <laughs> she tricked him, she tricked him again. <laughs> G3 is <laughs> Oh, this has been amazing. This is the best game ever. Best game ever. Today we're going to go down into the New York City subway, set up a table on the subway platform, and see if we can get some strangers waiting for their trains to play chess with us. All right, I'm going to see if I can get anybody. Hey. Uh, I'll be quiet. Quiet. Yeah, because I need all the Sounds like he knows what he's doing a little bit. Don't worry, I'm not that good. Yeah? You're just out here playing chess, not that good? You got the chess.com app. You ever play on your phone? Oh, yeah. He said he barely played. I'm a teacher. What do you teach? Chess. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Self defense. How do you stay sane? Uh, I used to do a lot of meditation. Take medication. <laughs> What's like lesson 101 of self defense? Run. What are you listening to right now? Train. Sean Paul. Ed Sheeran. What is the meaning of life? It's funny because, like, what I'm doing, I feel like doesn't align with my philosophy on what the meaning of life is, but it's like obviously spend as much time with family as possible. Be the best person you can be. Get closer to God. Not to be evil to each other. There you go. Good game, thanks for playing. Ah, good, good game, game thanks brother. for playing. Appreciate it. I'll see you in a self-defense class. Enjoy Harry Styles. But she's not gonna move it because it's defended. Oh, <gasps> she did it! <laughs> I just you said predicted don't, Levy. I just I said don't go there. <gasps> we need a compilation. Chess.com social media crew. Look through the Pac Champs oh, games. Oh, baby! Let's go! Find how many times I called the move Let's before go. it happened. Let's go! Okay, Levy, you asked for it. Here we go. It's almost a Jarvis stalemate. Jarvis knows what he's doing. He's gonna oh. try to force Andrea, it. Andrea, Andrea, there's a stalemate coming. Pawn here, take King G4. He pushes and it's a stalemate. Oh my goodness. Well, you, you clearly, you, I'm sure you taught Frank about stalemate. Oh. No. Okay, just no! don't push. No! This, 
I blame you for all of this. <laughs> this is oh your manifestation. Oh my See? goodness. Bishop takes, pawn takes, queen takes, loses the bishop. And if that happens, I will be heartbroken because you could have just... That was your heart, I mean. Is it feeling okay? Your heart? <laughs> How is it? You, you can't even script this stuff, my man. Ah, defend the bishop again! <laughs> they just forgot! Okay. <laughs> okay. His position is, is hard to lose as long as it stays how it is. Yeah, for sure. Unless he starts going totally crazy with something like Pont G. <laughs> what is your ability today? You literally said that in real time. We have Magnus Carlsen's most incredible moments as world champion. This one right here is Vish Wanathan Anand with the white pieces versus Magnus Carlsen in 2013. Here we go. So this is a Nimzo Indian, same as variation, right? And the last move here was B3 from Magnus, just saying, hey man, I'm trying to queen this pawn. And of course, Anand is saying, I'm trying to mate your king. Cool, you can get your little queen. I'm just gonna try to checkmate you, right? So of course, this is a hint to move uh, at five, B3. And he's like, cool. Well, Vishwanathan Anand says, hey, okay, you can get this queen. I'm gonna try to go for mate. So he goes queen f4, get another piece in the game. This looks very, very dangerous here. Knight c7, what the heck is going on? Knight to c7, he thought it'd be something spectacular. He was like, yeah, I'm waiting for this one. But it's just knight to c7, defensive move. Cool, allows f6 to happen here. f6 is gonna take on g7. It's gonna be kind of annoying, scary things happening with knight h5. Magnus plays g6. Okay, it's locked up. It's gonna be scary if a queen gets to h6. Also, if the queen and a rook get to the h file, it's gonna be a wrap for black here. Magnus is gonna be mated. Okay, cool. So Magnus understands that. Vichy Anand understands that too, and plays queen to h4. Where is he going, class? h6, right? He's about to mate. He's also trying to get the rook over here too as well. Okay, cool. With that being said, your move. What do you do now? It's black's move. Here's the move, hence knight c7 to put the knight on e8. The saying goes, a knight on e8 is actually f8. The x is what they say. There is no mate. Anand understands this. He said, oh, there's no more mate. That's cool. Uh -ha -ha. I'm going to put my queen right here. Uh -ha -ha. What I'm trying to do is bring the rook up to f3 or f4 and actually go for this mate on h7 because you stopped the g7 mate. That's cool. Perfect. Well, Magnus understands this. So what does Magnus do in this position? Black to move. Here it is. Magnus says, cool. You want mate? Okay, that's cool. That's cool. Go for it. B2. Do your thing, big fella. Go ahead, Vishwanathan Anand. So he says, okay, I will, young fella. Rook F4. He goes here and he's going for Rook H4 mate. Wow. This is scary. Well, are you going to get your queen? You did all of this? Are you going to get your queen or not? Of course we are. B1 queen. Right? And after B1 queen, knight to F1 from Anand. And the move, the move here that seals the deal is what, guys? There's two queens on the board. Magnus has two queens, but is he getting mated or not? It's black to move. He goes queen e1. And then the game is over. <laughs> the game ended right here, believe it or not. There is no more PGN, right? What do you mean, queen e1? How, what, what? What What sense does that make? Well, let's see what happens. The, the idea here, you have to queen e1. Where were you putting your rook? H4. Well, I can just go rook H4. But guess what? After I capture it, queen sacrifice. Sacrificing one of my two queens. After queen takes H4, let's do a peace count. You have a queen, you have a bishop, and a knight. I have a queen, a bishop, a knight, and a rook, guys. So after that, this is done, right? I have an extra piece, an extra rook, and there's no mate here. So that's a resignation. And Magnus wins. That's incredible, right? I do like positional styled games. I may try to keep it positional, but I, I, I can also uh, change gears. And I think that's very important in terms of uh, 
you know, anyone trying to develop their chess game. Um, if you do find, you know, style of play that you enjoy, that's good, but you could also try to sharpen it by implementing, you know, an, another form of uh, in, into your bag, as we would call it. Right?
you've seen the Speed Chess Championship. Now it's time for the rest of us to get a turn. With no Grandmasters allowed, it's the I'm Not a GM Speed Chess Championship. Watch your favorite chess personalities duke it out in Chess.com's exciting Speed Chess format. There will be brilliancies. Levy stacking another pot, bishop c3 and rook a1, no, oh, rook a1. There will be blunders. No, no, he fell for it. 16 players are fighting for a chance at the eight player knockout. See old rivalries. This is how New foes. With a $15,000 prize pool, who will take home the crown this year? And there it is. that is the match. The IMSCC starts right now. Welcome everybody to the GM Not an IM. No, the FM Not an NM. No, no, it's the I Am Not a GM Speed Chess Championship. I am your host, Grandmaster Daniel Naroditsky, and alongside me today, the one and only I am Casa Corley. Casa, welcome to the show. Second day in a row. It's going to be another amazing afternoon of action. Danya, pleasure to be with you today. Chess fans, welcome. This is a really fun event, and we are tuning in to see the last qualifying spot for the semifinals. So buckle up your seats. It's going to be really fun. It is indeed. Let's start with an overview of the four groups. Remember, folks, we have a different format this year. Uh, this isn't like the regular SCC. There are four groups, and the winner of each group qualifies to the next stage. We have three winners already. Greg Shahade, Levy Rosman, who rampaged the field yesterday. Polina Shuvalova defeats Danny in the tiebreaker this morning. And we will be commentating Group D with, uh, let's just say, some recognizable names, Casa. Yeah, no question about it. Uh, I think a lot of the folks at the top of the table, we people do know. Um, the format for the, this group stage is basically like the World Cup. So if you've ever seen a World Cup uh, football or folks in the US, we, we say soccer, you know that uh, everyone plays each other in the group stage and then whoever actually w gets the most points basically or actually wins the most match in the group stage advances to the semis. And so that's the dynamic here. And we have four talented players vying for that last spot in the semis. Well described, four groups of four players. The players all play each other in many matches, and the player who accumulates the most points wins their group. There is the tournament format card. The bottom three are eliminated, so you have to win your group. There isn't a lot of margin for error standings-wise, and there isn't a lot of margin for error match-wise, because again, we're not doing 90 minutes of five plus one. We're doing two games of each time control and the first player to reach three and a half wins the match. If the match is tied 3-3, an Armageddon will ensue. But huh, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. We've seen a lot of blowouts. We've seen a lot of close matches. Casa, it's impossible to predict based on just seeing who's in the group, how each group is gonna go. And that's what makes it so exciting. Yeah, and theoretically, you can essentially get uh, win your mini match without actually getting to the bullets portion, right? Because so, you can win two games of five plus one and then actually win win or at least win and draw two games of three plus one and then get to that three and a half magic number. And so the one difference with this group stage is that folks have to adjust very quickly to a deficit because you don't have this long clock to make, make things up. So that's kind of what we're going to see is folks really scrambling when they're down. And we weren't commentating this morning. Uh, Robert was commentating this morning. We were commentating yesterday, and we saw Levy crushing the first three matches and then almost losing the fourth. Today, we will have two separate matches going on simultaneously, just like we did yesterday. We'll have Lawrence Trent. I hope I'm pronouncing that name right. Maybe it's Lawrence Trent. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not really sure uh, how how Larry wants to pronounce <laughs> wants us to pronounce his name. He will be facing off against Chesscom's own Rakesh Kulkarni. And on the right side, we have the one and only Kostya Kavutsky, the Chess Dojo founder, a great blitz player and a great person facing off against the Peruvian phenom I am Daisy Corey, uh, the very accomplished sister of Grandmaster Jorge Corey, who some people in the chat might have heard of as well. Gosh, I'm almost afraid to commentate Casa Lawrence. His face looks like he just came out of a meeting with the elites at Davos, Switzerland. Like He's about <laughs> to hatch a plan for global domination. Yeah, and he's going to try to initiate some global domination on the board today. I'm honestly not sure 
who the favorite is in that particular match. Uh, I actually had the pleasure of meeting Rakesh uh, in person recently, and he's just a really great guy and a good chess player as well. So I'm really not sure what uh, who's kind of in better form there. Lawrence Trent as well has been a, a guy who's uh, has two Grandmaster norms, um, has had you know you know been upwards in the 2450 range, and so he's uh, he's someone that's very talented in his own right. And uh, yeah, it's, it's really tough to say. And then on the other end, you know, we have, uh, <laughs> again, Corey and and uh, your boy Kavutsky. And honestly, Kavutsky is someone that I, I also know personally, very good guy. So a lot of times it's going to come down to who's going to be hot and who's kind of really looked at their chest <laughs> lately. Well, speaking of hot, oh yeah, <laughs> there's I am Lawrence Trent, uh, who has achieved quite a bit in his OTB career to... Uh, Grandmaster Norms, he was close to 2,500 feet. Uh, I was looking at that card before the show and I thought, oh, it says face to Mon Hamilton uh, in the 2022 Chess <laughs> Boxing Ch Oh, they won't mention what happened. And then the next bullet point is eliminated by TKO after 50 seconds. So Lawrence uh, has been on a tour to avenge that loss ever since. And what better opportunity to do that uh, than to win your I Am Not A GM SEC group. He looks comfy there. Uh, green screen he's got all of the ingredients in place casa i'm gonna have to call costa the pre-tournament favorite but again there are so few games that this can go really anyway yeah and i think why you're calling costa the the pre-tournament favorite is he's someone that's been extremely active chess wise uh, uh both on his own game and through the dojo and a lot of times when you're kind of you know working and you, you, you're consistently kind of in that that frame of mind uh, a lot a lot of times it's a lot easier to navigate the time scrubble, scrambles and play on instinct and basically do all the things you're going to need to do to be effective in this event. So um, mm -hmm. I, I, I can kind of con concur with that sentiment. But to me, I, it's still kind of a mystery how any of these competitors will fare in bullet. And uh, yeah, that's something I'm going to be waiting to find out. And I also want to spotlight uh, Daisy Corey, who is an extremely strong player. Uh, she has been an IM for a long time. Uh, of course, number one female player in Peru, uh, the sister of Jorge Cori. I actually faced Daisy Cori, believe it or not, in OTB chess in Spain in 2014. And it's funny how small the chess world is. Uh, her brother Jorge, I played for the first time in 2005 at the under 10 world championship in France. And back then, you know, we didn't know, my parents and I didn't know how to pronounce names. So my mom, uh, she, she checked the pairings and told me, you're playing George Cori. <laughs> so it became an inside, it became an inside joke. George Corey. Of course, later I found out that it was pronounced Jorge. But there is Daisy Corey. Also, have never seen her play Blitz, so very curious to see how she fares against this difficult field, Casa. Yeah, it's going to be really interesting. Interesting to see how that develops as well. Just a, a note for the folks that maybe are tuning in to this format for the first time. We're actually going to have two games going on simultaneously and we're going to have a bird's eye view we're also going to be annotating each game as it commences so you might see us go into one and then go into another and in that way you're, it's going to be a quite fast-paced uh type of affair but we're going to try and you know keep you abreast of all the developments as they happen yeah and, and people should be patient with us we're watching both games at the same time we'll do our very best to bring you all of the action. And we know that in the chat, you know, there are fans of different players and they want to see different games, but we want to be fair to everybody who's playing the tournament. Obviously, if there's a game that has a lot of meaning for the tournament, for the group standings, we will focus on that. But we'll try to do justice to just about everybody, including Chess.com's owner, Akesh Kulkarni. We will not be biased in his favor uh, just because he's a Chess.com dude. But you called it, Casa. He's a great guy. Uh, I've interacted with Rakesh as well. There he is. That looks like a very comfy bed behind him, but he won't be able to get in it until he wins his group. That's the rules. Yeah, and uh, yeah, we'll we'll see what happens. Uh, it looks like he's in a hotel. That's would be mm -hmm. my best guess. There, he's uh, those look. That looks like hotel bedding, if I've ever seen seen one. That whatever that red thing is, I've never seen a house that has that kind of above bed decoration. And the lamp, it just screams some sort of hotel somewhere in. Somewhere in the world. Oh, there's yeah. Costa. Yeah. So, yeah, just also, folks, for these matchups, the first match is going to be Lawrence Trent versus Rakesh Kulkarni. And we're going to have Desi Corey against Kostya Kavutsky. So those are the two matchups we're going to have first. And the games are just about going to get underway. So 
any moment now we're going to get started. Buckle up. Yep. You're going to see Trent Kulkarni on the left side on the blue board and then Kavutsky Corey on the right side on the green board. We'll be alternating between the bird's eye view that'll have both games simultaneously. Get used to it. <clears throat> and then when things get exciting, we will be zooming in on one of the boards to spotlight the action more carefully. There are all of the players. There are the initial positions. And we're going to get the gamut of openings by all of these players who have totally different repertoires. We're going to get E4s and D4s. And that's part of what makes this two-game format exciting. And quick, before it gets started, I love folks in the chat to say who they think is going to come out of this group because I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, it's pure speculation. I, you know, I called Costa the pre-tournament, uh, the pre-group the pre -group favorite, but mostly that's because... I've played him the most. I've played Costa a lot in OTB Blitz. Uh, he lived in the San Francisco Bay Area for a long time, so I've interacted with him a lot. He's a great Blitz player. He's fast. He's very experienced. And his opening preparation is very dangerous. And we saw yesterday that in these two games of 5 plus 1, it, I mean, I think 5 plus 1 Costa resembles classical chess a little bit more than it resembles <laughs> Bullet. You know, I read some statistic yesterday that, like, Queen Cleopatra lived closer to the invention of the iPod uh, than the building of the Pyramids of Giza. Well, I think 5 plus 1 is closer to classical than it is to actual Blitz. And with that disquieting thought, we are off on the left side in English by the English man. Yeah, so Lawrence is going for c4, uh, knight c3, and uh, yeah, okay, right now it's it might take on the character of a reverse Sicilian if Rakesh goes for d5, but we'll see how that develops. Typically after d5, yeah, there's c takes d5 and bishop b5, but there's some other moves here. Queen c2, this is a newer move I've seen in the last decade or so. Um, there's some ideas connected to like queen e4, like knight takes e5 and queen e4, but bishop e7 is played and everything is normal so far, Danya. Yeah, and oftentimes black will sacrifice the pawn on e5. If white plays bishop b5, and this is ultimately what defines white's setup, where does this bishop go? It can go to b5, c4, d3, e2. It can go absolutely anywhere. And we see Lawrence making the decision. He trades on d5 and develops the bishop to c4 with tempo. He could play h4, knight, g5. That's a very modern treatment of the position as well. That would be very much Lawrence Trent style as well. Yeah, expect this bishop on c1 to probably dart out to b2 as well, something along the lines of b4 and bishop b2. And I think, you know, practically speaking, the bishops both pointing towards that black king side are pretty menacing. And so that's kind of going to be the challenge for white trying to neutralize that. I see we have a, a king's Indian on the other board, so stay tuned for that. But we're going to focus <laughs> in on this game for just a moment. I know Danya, whenever a king's Indian comes on the board, he has something to say. But anyway, b4 is happening. Bishop might be coming to b2 soon. Bishop definitely coming to b2. That b4 pawn might have something to say as well. If you advance it to b5 too early, though, you're weakening uh, some important squares on the queen side. But now b5 is a threat. Uh, Black might drop the e5 pawn. So if I'm Rakesh, I'm going bishop f6 here. First and foremost, you have to take care of that e5 pawn because it's the centerpiece of your entire position. Do you take on f3? Probably not, because you open up the g-file for white's rook, and a lot of games in this variation are decided by checkmate on the king side. Yeah, and this queen e4 move by Lawrence is extremely strong, because I think it's in some ways inviting the capture, because now you have three attackers on e5, and frankly, after bishop takes f3, even queen takes f3 is possible now, but g takes f3 as well. I think that in general, this little pawn barrier here is actually quite secure uh, for the, the king on e1 to just stay in the center. And then black, and then white would have this opportunity to play rook g1 and play along the open g file. So I love the handling of uh, that Lawrence is basically you know, working with right now. And he's also not used a lot of time at all. So he's still uh, definitely in his bag. Yeah, Lawrence is, is sharp. He's off to a slightly better start than he was in... Uh the chess boxing matchup against Amon Hamilton too soon. Oh, should should yeah, I let, I mean, has the statute I, of limitations passed on that? So I, we're going to have over-unders like yesterday. Already, Danya has cited uh, the match maybe three or four times. I think the over-under <laughs> for citing uh, the knockout say is probably going to be about 10. So uh, we'll, we'll stay tuned and see how that develops. But um, yeah, two bishops are, are here. White White's definitely a little bit better in the long term. And Black's going to have to try and do something in the middle game here to kind of offset this bishop pair advantage. Why don't we t uh, switch to the uh, Kostya and uh, Corey game um, just to get a, a, see a little bit of what's happening there um, because the position has changed quite a bit and we have a bishop on g1. 
yeah, this looks like some sort of... It definitely has King's Indian bones, right? You see the, the classic King's Indian center, but somehow the F-pawns have already gotten exchanged. Daisy didn't play a traditional King's Indian. She delayed the development of her King's Knight, and that allowed her to push the F-pawn early and trade it for Costia's F-pawn, which came out to F3. Now, in most King's Indian formations, that favors black, especially because white is not castling kingside anytime soon. So I'm not a huge fan of what's going on on the kingside for Kostya, but if he can push away Daisy's knight with the move h3 and then redevelop his dark squared bishop to e3, there's also a side of the board called the queen side, and there's a legal <laughs> move in chess called queenside castle, and we might be seeing that unless Daisy puts her bishop on h6. Yeah, and I think bishop on h6 is the problem here because it takes away uh, control of the very important e3 square, which I think is where uh, where Daisy wants to kind of nestle in her knight if she gets the opportunity. And it also may discourages castling. So I definitely like how Black's handling here, and I think we should see bishop h6 here after h3. Have to. You have to play bishop h6, and she does. Good alertness by Daisy. The queen is going to slide up to d3, and then the knight will drop back to f6. And I'm anticipating the move bishop e3. I think the top priority for Kostya should be to find suitable arrangements for his king. If you get stuck in the center too long, that's a pretty volatile place to be. Black might play a move like c6 and queen a5. So eventually, you know, black's forces are going to get to white's king if it remains in the center. Yeah, there's definitely also the queen potential for the queen to dart Ooh. the other way to h4 at some point. Um, I see now h4 is even weaker than before. Whenever you push a pawn, folks, you weaken the squares adjacent to it. So now that g4 has been played, h4 and f4 are just gaping holes and potential avenues for black to, to basically get into the position. So there's much intrigue here. But I actually think we should switch back because Lawrence is playing in a very energetic way. And I, I it's kind of impressive. Um, he's basically played b5 and h5 and... Um, uh, it, it's it's really remarkable. He's basically conducting one of these kind of alpha zero style attacks on both sides of the board. You see white's uh, king is castled queenside and the rooks are connected. And now he's gone h4, h5, basically develop, drumming up a massive initiative against that black king. And you see these bishops menacing uh, the black king side. So evaluation aside, because it is jumping around a bit, white is definitely for choice. Yeah, this is a great energetic first game by Lauren so far, but he has to cash in his chips. He's got all of the ingredients in place. And on the right side, by, this, by the way, we saw Costa stabilizing the position. He's got a big time advantage. So things going well for him. And look at the way that Lawrence is pressuring Rakesh on all sides of the board. F4, and you can't touch that pawn because of H6 check. Uh, isolating the bishop on f6, or Rakesh has to defend the e5 pawn, but does he have enough resources to keep all of his weak spots guarded? Yeah, and I think it's basically a matter of pressing a... a, a oh. Ooh. Now uh, f4 is f4. crushing. Oh, queen takes c3, and then g6 and c7, everything's falling. L the yeah. way Lawrence's pieces are breathing here is really impressive. Yeah, and basically, it's mostly forced. If you play bishop takes e c3, there's queen takes e3 check. The king is basically is just exposed, and h takes g6 with the rooks invading will follow. This game is over. Um, and I'm, I'm confident saying game. that, too, because Lawrence has three minutes and change to Rakesh's 20 seconds. So, very well conducted. This is straight up resign time after queen c3, hg, and you don't even need the c7. In fact, you shouldn't capture it and give black counterplay. You're going to pre-move h takes g6. I don't think we're going to see queen d4 by Rakesh. And yeah. uh, he's going to throw in the towel here momentarily. Rook and h8. there's maiden 2, queen f6, and rook h8 oh, yeah. is just checkmate. <laughs> it didn't do my puzzle rush this morning, and neither did Lawrence. <laughs> And, uh, okay, this is just uh, cosmetic now because the king is getting oh. just totally entombed. And what an attack by Lawrence. He came to play. He definitely came to play today. And uh, Rakesh is going to have to show us something in this next game. Very impressive stuff. How are we doing with Kostya? I feel like the position, the only substantive way that it changed is that white managed to castle queenside. Um, I kid, of course... Uh, the situation looks a lot better for Costa now than it did right after the opening. Daisy has been unable to muster up the kind of queenside counterplay that you would want, but her last move, b5, is pretty menacing, and it carries a big threat of trapping Costa's knight with b4. That's why we see 
cost him moving the bishop away from e2 to give that parking spot up for the knight. So b4 will be met with knight e2. And the trade of light squared bishops strategically favors white because Daisy will be left with a lame king's Indian bishop on g7 that is entombed by her own pawn on e5. Yeah, and really the issue here for black in this structure is black's minor pieces are all struggling to breathe. You have this bishop on g7 that is just locked b behind the e5 pawn, and the knights on e7 and e8 also don't have avenues towards uh, white's king. And so essentially now white is going to have a free hand with h4, h5, and potentially can even entertain play on the queen side with rook c1 and eventual rook c6 or rook c4 and doubling at some juncture because basically white has space on both sides of the board. And that's why, you know, Desi now is going to have to try some combination knight b5 or a5, a4, but it's, it's hard to see where the target is. The King's Indian is a very resilient opening, but I'm also looking at the clock. Daisy down to 17 seconds, and we're not leaving this middle game anytime soon. Once Kostya sets the H pawn in motion, once he starts playing on the C file, there will be more problems to solve for Daisy. There it is, rook C4. Uh, he might, well, I wouldn't double right now. I wouldn't give up the H3 pawn. And I think he's not playing H4 because he doesn't necessarily want to give away the G4 square for Black's queen. And Black could also play on the king side, right? Rook F3, queen G4. You have to make sure that you have adequate responses planned for these moves. I have to say, Danya, I think the position has improved dramatically in the last few moves for Daisy, just because it feels a little bit disjointed with the rook on c4 and the rook on h1, the rooks being split. As you mentioned, h4, h5 didn't actually happen, and so, okay, maybe it's being initiated now, but it feels Ooh. like queen g4 now is an excellent move. And it's funny, in my OTB game with Daisy in 2014, she got into acute time pressure and I ultimately won the game, but she managed to turn the game around with only a couple of seconds on her clock uh, for something like 15 or 20 moves. So she's very strong in time. Another great move, knight d4. I mean, look at this. Now Costa's knight on g3 is going to hang. The rook is coming into f3. Problems, major problems for Costa as he brings all of his forces to the king side to secure his minor pieces. Yeah, and the game is not over yet, but I it, it, the, the trend is definitely turned, and I think it's just emblematic of the, again the resilience of the king's indian as you suggested and also of maybe some unneeded prophylaxis that uh Kostya went for in the, in the last stretch of moves because again this rook went we saw rook c1 rook c4 Whoa. and now this rook is back on g1 and is this sacrifice warranted and yeah okay yeah i was just gonna say sack that queen and now rook takes c3 and knight c2 is a huge threat how does Kostya defend against it he might have to bring his rook to c1 but then the g pawn will be set in motion and can Costa keep tabs on everything b3, b3. Knight c2 the blasts and blows happening on both sides of the board now by Daisy 30 and seconds now for Costa massive back rank problems for white if you even think about uh, pushing your a pawn at some point because oh, this king gosh. is just going to be entombed king b1 is oh I guess you need to I guess you might need to sack the exchange now or yeah that's no What's yeah, going on the here? Evaluation swinging. It feel ooh, King B1, Knight G6. Costa basically at some point needs to abandon his minor pieces and go in with his queen, try to win the D6 one. He does it a little bit later than he should, but now both rooks are hanging and Daisy blunders the rook. Ah, oh, yeah, and that was <laughs> the turn. Again, both players are basically under 10 seconds at this point. So, uh, well, Costa's almost there. It's not so surprising that blunders happen. So he yeah, who the, laughs, yeah. <laughs> yeah, now the D-pawn's just going to march down the yellow brick road, and we're going to have a second queen. He who laughs last laughs longest, and, you know, as Tartikauer said, the, the player who wins is the one who commits the, the second-to-last mistake. And that's the issue with time pressure. You just have to play decent moves over the span of 20, 25 moves, and not blundering across a, a span of time like that is just very, very difficult. Daisy handled herself incredibly well. But good job by Costa not making any big blunders and keeping the situation complex. Yeah. So if we switch back to Rakesh and Lawrence's game, we have a very interesting position on our hands where essentially Black is threatening mate. So I'm, I don't know why Rakesh is still thinking because it feels like F3 is obligatory. But um, after if F3 happens and we have this exchange of queens afterwards, it's an interesting position where White has this dangerous D pawn and the bishop pair, but is down a pawn. And the question is, is that enough? So if we have this position like f3 takes, 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 the rook on d1 is hanging. Um, you could move it. Maybe you could toss in d7. But the question is, 
is this DPON justifying the material, the, the pawn down deficit? I have my reservations about whether this is this DPON is a strength or an asset, and uh, simply because of the loss of tempo here, but we'll, we'll find out shortly, Danya. Yeah, and amazingly, Rakesh, not wanting to go into this endgame, played the move King F1, a brazen evacuation move, trying to get the king into the center and taking the sting out of the check on H1. The problem is that that king, once it gets to E2, is just going to be surrounded by Black's forces. Queen G2 and Knight D5, Black's position becomes really easy to play. I thought the endgame, Casa, was by far the lesser evil for White. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I do not like when my king is high stepping in the center. I mean, this is not Deion, <laughs> this is not Deion Sanders, so uh, yeah. so I'm I'm definitely concerned. And um, yeah, now it seems like black pieces can just jump, and so yeah, knight d5 is part of that. I'm a little bit surprised that you, the knight d5 move, though. I would have thought that you you at first you know try to surround the pawn, maybe like rook d8 or even bishop d5 instead of putting the knight on d5. But black is still the one that has all to play for, and um, not an easy position to defend at all. Bishop f3 also looked good by Lawrence to involve the bishop. Now the knight kind of blocks the bishop in. But still, I mean, even with the queen, the knight, the rook on c8, just really itching to jump into the action. The only thing that's preventing white's king from getting surrounded is that bishop on b3, which is holding the very important c2 square. Okay, queen d4. I would ignore the, you know, the question marks and the exclams. Just look at the position with your own eyes. With 50 seconds, I don't see Rakesh holding this together. Yeah, I mean, once the pawn on d6 drops, black can immediately switch to playing just positionally. And uh, I think that ultimately is what you'd like to do when you're up two minutes on the clock anyway. Um, but uh, yeah. Good move, though. Holding on to the d6 pawn, holding on for dear life. And now finally the rooks are connected, which might matter. So, um, do you want to guess? What, do you want to guess what the best move here, Don, is? Because it's kind of funny. Like I for, for I, white. I just took again. Oh, and it was played. Bishop takes d5. That move would not have been supernatural uh, to my eyes, but it's just a, a necessity. And it's crazy now. The king is going to high tail to d2. And is the queen going to high tail to a7 or b6? It's yeah, going to nest itself on a pretty safe square, but d4 is going to be really nasty. Yeah, and d4 played. And remarkably, this is a really, really weird position because I don't know who I'd want in a, in a blitz oh. game here, but white is apparently doing fine. Yeah, because bishop takes e4, Lawrence, and I also forgot that the d4 pawn is going to be hanging. And not just that, white's going to be controlling d6 and f2, and not a shred is going to remain from black's attack. Now, if you take on e4 with the queen... Lawrence, and this is why he's shaking his head, rook to e1 and then rook e7 check is going to turn the tables and it's going to be Black's king, uh, which is going to be surrounded by White's heavy pieces. Incredible defense in game two by Rakesh with almost no time on his clock. Now it's Lawrence who's hanging by a thread. Yeah, and again, this is just the turnaround you, you just hate to see when you're the person that had such a dominating position. Um, but yeah, what's going to happen now is there's a comp combination of rookie seven in the air and then queen takes d4 is also in the air and that combination is menacing. Um, would have been nice to throw an h4 just to kind of prevent this g5 business, but Whoa. getting the rook to e7 definitely helps. And what? my goodness, rook takes h7 might be a move here. And then oh my queen gosh. d8 check. And then queen e7, is there a mating net? 10 seconds for Rakesh. I, I think he's going to end up taking the pawn or taking the rook. He takes the pawn. But now I think Lawrence can take twice on e7, and probably he stabilizes to a draw. Yeah, as long as the bishop doesn't hang after some combination of checks. Um, I think after queen e6, you need to go to e8, and that's found very, very quickly by Lawrence. The time's going to be a factor now. Just because it's uh, <laughs> uh, it's equal material does not mean it's a draw, particularly in this format. So I think Lawrence will try to pressure, play this out a little bit more, and that's what appears he's going to do. Yeah, he's, I mean, queen d7 is an immediate draw. If he plays queen e6, Rakesh is going to trade. But Lauren's trying to keep the queens on the board. Playing against white's clock. Very risky, but potentially rewarding bishop g4. And There's he's got made threats. Threat. Queen a7, queen d4. Rakesh, Good defense. Keeping queen the queens F3. on. Queen e6 or queen f3. Mate. Got it. Do not trade queens here. There we go. Couldn't the pressure on. The king is running. It's not the first time the king has been on d2 this game. But frustrating for Lawrence, queen d1, king c3, and the king escapes on the dark squares. And that's the problem when you don't have a dark squared bishop. 
that king on b4 is completely unassailable and, and b3 Lawrence covering lose this game unbelievable defense and now the b5 pawn will be picked up and only white can win this one although i've said that mm. before and been wrong <laughs> there the is also is some trouble with h4 h3 looming for sure and bishop b6 could come you could accidentally blunder the pawn on b3 so still a little bit of tactics remain let's see how rakesh handles this but he's been playing unimpeachable defense and now he's got winning chances with that b pawn yeah for sure um, I do like bishop e4, just holding the line, this diagonal. And now, is this king going to dance on the light squares? Oh, look at the kings in this game. It's insane. King g4 would be my choice. Just run on, put put some pressure on white's king-size pawn, and it's played. Queen e2, bishop f3. Now, Rakesh sends his pawns forward. King f3, renegade king chasing the bishop away. But now that king could get checkmate. I mean, g4, queen f1 is literally mate. Is this king of the hill or is this chess? Because I'm not sure. <laughs> this is unbelievable. Yeah, this is this is this is mind-boggling stuff. Queen d4. Is it time to trade queens? No. Queen c2. Another round of checks, and again the king finds a safe spot. And this g4. time on a3. Now the what? h pawn is going to be a target later, and this is now black who's in the driver's seat. H4. Bl black could break through and make a queen. Start with bishop f3. Just cement everything, and then play h4. H4 should win the game. H4, G3. But Lawrence, he didn't spot it. And instead, he's going after White's king again. Oh, my king God. King A5. <laughs> what? This is the craziest blitz game I've ever seen. And how do, repetition? how do you finish? How do you finish? No you repetition. Need to get the, you need to get the bishop in the act somehow. Bishop B7, it's mate. It's bishop mate. B7. And if king B5, queen C4 is mate, the king has to go to A7. Bishop B7 is mate in three. It's mate. Oh. He missed it. He did all of that. Bishop B7 bishop was basic mate. This is also excellent, though, putting pressure on b5. You can stack your queen now and go to the winning pawn endgame because of the pawns on the other side. You could play, yep. and it's played. Basically, now, this bishop cannot stop these pawns. It's just, and the king is just way too far away. This is enough. By a tempo, though. I mean, by a tempo, h3, h2, h1, yellow brick road, as one commentator likes to say. And Lawrence takes the second game. I mean, what on earth did we just witness? We witnessed one of the most entertaining games of this I am not a GMSCC. I mean, that was fun. Both sides had a chance to win. That was awesome. Incredible. Incredible. And kudos to Lawrence, who lost his initiative at first, but then continued to play for a win when he was a pawn down. He kept the queens on the board, and somehow he got his king into white side of the board, took all of white's pawns, and then lived to tell the tale. Amazing stuff as he goes up to zero. On the right side... We have a much calmer game. We have Daisy Corey with a big advantage. She's got the white pieces uh, in this position. Yeah, it's, and it's, oh, rushing with c6. Not I would I, before I was going to say before the c6 move. I thought this was a game that could have been played by Karpov. Just the two bishops, the control, that protected passer. It just felt like a, a master class of positional play. But the c6 move just overextends at a time where I I don't think it's right it's strictly necessary and now all of a sudden it looks like there might be some tactics Danya. well apparently bishop f8 and he finds it bishop f8 such a calm move and he realizes that if the pawn reaches c7 it's just going to be blockaded and then picked off by black's rook white is not going to be able to do the same to the b4 pawn because you just can't add an attacker and suddenly the tables of turn and costia is likely to win his second game as well yeah and the problem here by again is a lot of the c6 move was based on tactics connected to rook takes a3. I think that's what Daisy was aiming for because the rook on b8 was hanging. But as soon as, you know, an additional, uh, as soon as the bishop f8 was on the board, it's no longer a viable tactic. And so you see bishop f1 happening. And yeah, now the pawn of c6 is picked up and it's a clean pawn. Um, going to be hard to deal c3. with. And the other great thing about bishop f8 is that the move queen takes b8, it would have come with check earlier. But here it didn't come with check, so Black was able to pick off Daisy's bishop on c3. Now the game is over. A2, A1. She resigns. And, and queen, both b2, matches. queen b2, mm -hmm. I just have to say, was super uh, clinical because you could have entertained some bishop b5, bishop e8 ideas and trying to get it f f7, and you just took that away as well. Great stuff by Kostya. Just performing in critical moments. Both of these games were really close, but once... Things got to time pressure. The more experienced player tends to have an edge. And both Rakesh and Daisy need a pretty big comeback at this point as we enter the 3 plus 1 portion. And Rakesh blundered a huge pawn on e5. Ooh, He's that's collapsing a... completely. 
Knight g6 is now in the offing. That is a masterful tactic there. And essentially, it's danger zone for for both these folks, basically. We have 2-0 leads on both boards. And again, remember, this is first to three and a half. So uh, adjustments need to be made and uh, before, you know, it, the match is just over. Yeah, this could be a complete wipeout. I mean, right now, Rakesh, next priority, defend the g6 square. It's so easy to follow up with a blunder. He goes rook g8. Ugh. Don't feel great Queen about that. Four. And yeah, no, this more is pressure. Crushing. More pressure. Crushing, yeah. crushing position. Yeah, as a matter of fact, it would be really funny to see something like rook a8. B6, B6 queen a7. Yeah. And queen takes a7. I got to show that. So rook a8, b6, discovery check. The pawn pushes. And then queen takes a7. And it's one of these positions where the pawn actually gets to queen because there's no pieces that can actually stop it in time. So I've actually had the privilege of playing like a queen takes a7 type of tactic once in my life. And it felt so good. Um, but of course, it, the pawn didn't become a queen. It was just resigns. But anyway, yeah, really crazy stuff. And okay, knight f7 was played, essentially punting on the a7 pawn still. Uh, you, queen takes a7 is still a move. And <laughs> b6 was played anyway. I mean, this could be over in, in like three moves. b6, c6, b a. And then white will play bishop takes c6 check. Okay, Rakesh blocks with a bishop, but... I mean, Lawrence just has to figure out the order of operations here. I would probably go queen takes a7 and play for maximum. He could also take the... bc is even a move. Oh my gosh, look at that c-pawn in amongst the trees. Now he's going to take the bishop and continue chopping away at black's queen side pawns. He's not going to have any left pretty soon. Yeah, the problem with queen takes a7 was it was it was too simple. And when you have a position like this, sometimes the artist in you comes to the fore. And so it's beautiful to like hang your queen but not have it taken... And I think Lawrence is a little bit of an artist when he's playing. Yeah, these positions are so fun because you're calculating and every single move works. Like everything you're considering, okay, this works and that works. And I would play Rook B7 and simplify into an end game at this point. That's exactly what Lawrence does. Good stuff. He's three pawns up. Now I would keep the queens. Given the opportunity, drop the queen back to B3 and finish the game. We're going to see resignation pretty quickly here. Yeah, and it's a 3-0 it. lead. 3-0. Lawrence has been very impressive. Very impressive thus far. And, um, yeah, how, how are we doing the other board? Kostya is also working a positional edge, grinding with those two bishops. Um, I love the way he's handling this position. And C5 was just played. It closes down some of the play on the queen side, but you can't help but think that at some point there's going to be a breakthrough, particularly with this e5 square being so sensitive, Danya. Like the knight on f3, the bishop on b2, they could very easily reposition themselves to put pressure there. Oh, definitely. Bishop b2 already on the board. Good call. Knight f3 is coming. White's position is so easy to play. He already holds a 35-second lead on the clock. I would also consider the move f4 to really cement uh, your control over the e5 square. Kostya is very good at these types of positions. These quiet, maneuvering struggles. He really feels, I think, where the pieces belong. Now, with that being said, he just put his bishop on f3. He's trying to fian keto it back to g2 to give some additional safety to his king. And then I think he's going to continue with knight f3. Good stuff so far by Kostya. Yeah, it does lose a little bit of time and does weaken the light squares a little bit. So I think that's why you saw a little bit of a drop in the eval. I don't. I think just putting the knight on f3 would have been sufficient, but... This does give uh, Desi more time to basically bring a rook to d8, kind of, you know, stabilize a little bit in the center, because now it's going to take quite some time to assert, assert control over the e5 square again. Yeah, rook fd8 on the board. We also could get a lot of trades of, of heavy pieces on the d file. Of course, Costa definitely doesn't mind a draw. Uh, we remind you that the first player to three and a half points automatically wins the match. So Lawrence is only half a point away. And he's doing well. He's totally relaxed. He's seeing the tactics on the left side. Look at what he's just done. Bishop d6 and the pawn on g7 is untouchable because of rook g8. And there was checkmate on g2 if the queen moved out and took the knight. Ugh, and f4, f4 is, is not ugly. a move you feel good about at all. It just weakens your king, uh, the diagonal towards your king. And it weakens your king horizontally because later in the game, that second rank is very airy. And so... I think Lawrence is, is really working this position pretty well. He also has the bishop pair as well. Um, H4 is in is in the in the cards. I think he's probably going to get at least the half point he needs here. I find it. Uh, the only thing that would save Rakesh at this point is a big blunder. The position essentially plays itself. And 
Levy mentioned yesterday in the interview how much of your success in this tournament is about confidence. When you win a couple of games, you start believing beyond a shadow of doubt that you can win this match. And then players like Lawrence become really dangerous. He's a confidence player. And when he's confident, yeah. he can play at a GM level. No question about it. Yeah, I totally agree. And Bishop D7 is such a classy move. You're willing to give yourself these double pawns because you cement your control of the E4 square, which is extremely relevant, particularly when you imagine a bishop maybe can come to C6. So just everything about the way he's handled this has been really impressive to me. Um, and uh, yeah, right now, now he's basically, Rakesh is saying, trade the queens on my terms, take on G5 instead, and then maybe there's some counterplay on the E4 square. I suspect Lawrence will not be, oh, okay, I spoke too soon. I was going to say, I thought he'd, he wouldn't be so cooperative, but he does decide to be cooperative, and I still think he's pretty much fine. I think his decision was greatly influenced by only needing a draw. And, and it makes sense because the best that Rakesh could do here objectively is trade on D6 and trade on D5, but that's not really an option. So I, I have no idea. Maybe G6, you need some sort of imbalance if you're Rakesh, some source of tactics. I would throw in the move G6. At least try to ask Lauren some questions. Okay, yeah, 94 is decent. Mm -hmm. It's a good point. G6, maybe the bishop comes to G5 or the knight comes to G5 if black recaptures. Um, yeah, actually, after G6, I'm not sure if I'd be 100% keen to actually take it. I mean, they might go F6 instead and hold that barrier. Um, but yeah, in any case, Black is doing, you know, all the things you should do. And Lawrence forces another exchange. So he's basically pivoting towards an opposite called Bishop position um, where it's going to be very tough, to tough, even with the heavy pieces to really break through. And B5 now is going to make it very hard for White to do anything on the Queen side. So interesting. He's doing this very professionally so far. Now, it's a blitz game. Anything could happen, but look at the clock situation. He's got the full complement of two minutes. Rakesh has 30 seconds, but Rakesh is putting some pressure on the F6 pawn, and things might get a little bit spicy after Rook F1. I think I Lawrence think just has to react well to this, and he does. I, I thought he actually you should have tried an exchange stack there with Rook takes F5. Um, just to get some counterplay along against the D and the H pawn, you would have gotten a pawn uh, for the exchange, then probably a second one later. Here, the rooks just aren't playing, and you can see Black's rooks are much, much better. Yeah, I mean, Rook A2, and Daisy Corey, by the way, just defeated Kostya Kowutsky in a dead-drawn endgame. He either mouse-slipped or got nervous, and he blundered a bunch of pawns, so Daisy recovering one point. She is still down by one, but yeah, I think Lawrence at this point is just deciding how to make a draw, what is the best way to force it. Yeah, and Takes in again, rook B1. yeah, yeah, very good enough, honestly. Now, will he find rook b1? Nope. He is. It's always funny when you're trying to figure out are you trying to win the game or hold the game, and it, it really changes throughout the game sometimes because you get optimistic based on your position. We saw it yesterday when uh, Shreyas Royal had a dominating position against Nemo, and then all of a sudden there were some blunders that ensued because he didn't understand the changing terms and conditions. And so, I think Lawrence is just trying to win. I agree. And we got a raid from Grandmaster Bordnik. Thank you, Sasha, for the raid. Hope you had a good stream. Welcome, everybody, to the I Am Not a GM SCC. I'm getting a little bit nervous for Lawrence for some reason. Bishop d6, Bishop e7. No, there's nothing. I mean, white can't even threaten a pawn. Yeah, this king is just going to assert itself. And all of a sudden, when their opposition themes come up, the checkmating oh. themes will appear. And actually, rook c8 now runs into e5. That was the whole point. And now he starts eating away at the pawns. Rook g1 mate is threatened. You're going to lose d4 and you're going to lose the game. That's the match. Yeah, and the problem is, is if king b3 threatens mate again. <laughs> yeah, and there's no defense. Yeah. Rook, Rook a2. a2. Rook a2, yep. There we mate go. Mate in one. He spots at 4-0. Lawrence. Impressive, impressive. Rushing so, performance. So we're going to actually pivot now to, uh, to Desi and Kostya, but... What an impressive performance by Lawrence. Look at him. He's locked in. He's not even remotely phased. And uh, yeah, he came to win. You could see, you could see the game faces on is there. He came to win. He's always talking. You know, he doesn't matter what he's saying. He's always talking. <laughs> yeah, no question. So, so what do we got now? We have Desi, who again did win the last game. Two to one means that she has at least this game and another game to play. So. Uh, it seems like that was maybe a confidence booster because I now like her position with white. This knight on b5 is 
a very nice outpost. Um, there's some light square weaknesses about in, in, in white's queen side. In particular, I'm looking at c6, d5, c4. This knight on b3 could be a little better position, but it has potential prospects later if it goes to d2. So I like white's chances here. Yeah, of course there is some issues with the king, but black's knights don't really have good squares in the center. The knight on e5 sort of stuck in limbo. And if white plays the move e4, then the influence of the queen is also dulled. I think the position probably closer to equal than an advantage to white, but it's not just about the objective evaluation of blitz. It's also whose position is easier to play. I like what Costa is doing there though here. He's creating some chances on the king side, trying to mix it up. And tactics could also happen in the center. There's like sacks and there's knight g4 type moves. So the situation remains fairly volatile. Yeah, I actually thought this bishop c1 move a few a few moves ago was actually not ideal. I think the bishop should have still guarded the e3 square, but gone back on the other diagonal, potentially to g1, um, just to cover things over there. I don't like the excursion with this pawn this pawn move to h4. And the problem here is this queen on b7 is just menacing. As you said, a piece can come to g4, and it's basically a pin, um, and that's the issue I think that white has to deal with. Okay, so rook d5, bishop f4. If you play rook fd8 here, you blunder a piece because if bishop takes e4, very important. Spot that. If I'm Kostya, I'm actually going rook takes d1 and putting a knight on d5. That's a much more effective piece to occupy that square because you're contesting the e3 square. And he goes knight c4. So he's aiming at that square. And Daisy should refrain from taking on d5. Yeah, trying to trade this knight on b3 uh, that was not actually active for now moving to d2. It's not a bad decision per se. Um, it no. might have made sense to play e4 and cover up the diagonal or the d5 square, but we're getting some heavy pieces on the d file, and every piece trade is going to favor white because the pawn structure on the queen side, particularly that b6 pawn, is just going to be soft later in the game. You could see bishop c7 happening at some point, and so every trade is ultimately going to favor white, and it's a matter of figuring out the right way to do it. And we will get a trade of all of the rooks. I mean, my style is to sacrifice the knight on e4 and go for counterplay, but Kostya is, he's a more positional player. He likes to keep the status quo, but queen e6 and queen b3 is a really nasty idea. He's got to spot queen e6 here. That's a big move. Yeah, getting into the that weakened uh, uh, queen side would be huge, and it would kind of offset the pressure of the b6 pawn. Again, Desi should still be looking for a queen trade or a peace trade. We get your knight takes e4 sack, uh, the difference here is Wrong that you don't timing. have to take. Yeah, you do not have to take on e4. And she does. She took on e4. She could have taken on e7 and then f7. That was winning. Now Costa is going to get a third pawn for the knight. He's going to set his center pawns in motion, and it's anybody's game. The clock situation, though, very concerning for Costa. 20 seconds. Can he navigate the complexities of this position? So far, he's doing a great job oh, of queen it. Queen h1 is such a tricky move in <laughs> when you're... Uh when your king's a little bit exposed. But I think this knight is a great defender. And yeah, F6? F6, F6 traps the bishop. the bishop. Yeah, I have to see that those kinds of things. But still, still a good position for black. A4 would be a nice move to throw in. And yeah, there we go, because now there's some tactics later. I wouldn't have rushed with A3, though. And now white's queen can infiltrate to D5, but Daisy kind of defensive mode queen going trampolining from H1 to A1, and queen, F3, queen takes G3. And now the pawns will collapse. continues. Bishop e5 looks good here. My gosh. Wow. The twists and turns. King f1, yeah, queen we're getting h1. Cool Carney, Trent, Trent vibes. King g8. Oh, f7 was hanging good. Qu Awareness by Costa. Queen b1 will come up very shortly. Queen b1, looking at queen d3, bishop c3. There's just all of white's pawns are targets. Yeah, there's already mating nets right in the center of the board. Black's got exactly the right two pieces to punish white's king. Daisy. Daisy's pieces are tripping over themselves. They're too passive. And she's also dropping these queenside pawns momentarily. I also have to say, Kostya has been down on time for a while and he's handled it excellently. So this uh, this tells me he's pretty good at bullet. And he's maintaining over 10 seconds, which is really important because yes, you can pause for five seconds if you sense that there is mate. So that's exactly the right way to handle a time pressure situation. Bishop c3, queen d3, tons of threats. And Daisy's going to have to burn her time advantage to deal with them. Yeah, and again, I've said this in previous broadcasts. Pawns are kind of like school children on a field trip. If they're not holding hands, bad things happen. All these pawns are targets, and they're just going to be picked off. Queen takes c4. Um, what pawns? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> 
<laughs> what school children? Yeah, there aren't any left. They're they're all just getting taken off, picked apart. Pawn on a3, pawn on h4. I think Costa probably has eaten enough. Now it's time to infiltrate with his queen. Daisy. Oh, now her king is all alone on f1. On Where is it going to go? Honestly, even queen trades are sufficient at this point. It's not going to happen necessarily, but I think you're almost at the point where queen trades win too. Okay, queen f3. I agree completely. Too many pass pawns, especially with 10 seconds. It would be impossible to hold queen d3. No. What's the move here? Queen e7. Queen I thought queen e7 maybe. Okay. King h2. Still not over. Queen d2. Yet still holding the e1 square. Now another pawn runs. I would take it. I, I would probably take that queen. Even if you give up e2, you're probably winning. But Costa is intent on keeping the queens on the board. Yeah, and I don't blame him. I mean, <laughs> look, at, look at the control here. Um, C3. C3, yeah. Queen, Just win the knight. I thought queen d1 there. But yeah. All right, and finally That's we it. have a queen trade when it's very clear it's, it's going to be enough. So, man, we have... Some very impressive plan. Are we going to see a ladder mate? No, what ladder mate? Oh, we're going to see one of those. What's that one called, by the way? Uh, that's the one. It's like that one test question you didn't prepare for. I never <laughs> know what this particular. It's actually how I usually choose to mate when I have two queens. Like one queen in the center, one queen on the side. Probably has a name, but I've never been like particularly good at that as we enter the bullet. What a win by Costa. That was incredible. All right, so we're in a must-win scenario for Desi now. Uh, she has black, and she's playing very provocatively with this 90, a lot, 98 stuff. And bishop takes h7 and knight g5 is incoming. Oh, oh, it's right here. Gift. Right here. Great gift. No, he didn't just do that. h4 is such an instructive move for newer players. And in a bullet game... It's not that Daisy doesn't know what a Greek gift sacrifice is. She just wasn't expecting h4. And she had already set up the move d takes c4 in her mind. This happens very often. Why did... I'm surprised she didn't just play king h8, though. And, like, like this doesn't this just mate faster? Because queen h5 now is, just, is, is incoming. And the problem is if you go to king g6, h5 check is disgusting. It, and, Casa, it's like not all Greek gift sacrifices are the same. A lot of people don't understand that. Some are actually very complicated. This one is just, like... It's like straight up mate. Like you can't even stave off mate by two moves. Yeah, a lot of times in the Greek gift, it comes down to whether you have a minor piece that can defend the h7 square again. So you can see the knight on e8 cannot access h7 because of the e5 pawn. In some positions, you'd like to have, there's sometimes moments where the bishop on c8 could come out to f5 and defend the h7 square that way. But you see the minor piece are of no use here, and that's why you're going to have mate on the h file. And they see throws in the towel a devastating win by Kostya to take the match four points to one there was an inkling of hope for Daisy that previous game could have gone either way but Kostya takes it with his bullet skills and he wins the first match Lawrence Trent knocks out Rakesh Gulkarni 4-0 scoring a KO of his own great two matches to start off group D yeah it's it's really impressive how uh, you know, our winners basically handed those themselves in that mini match. I think Kostya was just relentless. Um, also, Lawrence on the clock. They both managed their time pretty well. And then when they were in time trouble, were just better than their opponents. So just impressive, impressive attacks there. Honestly, a lot of really high quality games in this first set of matches. That king game between Lawrence and Rakesh, I won't forget that one anytime soon. The time scrambles in the I Am Not a GM SEC have been super exciting thus far. And the best part is that we have more matches to go. Folks, you're watching the I Am Not A GM Speed Chess Championship. We will have the next set of matches coming your way after a short break. Stay tuned. Love playing chess variants? Or just looking for something new? Join us for the Variants Community Series. Every two months we'll be featuring a different variant in a series of events and competitions. Learn a new variant and compete against other players for prize money or just play for fun. Look for community arenas, streamer arenas, and championship events. 
Six weekly arena tournaments held every Thursday will be followed by a championship event with cash prizes, including a $1,000 first place prize. The third and final weekly arenas will be streamer arenas, featuring gifted subs as prizes. Win any of these events to qualify for the championship. The Variants Community Series kicks off on September 7th with King of the Hill, where the first to occupy the center wins the game. But getting checkmated still loses. And join the Variants Club today to learn more about upcoming events, how to participate, and much, much more. See you in the arena on chess.com. Welcome back to the I Am Not A GM Speed Chess Championship. We are watching the final group, Group D, with four very exciting players. Uh, we just watched the first set of matches getting ready to start the second. And we've got four really exciting, good Blitz players, including Chess.com's very own Rakesh Kulkarni, who went down in the first match to Lawrence Trent. He will be trying to rebound, and uh, he's had some... Pretty impressive Blitz accomplishments, including a win over Maxime Vashilagrov all the way back in 2020. Yeah, Rakesh is no slouch, um, and he definitely has the has a very, very high ceiling when it comes to his play. So I think he's going to have to make a few adjustments going to this next, next match. Um, 
In particular, he spent a lot of time in openings and was kind of hustling afterward. And even when, we, when he defended well, that kind of uh, affected some of the, the games later on. So I think that's the adjustment for him. And the adjustment for Daisy Corey, I think, honestly, is no big adjustment. She was playing well. That match was a lot closer. Obviously, the third game uh, was a time scramble that ended in heartbreaking fashion. All credit, though, uh, to Kostya. He is an amazing bullet player. And bullet skills don't just shine through in the final two games of each match. They also shine through each time you get into one of those time scrambles. Bullet and, of course, control of nerves. And Lawrence Kostya is the most experienced players in the group. I think that they've got an edge in that uh, regard. Kostya. Yeah, I, I tend to agree. And um, I think I think it's really going to come down to how you how you handle uh, your getting positions that you like relatively early on. And then how that kind of flows from that, because it, it felt like when you got positions you're comfortable with, familiar with, the game and the decisions you had to make afterward felt easier. Absolutely. Yeah, here are our round two matchups. It'll be Lawrence against Daisy Corey on the left side, and of course uh, Kostya against Rakesh Kulkarni on the right side. So. Another set of very interesting matches. Lawrence and Daisy, a uh, battle of two completely different styles. Casa Daisy, very positional player. She likes the Catalans. She likes the slow maneuvering games. Well, I don't need to tell chat what Lawrence likes. Everybody knows what Lawrence's style is. Yeah, and I actually think Daisy has a, a really good shot here um, to kind of upset the Alpha cart a little bit. So that's I'm going to mm. be looking to see how she responds here. Whoa. And, and we're already <laughs> some intrigue in the opening. One Knight C3, the Van Geet by wow. Lawrence. But this opening usually transposes into something. And what? <laughs> E5. So hold your horses, man. Wow. E I've, I've never considered E5 this early, particularly when the queen trades are available. Um, but it appears that uh, that you can, you can play this way because you're actually now recapturing it with the queen with your rook instead of with your king. So... Maybe it's best to actually move this knight, maybe like to d7 or something. Yeah, the problem with the perk is that white can play basically any combination of moves, and it's going to be a line. It's going to be a decent option. So it's a very, very risky opening to play in blitz for that reason. Yeah, I would not play d takes e5 here if I'm Daisy. I would not allow white's rook to slide into d1, especially because the knight from c3 can jump into d5 later, and you could get massacred, uh, you know, as early as move 6. I've lost a lot of bullet games like this just waltzing into one of these types of positions. And maybe knight d5, bishop takes e5. Maybe this works out concretely, but this has to be calculated, and that's what Daisy is doing. Yeah, super uncomfortable. And so anyway, knight fd7 was played, and now we have a position that at least feels a little bit more stable um, for black uh, with, the, with the structure being resolved in the center. And I think Daisy could be happy with the way uh, she spent time there, although uh, she's going to be down the clock and have to pick up the pace a bit. And the issue with playing h6 prematurely is that now you cannot castle. And it's very, very hard to resolve this problem because you don't want to go g5 or h5 and make more weaknesses on the king side. White, on the other hand, can continue developing naturally with castle's queen side. Uh, he can push the pawn up to d5 and clamp down on some of those central squares. It's like a good Sicilian. Yeah, it's it's kind of funny here, actually, what where black is going to set up their pieces because you really need some kind of sicilian like play with a rook coming to c8 maybe a bishop to d7 but the knight on d7 is in the way and so it's going to be tricky to see how daisy rearranges her queen side pieces to kind of make make it make sense okay so a6 kind of knight or style uh preparing queen side expansion with b5 and bishop b7 and now Lawrence has to decide which way he's castling, because I've been taking it for granted that he's going to go queenside, but he might as well go kingside. He can play bishop d3 and castles kingside. And I think it's largely a matter of uh, positional taste. Like, if you want to get a sharp position, you go queenside. If you want something a bit quieter, I would personally go kingside here, honestly. Yeah, no, I appreciate the flexibility and the restraint shown with bishop e2, because now that g5 and h6 in played, there are some soft squares you can work with and in some ways it, when you cast along you are kind of you know constantly wondering should i play d5 should i not am i opening up this bishop am i not whereas here you know you just know you're going to have a nice stable position the rooks are connected i always think that's an excellent indicator when you ask yourself who's better and why white is just ahead d5 looks pretty good to my eyes and to lawrence's eyes 
And now he clamps down on a lot of those light squares, c6, e6, f5, especially if you can plant his f3 knight on d4. Logistically, though, that's going to be difficult because Daisy also has the move b5, b4, uh, and potentially you could end up losing the d5 pawn. You, you could sacrifice it in order to open up the center, but again, a lot of calculation to do. I would play a3 here, uh, just not to have to deal with any of that if I'm Lawrence. Yeah, not not having to think about b4. You, you maintain the knight on c3, you're kind of feeling stable now black if black gets like two or three moves the worst will be behind her so something like castles uh bishop b7 rook c8 and then all the pieces start to make sense and so lawrence has to be relatively fast here in trying to figure out how to disrupt that from happening and i'm not sure bishop d4 is a disruption but it, it is a centralizing move yeah now the knight feels like when you know you're trying to find the one available spot in a parking garage and some uh you know some jerk pulls into the spot from the other side of the road like hey that that spot belonged to me but i still think lawrence is better the bishop on g7 has been completely disarmed i'm sure that situation happens a lot more in manhattan than it does in, in charlotte though <laughs> plenty <laughs> yeah. of parking spots to go around here yeah for sure and i was gonna say it was high time for daisy to actually castle and she does do that i think she, the worst is over i mean white definitely still has an edge because of the space um there's some weaknesses. I, I feel like A4 should be tossed in at some juncture because B4 is kind of not in the cards because I think the pawn would just uh, be uh, a bit more of a target. I think you have to throw a knight C4 whenever A4 happens. You could even play B4 uh, for white in order to fix the B5 pawn. So shall we say you can play B4 before A4 or you can play A4 before B4, but Lawrence plays Bishop <laughs> F1 before A4 or B4. And then what, maybe we'll get something explosive with C4, with knight C4. <laughs> oh, Ooh, you explosive, very... That was an amazing riff. But um, anyway, so very Karpovian handling by Lawrence. I, I don't really expect this from him, but basically he's just chilling, putting the bishop back on f1, looking at the e7 square, and, and tempered approach. Um, I do not like rook c1, though, because you're just kind of passively putting the rook on a, on, on a file where it's, it can't really do much. Yeah, it's pretty cooperative now. Qu Queen a5 was an issue, so Lawrence drops his knight back to d1. And notice the d5 pawn is untouchable because after the trade of bishops, the knight on d5 will hang. So Lawrence, if he can get his knight to e3, his pawn to c4, I still think that he holds an advantage here. But it feels like the worst is behind uh, Daisy. But again, the clock. The clock has been an issue for her and it potentially an issue again this game. Yeah, I can't highlight the clock, but if I could, I would, because a minute and a half is a huge advantage in this time control. Um, so, and uh, But I, I do like the consolidation here from black. Like, the bishops aren't terrible. The rooks are connected. D5 pawn might be a target later. Uh, the <laughs> biggest problem, though, is on the queen side. Knight b6 was a threat, and that's why uh, queen b7 was played. Well, that's a terrible arrow. Here we go. Knight b6 is threatening a fork, and that's why the queen went to b7. It's okay. That there is no worse arrow drawer, drawer than myself. I think that is my, among my many weaknesses as a commentator, that might be my biggest one. <laughs> All right. So I, I I appreciate that bit of empathy there. And okay, now basically the d5 pawn is being defended indirectly. Knight takes d5 is not possible, right? Because of well, okay, the rook on c8 is hanging as well. But there's some tactics with bishop takes g7 and uh, and play against the d5 pawns. So that's why it can't be captured. Bishop b4, excellent move. Threatening bishop takes f3, but also keeping an eye on d5. Again, Daisy's handling this very well. It's just the clock. On the other side, quick update. We don't have to go to that game. It's been a completely one-sided first game. Kostya crushing Rakesh out of the opening. Rakesh just didn't get out of the opening. Kostya is simply up a piece in an endgame. So I'm just going to keep an eye on that game myself. If anything interesting happens, we'll switch to it. But let's stick to this game for now. There's a lot more meat on the bone here. Especially because Lawrence just gave up his d5 pawn. And what does he want? He's worse. I mean, knight d5 to f4? Ugh. Yeah, the knight on h2 is not a sight for sore eyes. And essentially, once the sort of the central control is relinquished... Um, Black just has a very, very healthy uh, chain in the middle. And so we're now in kind of, you know, conversion territory. And it's going to be hard to do with less than a minute for Daisy. So, um, but you really want to try and trade queens, ideally, um, or rooks. That ha getting heavy piece off the board would be the modus operandi uh, if I was playing black here. Because the, all the end games now with this healthy pawn chain, and I'm highlighting so many things, I'm going to stop. 
uh, is uh, it, it's just going to be nice for Black. From White's perspective, I would cycle that knight from h2 to f1 to e3 in order to contest some of those light squares on the king side. Lauren's trying to establish the knight on b6. Stacy says, not on my watch, as she shoves her pawn up to a5. Now the knight on b6 remains very flimsy. And Lauren's playing with fire on the queen side. Be careful, man. Yeah, insisting on establishing the knight on b6 and playing for this e a5 idea, it also gives this black rook avenues in. And so... Um, at some point now, there will be more files if this knight ever becomes destabilized because of the shoving of these pawns. But it's so difficult when you're, you know, in a, in a tough position to defend passively and accurately. And so this is kind of the practical and reasonable way to handle it. And taking into account Daisy's clock time, it's reasonable. Lawrence asking a lot of questions on the queens, forcing Daisy to calculate. Queen a7, pinning the knight, threatening knight d7. Lawrence leaning in. I would play knight f1, knight e3. I think now's a perfect time to do that, especially because the bishop on f5 has been left without a defender. You need all hands on deck here if you're Lawrence. Yeah, you can't actually, have a piece just sitting idly by. I'm actually wondering if knight g4 might also be viable just because you give yourself the h2 square and you, yeah, king h1 basically trying to get rid of the pin immediately. Okay, and now knight g4. But now knight yeah, d5. Queen d4 check and then just the king moves and the queen on d4 is undefended and she spots it. Wow, F6, that is a very, very classy move. Just blocking and maintaining this pin here. That is not an easy one to play, and she found it. Rookie one. I mean, if you're Lawrence, you want to find a way to keep the position as complicated as possible. He's too busy shaking his head right now. Rookie one might necessitate bishop takes g4 and then queen takes d5. If you can keep an imbalance, if you can keep knight versus bishop on the board, then you should. But maybe Daisy just drops her bishop back to f7. Yeah, if you just calmly retreat that bishop, everything is under control and very, very well handled by Daisy. But now she's under 15 seconds and that's going to be the problem here. Can you maintain the accuracy while being this long time? My answer is almost always no. If I'm Lawrence, I would play a move like King H2. I would make a waiting move. Instead, he gives up A5 with tempo, and his position continues to collapse. He's down two pawns. The knight has to seek its fortunes on D7. And here comes DC, but Rookie, it's not over. Rook takes D7, huge yeah. threat. How do you defend against it? Do you go Four passive? seconds. Queen D8. And, and now Rook A7. This is just too much. But Daisy, with one second, allowing the knight to escape, she's going to lose this. 96 check. This knight is one way too again. active. She's flagged. Man. Man, oh man. That was a, I mean, she played so well. Just have to, again, you can see how the clock is a weapon, right? And um, we're seeing it time and time again. Um, the position ceases to matter at some point. And um, got to speed up a little bit. And that's the thing, Casa. When you don't have that regular experience playing bullet, you don't have the sixth sense of when your clock gets down to a second. And we see the less experienced players, even though they might handle themselves well overall, at some point, you know, it's so easy to lose sight of your clock to take that extra half a second. And that's the difference between life or death. Really devastating loss there for Daisy. She's playing really high quality chess. Just a little bit, a smidge too slow in the middle game. And I do wonder stylistically, if you're a positional player and you're used to these long grinds, if just the time control doesn't favor your style, right? Because you have to basically do everything faster and at a quicker tempo. And I do wonder if like you're just like the, the sharp tactical player, it just helps to have this time control. I, I think it totally does. And Lauren's trying to complicate the game, going for a relatively unorthodox setup in game two. Queen b3 is a nice response from Daisy. And a trade in the center. Looks pretty decent for Lawrence, actually. His pieces are well placed there. Yeah, I think this queen on c8, is, it's it's a little bit weird, but once black castles, that'll quickly be corrected. Um, pawn e5 is basically healthily controlling some squares. The bishop on g4 is pretty decent as well. Can always challenge the queen on b3 if you're worried about it. I think black has responded pretty well. As, uh, I, I tend to agree. Agree completely. On the right side, we have a lot of trades happening. Maybe we should watch the end of that game just because uh, we want to give Kostya and Rakesh some love. Looks like a slightly better position for Kostya. Rakesh cannot afford uh, to lose this second game as well. He has to find a way to hold this end game. 
Yeah, and it's just not a pretty one. Again, these pawns are all targets. B4, E5, B2. Um, you know, just because white is temporarily up a pawn here doesn't really mean much given the weaknesses. And yeah, that pawn is snapped off. Um, very difficult to, to hold this one uh, just from a practical standpoint. And when you're winless this far into an event, you, you start getting into your own head. It's the opposite of what happens uh, when you're someone like Levy and you're winning games, you're confident, you feel like you can run the table. When you can't pull out half a point, you get into your own head and it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. What's so, so unpleasant about this also is the bishop on b7. Once the exchange on b4 happens, that bishop is going to be lording over the center, over the king side. Very unpleasant position for Rakesh uh, to defend in a blitz game. 100%. And I think it's it's interesting and instructive. You know, a lot of times we say don't put the bishop on the same color as your, uh, or don't put the pawns on the same color as your opponent's bishop. Well, the the pawns on e6 and f7 specifically are kind of blunting the scope of that bishop on b3. So yeah, late into end games, you typically want to have your pawns in the opposite color. In middle games where there's a lot of pieces on the board, you typically don't mind it because you restrict your opponent's pieces. And that's why Black's bishop is just significantly better than White's bishop because it doesn't it's not restricted in any way. Man, I, I feel like if if someone like Magnus or you know, name stereotypical Soviet GM and a Vasily Smyslov was on the black side of an endgame like this, I would already be writing down zero one uh, <laughs> on the score sheet. Unless uh White was uh, Alisher Sulemanov, but uh, too soon, too soon, sorry. <laughs> you know, yeah. I was joking on my stream. I was joking on my stream yesterday. Um that rumor has it Magnus offered a draw, uh, but his opponent refused to Ali share the point. Instead, uh, he looked at Magnus and said, watch this. <laughs> Sorry. I'm going to dignify that with a giggle and then move on. <laughs> we, can mo we can move on now. I, I, I will allow it. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is definitely the game to watch right now. Um, uh, 97, already opening up the scope of that Bishop on B7. Um 95 looks kind of annoying here. Maybe positioning to f4. I think after 95, you have to go queen d2 to cover the f4 square. Um, but it's already in that position where white is kind of retreating. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I would play knight d5 here. You know, Kasa, this reminds me of the time that uh, Vasily Smyslov was playing uh, the late Jeremy Silliman in Lone Pine. And Jeremy got distracted by the commotion outside the playing hall, and he didn't move the queen away from c3. And he was complaining to the arbiters, but they wouldn't give him the light of day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and for folks in chat, uh, you can type in who Danya is, uh, what, what impression Danya is giving there, because uh, I know, and most I think most of us know. Um, but uh, but yeah, queen yes, d2 is a must. You got to cover f4. Queen takes b2 is not a move because bishop h7 check would pick off the queen. So that's the tactical justification there. And then here is black. I'd go a5. I'd begin to cement that b pawn on b2. Maybe give my knight the outpost on b4. Um, yeah, queen c7 also makes sense as you're describing. To provoke f4 would be desirable. Yeah, Rakesh has to avoid the temptation of this move because... It creates long-term weaknesses on the king side. I would go knight f3, as unpleasant as it is to make retreating moves in a position like this. You just got to hold the fort as long as possible. Then Kostya could drop his own knight back to e7, opening up the scope of this bishop. Black can basically torture this position forever. That's what makes it so unpleasant to defend. There's no end point. Right, and again, the time will start to tell when you're defending something like this. It's just so unpleasant. Like, I mean, that's why Danya was saying, oh, zero one, because you just don't feel good about defending any of this. Um, meanwhile, I'll just point out, um, Daisy's doing, uh, is doing, her last move maybe shifted things a little bit, She but she'd been in control most of the game in a Catalan style position where she fan showed her bishop. She's good at this type of chess. So um, again, it's just the time factor, but if she adjusts course with her time management, I really still like her chances in the match. Yeah, C takes D4 here would be really desirable, essentially. Then White would have this nice long chain from uh, D4 to H2 and... Uh, potential dangerous passer. And so the queen trade that Lawrence just went for was a bit of a stunner because it probably wasn't good. But but essentially, yeah, essentially, Daisy has a great position and excellent chances to equalize this match. 
And in the meantime, we also have, uh, you know, the squeeze is still on with uh, Kostya. So uh, tough, tough position. But um, if we have the opportunity to actually shift to the Kostya game, I'll, I'll actually draw some arrows while we're in bird's eye. Um, okay. a pawn on b5 that's going to shift forward but in the constant game things continue to get tougher and tougher to defend for rakesh yeah this king on d3 is not this king on g3 is not in paradise <laughs> and this La queen trade's not happening yet yeah queen lawrence blundered a piece move. by the way lawrence blundered a piece and he's going to lose the second game yeah and the time management again for daisy was so much better in this game i know she's a little bit down the clock now but she still had about two minutes to kind of navigate a late middle game dynamic and that's what she needs for these these squeezes that she's putting on. She's a boa constrictor, right? Like, and that's that's kind of how that's happened. But excellent job to equalize. And I still, again, I'm going to say it for the umpteenth time. I like her chances. I like her chances too. She's played very high quality chess throughout. And uh, the score is 1-1. They're going to start the three-minute portion momentarily. And Rakesh holding the fort for now, but his clock continues to dwindle. He's down to 18 seconds. Can Kostik continue to create problems and ask questions in this position? How do you improve? That's the question. How do you improve without spoiling your position? I think it's repositioning uh, either the knight or getting in some type of h5, h4 idea, but it's hard to improve without creating a weakness. And yeah, f5 is a really interesting practical decision. Uh, getting rid of the f pawn, which was a target, because now the knight on d5 is hanging. I like f5 a lot. And now F6, Rakesh playing aggressively, trying to weaken Black's king. But Kosti can ignore this. Like, I wouldn't play G takes F6 and allow the queen to dive in. I would play a neutral move like A4. And if the pawns are traded, Black's king on G7 is actually going to be really, really safe. Great stuff by Kostya. Take it and knight B4, maybe? Yeah, knight B4, knight to knight D3. And both pawns and on are going to be loose. And he spots it. He goes knight E3. Same idea. He's going to win the B2 pawn. Yeah, and every pawn ending is going to be just completely lost. Oh, um, Rakesh just gave up the knight. Yeah. Unpleasant, unfortunate, great defense. Uh, but this is what we were talking about from the outset, Kasa. It's just defending this for sixty moves. At some point, uh, you're gonna you're gonna slip. Yeah, I mean, uh, pr pressure bust pipes, <laughs> and that definitely was the case here. All right, let's tune in back to Lawrence and Daisy because, again, that match is now one all, uh, and Daisy, again, has a very good position thus far, um, a little bit down on the clock, which has been the case, but if she navigates uh, this position a little bit, she'll be fine. Um, okay, knight b6. I, know, I never like knights on b6 as black they always seem to be misplaced or chased around um they tend to not have so much scope so i i don't like this knight at all um but otherwise i think she's she has something of a viable position here um she had the opportunity to castle earlier i thought she lost some time with this knight here is a, a little misplaced now um lawrence has the advantage for sure yeah advantage on the board on the clock i would play c5 here uh, if I'm Daisy, trying to justify the placement of the knight on b6. And the only way you can do that is to prepare the c5, c4 pawn break. Lauren's playing c4 himself on passant. That was forced. It was the only legal move in the position. And now the b file opens. Who does that benefit? It benefits white. Lawrence will eventually put a rook on b1, putting more pressure on that awkward knight on b6. Don't play queen c2 here. That walks into c4. Very easy to blunder your light squared bishop here. Ooh, no. classy. Knight takes a4 is a very, very uh, natural but risky decision to make because actually knight c4 would trap the knight. So basically, Daisy decides to play c4, but all of a sudden, the d4 square is now available to white's knight, and the queen side play is going to come very quickly and be in white's favor. You could easily see a doubling of the rooks. You could see the knight coming to d4, and this knight on b6, again, I said it before, not a great square. I said it before, I'll say it again. That knight on b6, I've seen better pieces in my lifetime. Knight d4 coming in. And Lawrence, again, the three-minute portion, he's been playing with great confidence, great poise. One minute on the clock for Daisy, and I hate to be a broken record, but this ultimately might be the deciding factor in the game. Yes, Once again. Pick up the pace. Pick up the pace. Your moves are good enough, but you got to pick up the pace. Um, and yeah, this knight on b5 is annoying. 
um, exchanges you get, you have to, okay, I, I would have said thought knight bd7 would be the better way, actually, just to bring this knight, this knight on b6 has no salvation, get it out of there, um, but okay, moves are coming quickly, and these rooks are split, I don't, I, I think black has some counterplay here with knight e5, how about a flow fork action on f3? Yeah, kind of Benko, Benko Gambit style activity on the queen side, knight e5, knight c5. But Lawrence keeps asking questions to Daisy. He keeps posing her with decisions, and that's milking more time off for clock. Knight d3 is an excellent, excellent attacking move, trying to lure Lawrence into trading the bishop for the knight, which would open up the c file, which would increase the influence of black's bishop and black's queen, which are cooperating and facing down the c3 pawn. Lawrence could actually lose an exchange there to a fork on c3. Yeah, and don't also forget this rook on a5 is just stuck like a sore thumb out there, unprotected. Maybe this knight actually will get into the game with some tactics against that rook on a5. So yes. I love the position. I just, the time. e6, what's that about? e6, Lawrence repositioning his rook to a defended square, and a5 is an excellent Excellent move. So d4 by Daisy. It's not going to work. Knight d5, game over. And that's a fork. That's a fork of it. You could even play... Probably rook takes b6, but knight d5 ends. And Lawrence sits back. He knows that he's got the winning move in the bag. This Queen is D1? also good. What is happening? Yeah, queen d1. Yeah, you're just, you're a, just, piece a, you're just a piece you're up. You're just a piece up, essentially. Up. You take all, you, and, you just and knight take takes c4, the then. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's winning. What is Lawrence so surprised about? Just move your queen back, sir. Okay, king g3. He's going to win a second piece. But don't take on f4. Bishop e5 mate is a beautiful mate. Maybe we should yeah, just show that really just, quickly. Yeah, yeah, I'm actually I will show that. So if king g3, queen takes <laughs> queen takes b6, king takes f4, bishop e5 would be gorgeous. Uh but these folks are too good to play moves like that. So and while I was talking, the game actually ended. Uh knight d5 is just a king h1 was played and then knight d5 just wins the piece. So yeah, Lawrence got us a 2-1 lead. Very convincing victory in the second game. It's funny, we saw knight c3, knight f6 in the first game. Now we have knight f3, knight c6. So we're getting uh, knight action on both sides of the board. On the other side, Rakesh holds a big advantage against Costa. He has to deliver uh, on a pawn up position where he's got a big time advantage. Rakesh has the black pieces there. He's just played the move e5. The computer not liking that move, probably because it weakens the d5 square. But Kostya, one of the most resilient players in the tournament, he is really hard to bring down. Yeah, and I think the the, the other th part about it is that, yeah, now this now on E3 is going to start to harass the D5 pawn. It's, it's not going to be so convenient to defend. And the bishop on C6, is it just going to be tethered to the D5 pawn, or is it going to have a, a better, brighter future? That's tough to say. I'd actually throw in B4 at the right moment to try and distract the C pawn, and maybe you have the chance to get in D4. But right now, the pawn D5 is hanging right so uh, maybe you have to go for rook d8 or do you say well you have to yeah i mean is there another option i was wondering if maybe you, you punt on d5 and try to get in on f2 but i'm not buying it rakesh is burning clock when he shouldn't be you cannot give up d5 that is the soul of your position pawns are the soul of chess and good stuff by rakesh but that gave cost a time to, to set up his next move and the infuriating thing is that Black's position is beautiful. You've got this huge center, but how are you going to make progress? Knight d4 maybe is an idea. Oh, because the rook on f4, which moves yeah. back to f8 no longer, but queen c5, and he starts to surround Black center. Knight e3 is coming next. And the momentum is totally changed from a time perspective and just from a, a threat perspective. It's been white that's been basically creating threat, threat, threat in the last few moves. Black's just been retreating. 20 seconds. Rakesh was just up 45 seconds. Now Kost is up 30 seconds. Good move by Rakesh. Rook F7, Rook F to D7. All hands on deck to defend the D5 pawn. And now we're at a bit of a stalemate where neither side can easily make progress. Yeah, and A4 is an interesting decision. Fixing the black, the white queen side, uh, but also preventing you from playing B4 at any juncture yourself. So you're really at quite a standstill here, but... It all comes down to whether black had played d4 or not. Okay, so now we have a queen trade on deck, potentially. I don't think that the trade necessarily hurts white's drawing chances. As long as Kosti can prevent d4, he's good. But I don't think he can prevent d4. We're going to see g6 and then d4 on the next move. Yeah, and yeah, and here we go. And now, finally, that bishop on c6 can assert itself. And this is a position you like. 
Although it's still tricky. Can can you play d3? Yeah. The thing about it is white has this annoying blockade. Knight f1, knight e3. Black has to open up another flank at some point, and that's why the rooks are repositioning themselves on the f file, trying to open up the king side. Great play by Rakesh, h5, and now he gets his king involved. E3 E3, was, E3 was discovery. There was discovery, that bishop on the diagonal, and Kostya was not going to allow it a second chance. But but he's completely lost. I mean, Kostya is collapsing here on all seams. It's impressive, the king walk here that's happening. Um, very, very nice play. Beautiful. Don't take on g4. Knight h2. It's, now it's a game it's, again. It's still winning because the pawns are so good. g5, g4 is definitely in, uh, in the offing. Oh. But you allow the rook. You, you get your. You allowed the rook check. Rook h8 and Rakesh doing everything to not win this game. D2, rook d8, and Kostya's going to pick up that pawn. This is actually you, getting close. I think you go bishop d5, bishop c4, and you position yourself like that, and then you're always threatening d2. Rook b8, okay. Put Two your bishop on d5. For Rakesh! Oh! Now the pawn is hanging. Flags. Oh, he came so close. Wow. King takes f3 at the end, and it's actually objectively close to a draw, believe it or not, in the final position. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're, Rakesh played so well at the end of that game, but you can see in, in both our games, the time becomes a huge factor. Um, wow. Wow. Stacey had a pretty dominant position a little while ago, like completely winning. And now again, the tables have turned because of, you guessed it, time. So uh, Daisy's in a situation where she's got 39 seconds and it's a little bit of a mess. So we'll see how she handles this. <laughs> We've got Greg Shahadi in the chat saying, well, Lawrence is actually winning games. <laughs> no, none, none of us can believe it, right? <laughs> Yeah, a little bit of trash talk before uh, a potential potential matchup, right? That's uh, already uh, already letting people know how it would go. Appears that Daisy is kind of losing the thread of the game. That knight has just planted itself on d4, and you would want to trap the b2 rook with queen c1, but there's just forks galore everywhere on f3, on e2. White really needs that bishop on g2 right about now. Yeah, and there are basically just too many roads to roam here. I mean... Uh, the rook on b2 is actually extremely active. Here you can take on c2 and just transition to a nice heavy piece endgame where you're you know, cleanly two pawns up. That would be the simplest way. If you want to insist on attacking play, I think a move like queen e8 is actually subtle and good. You double and fight for the file, the e-file, and you also kind of overprotect f7, and it's played. Wow. It is excellent play by Lawrence, and all roads do lead to London here. Knight Yikes. takes c2 now, but then there's queen takes d6 at the end. So there's a little bit of technical work to be done by Lawrence, but he's left himself with a minute to do it. His time management has been the best of anybody in this group thus far. Yeah, and queen c6 is a nice one. Just Whoa. threatening mate. Ooh, and now king g1 is not a possibility because of knight f3 business. F3. This now means you've opened the front door to all, all manner of strangers and... Uh, this is the opposite of safety. Um, this king is super exposed now. But you need to finish it off, and Lawrence does it technically. He just takes on f3, knight d2, and knight takes b3 is going to be devastating. He goes back to e5, threatening c4. c4. Yeah. An excellent way to convert, and it's And over. now there's just this pin that's just a problem. Knight d3, knight c5 is a nice way to finish it. <laughs> yeah, and he finds it. And he wins. And we're at 3-1, so it's another match is not over yet, but Daisy has to, you know, basically turn it up now, and uh, we'll see. But uh, really dominating performance, at least in the end there, and, you know, the, the, the flow came back a little bit towards the end for Lawrence. But bad news on the right side for Rakesh. He's struggling out of the opening, simply down a healthy pawn. And it, he has to hold this position. I think if he goes down 3-1 going into the bullet, and Kost is too good of a bullet player to give up a two-point lead. Yeah. Now, there is Ooh. maybe some semblance of hope. Maybe you could, like, double on the e-file and then maybe entertain some type of h4, h5 business. But, uh, but yeah, queen c5 is a nice move. It just holds everything together. It kind of blockades those queenside pawns. And, uh, yeah, just a nice square. On the on the left side looks like another pretty bad perk for Daisy. Her king side is really damaged. Lawrence sticking his knight on d5 and playing so quickly. He's got the full minute, about ten moves in. 
Daisy trying to complicate the game. She needs everything to go right if she is to win the next two games and come back. Yeah, and it's funny because there's a lot of these dynamic openings like in the Sicilian or even in, sometimes in the Caracon, which is maybe a touch less sharp, where if you castle queenside as black like you do with white, you're just guaranteed to be slightly worse because there's no real prospects for you, uh, aggressive prospects there, that is. So you're kind of turtling in a way, and you can see 97 is a classic example just of a turtling type of move defending on the last few ranks, and it's just not going to be good enough um, because white has so many avenues in. F4 was actually hanging on the last move, even. Knight takes F4. A draw wins the match for Mr. Trent. And I just, I don't see Daisy pulling out uh, this this really miserable position. On the other side, Kaste gave back his extra pawn. And because of Rakesh's pawn majority on the queen side, I actually think it's white who's now in the driver's seat. And it's Kaste who has to be careful to hold the draw. I think he will. We're, we're going to get too many trades here. The position is too simplified. And a draw is really good for Kostya. That puts him one point away from winning the match. Yeah, and I think uh, I, I think Kostya would also do well to probably consider like h5 if he can maintain it and manage it and get some space on the king side. Sometimes h5, h4 is a nice way to handle things. I don't love this king on g7. I feel like tactically there might be something at some point. Um, so I'm a little bit wary of the king being a little exposed in that diagonal. Should we maybe watch the end of the Trent game? Because that's heating up both sides under 20 seconds now. Whoa, and there's just an attack coming right now. There, White is crashing through. You could take on b6 if you want to. You can also keep the queens on. Lawrence elects to take on b6 because this king is exposed. The d6 pawn is weak. And this bishop might scream it to life. The, you, yeah. You can even rook lift, like rook d3 and stuff. Knight takes oh, a knight takes a5. Sexy what a move. move. And he's simply two pawns up. Now, Daisy has a very good bishop on e5, but that doesn't e4. tell the, any e4. side of the story. A4. Right, A4, okay. Now, A4, yeah. Yeah, these bishop, the bishop pair is going to be huge. You're also up material. Uh, and the knight on g6 is not doing much. B4 is going to happen at some point. I love the bishops here, just holding Begging everything down. Begging to be And remember, Daisy needs to win this game. That's the most debilitating thing about draw. Maybe, yeah, you can hold it, but how are you going to win this? I think your chances have improved just ever so slightly. I haven't. I don't love this A pawn separating from the B pawn in this way. Oh, um, he's giving it now away. Now it's hanging. Yeah. What is Lawrence doing? He's just blundered his pride of his position, and it's still incredibly hard for Black to win this game. But Lawrence can get in his own in his own head a little bit. But B four is played under quite literally probably the worst circumstances possible. I mean, there was so many oh! better plays before, and now the dark squares. You could have taken on C three and then invaded. Knight d6, though. Daisy the dark is squares. now in the driver's seat. What is Lawrence doing? I have no... King the rook, the knight is hanging. Rook, the knight, knight is hanging. is hanging. Oh. And then we're going to... Oh. Oh, that's it. That's it, right? Bishop d5. Close the door. Oh, my gosh. What a finale there. Lawrence almost choked that away, but he takes the match in a sigh <laughs> of relief. The other game, though, is also heating up. It's also in a time scramble. Oh, we got a shift over there. Lawrence knew he got away with one, but uh, he he won, and uh, that's all that matters now. All right, here we go. It looks like Kostya is going to hold this one. Yes, Kostya can force a draw right now with queen c1, queen c7. He, he should play a2, though, and play for a win. No, but he's going to take the draw. I think given the match situation, a good decision, and all he needs is one bullet victory in the next two games. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he, I like his chances there. I think you do as well. He's just been really, really fast. And his his average strength of move has been a little bit higher, I'd say, than Rakesh's, at least to this point in the match. And if Kostya can win this match, then we will get a final round showdown between uh, the two perfect players. But all of that is predicated on Kostya keeping his composure. Rakesh needs to complicate the games early. And we have another Trumpowski. Shades of Levy Rosman by Mr. Kavutsky. Yeah, this is different. I don't think we ever saw knight e4 in the previous match. We saw knight c6s and, and, and stuff like that. F5! I've never, I've never seen this version, uh, this type of handling. <laughs> um, particularly now the dark square bishops can be exchanged and the e5 outpost is white forever. So I, I don't like the setup. You've never seen it and I don't think we'll ever see it again <laughs> from Rakesh. Now, what do you do here? Do you castle? Yeah, I was going to castle and go rookie one and then F3, but, uh, okay, Black is trying to get some counterplay on B2. F3 is a great move because after the trade on D2, the queen comes out and guards the pawn. Good awareness by Kostya. Yeah, I mean, you just 
chill. Rook F E one, Rook A C one, you just maintain the balance. Yeah, and you just slowly but surely maneuver your pieces around that weak square. Um that's what's being done here. C takes D4, and then you could play shift to rook back to C1. Excellent move, just fighting for the file. Basically, this is a classic case of trades actually help white. Um, you just go B3 here, you hold down the fort. Um, I mean, it's just hard for, for black to do anything. I would go H4 here now, give your king a, a avenue towards the side of the board instead of coming towards the center if you're checked. Um oh. Costi a little bit too diffident in his handling. I would put the queen on a5. I would go for it and try to seize the moment. But I think he's enjoying his position too much, trying to get pieces off the board. And we might get a classic good knight versus bad bishop situation. The issue is that black's queen is really, really active. So it's actually hard to get the queens off the board. Queen before great awareness by Rakesh. And things are going to get more tactical than they appear here. H4 should have been played five or six moves ago, and you would have had no concern about the infiltrations in the same manner you do now. H3 has the, a similar effect, but the beauty of H4 is if you get H4, H5 in, and then a knight cemented on G6, there's all types of mating patterns. And white's also got mating patterns. Yeah, queen C6 coming in, A4 defending the pawn. Rakesh has to keep his queen active, keep trying to generate chances against white's king, and he's doing a great job of it. Bishop D3, Bishop C2 is his idea. And queen E3. Queen E3 check. Take the pawn on D4, and the knight loses its support, and we might get some sort of a perpetual check here. Which is uh, reasonable for for Kostya, honestly. So, um, But also, given the advantage he had earlier, it might be a little disappointing. Queen E3, I think, is the most precise move. He goes F4, knight C6, knight E7 is a really nasty mating net, though. Yeah, and knight D7, wrong, wrong avenue, but still, still holding the balance. Queen E3, Draw. wow, going for a queen trade. This would be advantage black. Yes, queen takes D5 and just... Oh, bishop F1, Rakesh playing for a win, but he's allowed a queen trade. Queen E4. Queen E4 check. Oh, Kostya misses the chance. He gets his knight around to E5, or is he going to force a draw? He's going to force a draw. Professional oh, approach. Um, yeah, he was just saying, I'm, I'm getting closer to the, to the match victory I need, and I'm cool with it. And here we go. This is a must win for Rakesh. Kostya sticking to his weird sort of, I've played this with Black, uh, this kind of hyper-modern type perk. And let's see how Rakesh handles this. We've transposed into actually a King's Indian, <laughs> oddly yeah. enough. It's like a it's a four pawns attack type of vibe. You see this knight c6 and, and then d5 provocation a lot these days because people want to get a position and, and argue that white's pawns are overextended. So that's kind of what ha is happening now. Kostya is trying to ch chisel away at the white pawns but it's a very passive setup for black and white's got not only the huge center but the center is well supported by white's pieces rakesh could also go rook h3 and try to generate chances on the king side i think kostya is preparing the move e6 in order to counteract that so it's a cagey position white is better but things could turn around if white makes one incautious move yeah and h4 was not very cautious i think the point is is that you're just, it's aggressive, but you are potentially creating targets and avenues in later. And it's really sometimes uh, quite burdensome to maintain your space. You know, I I know some folks have heard the, the saying, to whom much is given, much is expected. And I always think about that when thinking about a center. I would play f5 here, but Costa ignoring the threats against his king. Now Rakesh is going to play queen f2, queen h4. And things are getting really scary for black now. Queen d8. Maybe Kostya rook just make a run for it. I think it's maybe going to try and go knight f8 to hold down the h7 square, and it probably shouldn't work, but five, uh, e5, he's d takes win the knight. This is a mess. But Kostya has a bunch of pawns, and now b2 is hanging as well. Kostya's pieces kind of open up. I actually don't like that decision by Rakesh to go for the minor piece. And also, let's keep him... I, we, I mentioned this earlier. Look at the pa black's pawns on the king side limiting the scope of that light squared bishop. So we're seeing this example again of how pawns can restrict a bishop, particularly in the middle game, um, if they're on the same color as that bishop. Queen b6. Try to force the queens off the board if you're cost to 20 seconds on the clock. Queen e5. Bishop same, takes... Same Rook idea. B1. Rook b1. Yet yeah, trades help, and you're actually threatening mate with f3 check. If he spots that move, then he shouldn't lose. Costa just not playing to his usual strength and time pressure. It's still a very double-edged position. I would prefer black in a time scramble. F5 would have trapped the knight. F5 goes G5. Still a very, very viable position for black, though. But, let's, but let's White's be clear got about the passer. That. White's I got mean, the passer on C4. 
Yeah, but I could see something, some con combination of bishop c5 and rook h8 being hugely problematic. Oh, he's blundered g5. Costa just blundering pieces and pawns. Still bishop c5, position. bishop c5, bishop c5, and then Mate. rook h8. Oh my gosh. He gives up the pawn. Now black has connected passers. Should be but good for Costa. They, they're getting blockade on the light squares, though. Bishop c6, bishop e4, they're all <laughs> under white's control. Bishop c6. There we go. Bishop e4, then rook h6. White is in the driver's seat. These pawns are immovable. Yeah, but the rook's getting into b2, and it, I think white hits game. first. G2, G2. Here he goes. Knight h3 is forced. Gotta get get the knight back to stop the pawn. Oh my goodness! Yeah, Kasha, Kasha's getting away with this. A draw wins the match for Kostya. Can he hold this with six seconds? Ten seconds for Rakesh. He spots it. Oh, one second. G1. He's gonna hold. And that's going to be enough for Kostya. Or is it? King d6? He still has to defend, but the pawn is the wrong color. Just move your king to closer to the queen side is black. King e8, king d8. And then you can even oh. sack. You're totally fine. Wow. And, and now you can pre-move. You can pre-move. Yeah. King c8, king b8, king a7, king b8. Or probably better that's to pre-move with the bishop, actually. Bishop h2, <laughs> bishop c7, just to not allow c7 stuff. Sheesh, what an incredible... T what composure by Costa to figure out that he could go into this opposite colored bishop endgame and it's a draw. Yeah, and... Um, man, <laughs> this is so entertaining. Like, I mean, the ups and downs, the twists and turns. My goodness. Yeah, honestly, this is why we watch the, the I Am Not a GM SEC. Uh, frustrating end of the match for Rakesh, but he fought so well. He was in it until the last seconds, literally. But Costa takes the match in the end. Three and a half to two and a half. He moves to 2-0, and we are all set up for a final round showdown between Kostya Kavutsky and Lawrence Trent. We will not get over time because one of these two players, by definition, is going to win the match, Casa. Yeah, and it's funny because I think it's the matchup we all want to see. They've played, uh, they've been the two best players in this group thus far, and so it makes sense. And uh, the styles also are going to almost be a bit closer uh, to matching um, compared to the previous, previous matchups we've seen. So I'm really curious to see uh, what happens there. Indeed, and of course, Rakesh will be facing Daisy, both of these players yet to score a victory but their opposition has been so strong lawrence has been the star of the show thus far cost his victory it was less convincing but his opposition was very stalwart it'll be trent against kavutsky but first we will give the players a much deserved breather folks you're watching the i am not a gm speed chess championship don't go anywhere because the group d showdown between lawrence trent and costa kavutsky returns in just a couple of minutes October is here, and so are some familiar faces. Martin learned chess just to play with his kids, and occasionally the family dog. A workaholic, Philip hopes chess will help him relax before he works his fingers to the bone. Laura the Librarian loves to learn, and has recently developed a penchant for spell chess. An aspiring influencer and self-proclaimed meme queen, Isla can be a monster on the board when she puts her mind to it. Paul Morphy's undying genius lives on to this day through his immortal opera game. Just your average old bots, nothing else to see here. Play them all on chess.com. <laughs> I really love watching games by top female players and studying their games from the past. And I think that's like one really cool thing that the chess community could do more of. I know my friend Luciana is publishing a chessable course on some of the great games by the early world champions, Vera Benchik, Rudenko. And you can learn just as much from these games as you can learn from any game. And yet it does provide inspiration and like adds like depth to our chess culture. So. I, about 10 years ago, I published a book called Play Like a Girl with like tactics by female chess players and I'm actually redoing that book. And it's so much fun to just like kind of like dig in and see some of the most important tactical themes in chess, decoy, in-between move, pins, 
uh, double attacks um, and to look for like some of the, the best examples by top female players. So when you hear all these discussions about women in chess, it's great. But sometimes I'm just like, wow, you should just like go study some Muzuchu games. Welcome back to the I Am Not a GM Speed Chess Championship. We are all set for the final round showdown between Kostya Kavutsky and Lauren Trent, who have thus far remained perfect. I am Kostya Corley, GM Daniel Nadiski, bringing you coverage of this final round of, of uh, Section 1 action to determine the winner of the final group. Now, Kasa Kostya Kavutsky, very familiar name to most people who've been in the chess world longer than a couple of minutes. Super strong I am, great guy, amazing chess teacher. He's really done it all. Yeah, no question about it. And he basically has been practicing what he's been preaching in this game. I think he's, you know, basically been really good managing the clock. He's been very resourceful even when he's under pressure. And, you know, he's he's in tournament form. You know, he's a guy that's still very active and playing a lot of events. And you can see that in the way he's playing in this event. Absolutely. And obviously the spotlight has been on Larry Trent, uh, who's been playing sparkling, fast, tactically aware chess. Costa will have to step up, I think, his level of tactical vision. Lawrence has been really, really good at punishing, you know, tactical blunders. And that's part of what he's hung his hat on. He's just really tactically sharp. His time management has been excellent. Uh, as we have a look at uh, Mr. Trent right there, it's Lawrence against Kostya. And on the other side, it will be Rakesh against Daisy. One of those players will score their first victory of this group. Yeah, it's a, it's a little cosmetic at this point because there's only one person that actually advances out of the group, but we will uh, let you know how uh, Rakesh and Daisy are faring as, as those games uh, go forward. And we'll probably be focusing a little bit more on the Lawrence Kostya matchup. Um, I think it's going to come down um, to the time scrambles, and I, I tend to favor Kostya a little bit more in the time scrambles over Lawrence. Um, so I think if Lawrence wins this match, it's going to be because. He's really taking it to Kostya in the middle game. Lawrence, also the more emotional player. I think his state of mind very dependent on how the match is going. Kostya is, he's in the category of players like Eric Rosen and John Bartholomew. I mean, the guy just like never tilts. It's just not in his blood. 
So I think for Lawrence, winning the first game and getting on the board early has been a godsend in his first two matches, and it's more important than ever right now, uh, as the stakes have not been any higher. Totally agree. Totally agree. So who you got? I'm going to have to go with Lawrence by a smidge just because his form, and I know Greg Shahada is listening and, and, and cringing um, and grimacing as I'm saying this, but it feels like tactically, calculationally, and time management-wise, Lawrence has had the edge thus far. But in terms of strength, these players are very evenly matched. And again, Lawrence going for his Knight C66 setup, which Kostya also played uh, with the black side against Rakesh. Yeah, and I think the question here is whether uh, Kostya will go for d5 or not, and he's not. He's actually going to keep the pawn on d4 for a little while, which in some ways, you know, does kind of justify the knight staying there. But another another way, it just doesn't give Lawrence the position he wants where he gets to chisel away after d5 with c6 eventually. So I kind of respect not going for d5, even though it objectively might be best. Yeah, we saw a similar structure in uh, Kostya's first game against Daisy Corey. It feels like it was ages ago, but in fact, it was just about an hour ago. Kostya had the black side of this position. Here, he's got white. And in general, if black can establish a knight on d4, then he's gotten everything that he wants. And newer players, Kostya, are very tempted to take that knight with the bishop, especially because once the knight drops back to e2, in many situations, white actually, yeah, white wins the pawn on d4, but black gets uncontested control of the dark squares, and generally that constitutes really good compensation for the pawn. Yeah, and it's crazy because I've spent some time looking at positions like this before where you don't want to give up the bishop pair to get rid of that knight. Knight b5 presents itself as a move, actually, and the point is that knight takes b5, c takes e5 just gives white an avenue on the c-line, so I've not a huge fan of the way White has handled this thus far. Um, you, I think you're going to drop the issue back to F2, and you, you're going to try and stabilize. But Black has no desire to close things with F4 anymore, especially with the absence of that light squared bishop. You know this as a King's Indian player, Danya. When that light squared bishop is gone, the attacks typically do not break through because so much of it is based upon this G4 lever. And if the bishop is gone, it doesn't support that. So you can see... Black here's not going to close the center with, uh, or the, the F line with F4. Yeah, instead he plays on the other side. C5 was an excellent move by Lawrence, leading to on Passant, again, that was forced. And then a trade. Now the B file opens. Queen A5. And the great thing about Black's position is that you can essentially play everywhere. You can play on the Queen side. Queen A5 will threaten Queen takes C3 and Knight takes C2. Very commonly missed tactic. Then you could position your F8 rook on D8. So I actually would divorce myself from king side play i would play more in the center and on the queen side if i'm lawrence yeah and again the question will continue to remain do you play f4 or not i i think you can get away with it but the tension here is not you know it's not unadvent not it's not not advantageous for black so you can also play moves like king h8 and kind of tease out the idea of f4 and it's something that white has to constantly mm -hmm. think about lawrence taking his time it is a critical moment he's got it wow Great call, Costa. King h8 on the board. I also and, like the way that the poise with which Lawrence has played has been very impressive. Yeah, and now you might you might consider f4 even more just because you're kind of building up for it, but he's basically being patient. Now, this allows a little bit of a disruption of the hanging pawns. I think you can play e takes f5 and bishop takes d4, and then the e6 square would have been extremely sensitive. I'm not going to demonstrate all that because the moves are coming hot and heavy here, but... I do think there was an opportunity to take on, and I think you have it again. You take on f5, and if g takes f5, you play bishop takes d, uh, d4, and you move over the knight. It's not happening, though, so Kavutsky has other plans. Yeah, h3 was kind of a sloppy move by Kostya. He's weakened the g3 square, and he's really played right into Lawrence's hands. That knight from e7, it went to g8, to f6, and to h5, and I'm getting deja vu. We had this exact situation with the other pawn on c5, the, the pawn that's currently on c5 started out as black's b pawn. Yeah, it, it did. And then it became a c pawn. It might become a d pawn. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Who knows? And then maybe an e pawn if Costa doesn't move his bishop away from e3. Yeah, and then maybe a queen, you know, like, uh, you know, the, you <laughs> know these the days, limit, man. <laughs> yeah, anything can, anything's possible. <laughs> Rags to riches. Yeah. So these dark squares are are like Swiss cheese and F4 is really well timed here basically arguing I have inroads into the, those dark squares um my king on h8 is really perfectly positioned for a pawn storm eventually and trading the dark square bishops I think was super desirable I'm a little surprised oh, yeah. that you lead with the queen and not the bishop 
Any King's Indian player worth their salt. I mean, Bishop F6 there is essentially automatic. Now, Kasti maybe could have dropped his queen back to E1 and prevented that, but then he would have to contort himself very awkwardly. So Lawrence plays it. Uh, you know, the best time to play it was yesterday. Second best time is now. Bishop F6 on the board. And the queen on G5, Kasa, misplaced. oddly enough, is misplaced, right? For newer players, oh, queen on G5. But it's not causing any problems when it operates alone. And it's in the way of the minor pieces. You would love to flip the queen and the bishop <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> here and then play bishop h4. Um, white, on the other hand, needs to get something going on the queen side because there's no prospects for white, uh, at least uh, attacking prospects or counterplay prospects on the on the king side. So you need to look at b4 basically every move. I don't love this exchange because now you're giving black another outpost. So maybe this knight can reposition itself to e5. The bishop might also do that. I feel like it's a, the play's a little bit just disjointed here, although finally there might be a look at B4. Now, this would be a good moment to play A5, Danya. But that bishop on D8, it needs a Fitbit. It's been all over the board. I mean, where did it, it started on G7. Now it's on D8. It could end up on E5. And I agree, B4 is a big problem because Black's pieces are concentrated on the king side. And this often happens when you take your eyes off of the other side of the board, suddenly it opens up and you find yourself unprepared uh, to deal with all the newly opened files. Rook B1 and B4, very professional idea by Kostya. And the tables might be starting to turn if he plays a move like A4. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. A4, A5 start to chisel away on the queen side even further. You do wonder after A4 whether C takes B4 is a possibility. So he takes first and then goes A4. This one ensures that the pawn duo in the center is at least more secure. So. Now this knight's going to come to e5, and I think, you know, again, white is getting some counterplay on the queen side, but black still has their trumps. For sure. And I think Lawrence has done a good job of keeping the b-file stable. Whoa, he bishop takes d4. Take Whoa, what a move. Lateral awareness. Oh, he's got to go for that. You got to play that move. But your eyes are just not looking. It's so much harder to find lateral combinations than it is to find vertical combinations. And Kostya misses it. Bishop takes a5. Oh, and he misses. Oh, queen a5 and bishop d4. And then bishop d4 again. What a tactic. Queen takes a5 and bishop takes d4. Can he find the harder version? This wins oh on the spot. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. This is so instruct, so beautiful, Kasa. Just diagonally, laterally. And he finds he spots it. spots it. And that's a game because the rook on b2 is hanging and the queen on g5 is hanging. So you cannot recapture the bishop on d4. This is just resigns. And look at Lawrence. It, it's such a relatable feeling. Your opponent makes a move and it wasn't on your radar at all. Man. And it's funny because in this format, the, there's no clock, right? So in a typical uh, SEC match, you know, outside of the group stage, you'd be here trying to get to the next game probably instead of sitting here realizing the damage you've wrought your position. Okay, so Bishop takes B2. And the most depressing thing, Black doesn't have a single shred of kingside counterplay. And the telling thing, Casa, we pointed out that the queen on G5 was misplaced. That queen oh. actually loses Black the game. The fact that it is on G5 is what caused this tactic to work. Yeah, and again, look at this battery here. You're a piece up with a nasty battery. Even if if you took this bishop and threw it off the board, you'd still like you'd still like white by a wide margin. And now with the extra piece and this pressure, it's going to be a wrap. Yeah, rook d5 is essentially a pre-move. White's pieces are just perfectly placed to control all of the important squares. Queen g3 check is a completely harmless check. King h1. Lawrence is going to give it, and he's going to resign afterward. Yeah, I personally would have gone king h1 first just to not even allow the check. Um, but yeah, now bishop a1 just maintaining more pressure or taking on a3. Because I think actually if bishop a1, Lawrence will probably go rook b8 and still entertain one last threat. Yeah, and there's perpetual ideas with queen e1 and queen g3. But even if black is allowed to do that, white's king will hide on g1 and then cover with bishop f1. So Costa doing a great job taking his time, just eliminating the pawn. That's the simplest approach. Yeah, can't be mad at it. And then the bishop will just come back to b2 and, you know, there'll still be the same problems as there was uh, in the in the previous position. So, yeah. Bishop I mean, back? Yeah, you could, you could even take on e5 and then play bishop c1 and block. But honestly, bishop b2 is just way more natural. Oh, yeah, rook takes e5 works. Rook b1, bishop c1. Okay, back to d1, also good. 
just rook d1 very professional move just uh not allowing any counterplay or piece up and uh again just salting away the game now yeah i think i've been saying this for the past like 10 moves but here i think trent will finally resign after bishop b2 Meanwhile, in the other game, just while we have a moment, Daisy is really pressing Rakesh right now and has a dominant B pawn, and it looks like she's well on, on her way to escorting that to the B8 square, so like her chances there. But Kostya has won the first game in a real turnaround, frankly. I mean, Lawrence got as good a position as you can ask for in these King's Indian-style structures and just didn't prosecute the advantage um, the way he, he probably could have. But no matter how you slice it, when push comes to shove, most blitz games of any time control are decided by tactical blunders. They're decided by two or three movers, and the player who's more sharp over the course of the match tends to win the game. Yeah, Lawrence played great positionally. He got the right opening, but all of that is water under the bridge. E5, if In the E5. critical moment, you miss a tactic. So I just had to point that I have to go back for a quick second because there's so many of these positions where... Uh, where, where you know, white kind of willingly very quickly plays for g3 and a lot of times e5 is actually super strong i've seen a lot of position with e5 knight takes e6 and even d takes c6 as a viable option you could also take with the b pawn but there's so many positions where you rush to play g3 and if you take on c6 the bishop is just blunted on the diagonal so i felt mm -hmm. e5 is a must there but all right let me get shift back to the game uh where you have a totally different position on the board um who's better and why here danya um, usually you get this type of structure either with white's C pawn already on C4 or w with white's E pawn on E4, which is more likely here. If black is allowed to play D6, the queen on D4 becomes really misplaced. I don't like the pawn on H3 either. It's going to be hanging uh, after black plays D6. So I like Kostya's <laughs> position. G4 by Trent. And I'm not yeah. sure who the trend of the game favors. Shall I say the Trent of the game? <laughs> of the game? Yeah, G4 is a, is definitely a, a a move that comes with tempo. Um, but in the long term, you wonder if the the king side is going to be a little bit exposed with that move. Now, H5 might be a possibility later. Even some sacrifice on G4 might be a possibility. So, interesting choice. Um, also, this queen on D4 in the line of fire. Now, um, you're going to have to consider moving it on. You know, one of the next few moves. You know what's crazy? Actually, how do you like this? Danya, bishop e1 and then f4 <laughs> like oh. there's some dynamic there where the, there might be some some type of winning of a piece because of uh okay it's a little bit too fanciful though so queen that's e3 that's a sick idea that's a sick idea though i like it a lot queen e3 hits e7 um uh do you defend it do you play for activity tough to say um i probably play for activity here but i think it'd be also very natural to go rook e8 yeah i mean e7 is hanging and it will be captured so rook e8, maybe e6 and d5. Of course, you're keeping a close eye on the queen on h4. Bishop b1 still very much uh, in the cards. Uh, bishop b1 bishop here. Bishop b1. It's, you have no just defense winning. to f4. Oh my god. What is Lawrence doing? g5 first. But that gives the queen the lateral escape. Knight h5, and I think black is going to weasel out of it after f4. Although there's still queen threats. Queen c4. Knight, queen c4. C4. knight c4. Knight c7 is a threat. Knight e7, not quite a threat, but this knight c7 move is extremely annoying. And I think black has to just punt on the exchange and go for a move like d6. Okay, yeah. Queen c4, there's actually b3. Yeah, costing huge trouble here. He just wasn't able to get his queen side out. Bishop d4 is his choice. Okay. This is Reasonable such a weird move. position. Can you take on e7? Like, it... I'd probably play queen f3, but I'm just wondering if knight takes e7, oh. king f8, and then can you... B knight g6. And then bishop, a bishop b4. Although it's still black plays fg and king f7, bishop d5, rook dude, e6. Dude, dude, dude. Total pandemonium. Danya, knight takes e7, king f8, and bishop b4 without moving the queen, oh! and you have knight g6 okay. check. Oh, double check, and you pick up the queen. That's incredible. You should totally show I have show to show that. that. Yeah, knight takes e7, king f8, and now not moving the queen, bishop b4, and you have this tactic with after bishop takes e3, knight takes g6, check. And that is a double discovery, folks. And you just pick up h4 with interest. <laughs> Incredible. Right, queen f3 new... was played much more natural. For newer players there, knight takes g6. Why was that important? Because it's a double check. That means the king has to move by definition. When a check comes from two different sources, mathematically, you can't block both checks at the same time. That's why a double check is the most effective form of a discovery. Okay, that ship has sailed. And the position actually going to stabilize if and when 
Costa trades queens. I, I don't see a different move. And I like white here. I mean, this knight d5 is a menace to society. You're never going to play e6 because knight f6 check is a huge problem. And I mean, there's just this knight is just an unassailable piece. And the question is, how does black develop uh, their final pieces? Because if you go b6, you open up the diagonal to your rook. You go d6, you take away the square c7 from the defense of the bishop on e5. So really hard practically to navigate this position. Yeah, the, the depressing thing, if you're Kavutsky, is that you navigated the middle game, you walked the tightrope, you didn't lose your queen, and as a result, what is your reward? Your reward is like a terrible endgame. What's funny is if black actually does play e6, after knight f6 check and the trade on f6, the knight on g7 is literally trapped. That's a pretty rare type oh of trapped goodness. piece. I mean, that pawn on g4, as Mr. Hess would point out, it's two squares away from the knight. That means it's completely restricting the knight's forward motion. Yeah, look at that geometry there. It's a wonderful geometry, just dominating the knight on g7. And look at the expansion. The expansion here on the on this in the center and the king side is just so real. And again, none of these pawns can move conveniently without massive concessions. And that's basically what the boots on the ground are telling us. All right, b4 here, a4 here. I just taking more space seems really attractive from White's perspective. But to take the devil's advocate perspective, okay, if you give black a couple of moves, bishop to b7, maybe rook on b to c8, knight from g7 can eventually go to e6. Black's position is going to be miserable for the foreseeable future, but if Kostya can start consolidating, psychologically, there might be a sense in which Lawrence hasn't squeezed, you know, the most juice out of the position. And I think Kostya feels better than he did about 10 moves ago. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's like having a dream that maybe will come true one day, right? Maybe one day these pieces will all come out and things will be rosy, but I don't know if that day is today. Yeah, and b5, I think, is forced to... No, but you might lose the bishop anyway. Yeah, no, this is this is horrible. This is yeah, torturous. If, if, if b5, b4, and then the bishop has to go back to a7, and then rook a1 again, oh. it's just basically trapping the bishop with a full board of pieces. B4 Bishop here is a must, I think, right? Why not? Bishop B4. I think the just oh. justification, Danya, is Bishop takes D5. And E6. This is actually fantastic tactical awareness by Kasi. He's been defending so creatively here. Uh, Lawrence should probably go for that, but it's so... I mean, for White, you really just want to seize that Bishop on C5 and win on the spot, but you can't get impatient here if you're Lawrence. You have to squeeze the position and play according to objective values. And you see Kostya blitzing out those moves um again the the problem though and the reason this is still a really bad position is this knight on g7 is just entombed so i think you have to try d6 yet yeah, you have to try to find a way to get this knight going um okay mm. bishop d4 now that you can kind of shake the tree a little bit maybe rook, rook d8 knight d8 knight d8 exactly and costa is he is defend this is textbook defense rook a1 still unpleasant the rook squeezing into a7 and, man, how long is Costa going to have to wallow in misery here on the back ranks? Knight c7 with tempo? Knight c7, knight b5 with tempo? Or d, e, f, e, bishop takes b4 as a possibility. He goes bishop g7, giving up b6 with tempo. Yeah, not ideal. This b pawn now will be the strongest pawn on the board if the b6 pawn comes off. And this is unpleasant again, because if you go rook c8, you could take on d6 and play bishop a7. All right. But now, but now knight c7, knight b5. And suddenly, yeah. once the knight gets into the action, we've talked about it. That is the deciding factor. Black is probably not even worse after knight b5 because suddenly it's white's queen side that starts to collapse. And e5 is going to be a massive, massive weakness. So, yeah, I like black all of a sudden. And this has been, as you mentioned before, a textbook uh, example of good defense over a sustained period of time. And man, if Lawrence doesn't win this game, this will be such a psychological blow. And it's sort of an incredulous smile. Like, really? Is this what I've got after that opening and middle game? And the kingside pawns also cost a G4 and G5. Long term in some bishop end game, that's going to be another liability that White's going to have to deal with. I would almost take black here. Yeah, if I had to give chances to both sides here, I'd give black like 70% chance to win. Um, just because the time is really becoming an issue. Again, Kosh is now up 30 to 40 seconds, and there's weaknesses galore. Um, honestly, it's hard to suggest ways to defend. I think you probably 
punt on c3 and you know try to make the b pawn your pride and joy but um the point would be after knight c3 you can go rook c1 and try to pin back although there's tactics with the king on h2 oh so but knight c3 here i think ah oh, rook c4 and rook takes c3 oh huh. that's a lovely idea and he spots it Kostya has been a god, a defensive god in this in this game. Rook c4, he spots it. And Lawrence can't believe it. Bishop Rook takes c3. Rook c3. I told Black is playing for a win. I told you the tactics. The, the king on h2 is going to be a problem. spotted it instantly. And is Black winning? Is Kostya is also going to pick up g5. I think Black is winning. Black is totally winning. You can you can nestle the bishop on, on e3 or b6. You're going to be able to take the pawn. No, 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 no. Kostya should have won the g5 pawn when he had a chance. Oh, yeah, now he, he now he doesn't have the opportunity, and the problem is this bishop can always go to e8. Bishop a5, bishop d2, he'll win it again. Bishop d2, b6, though. Which is why, bishop d2, Lawrence giving up g5. But the problem is, again, there'll be this bishop e8 idea, right? So now with the pawn on b7, I think you will be able no, to mop but up. The other thing is, it's the, it's the wrong color corner, isn't it? I would play... Can you play king e7? Maybe not. He goes h5. Bishop e8! Oh, what a move! No, but, but does I think it work? You, I think h4. You, I think you can just play... You could take on g4 and then go g3. And why can't this, stop the pawn? Are you serious? This king is too far away. Bishop h4. What was that? Bishop takes f7 as a draw now. King takes e8! Oh, no. King takes e8! It's not even close. What is Costa thinking of? King e8 game over. Well, he's worried about this h-pawn, right? This bishop will control this one, and he's just making sure the king can control h8. King e8, h6, king f8. It's over. It's Lawrence forgot the that the bishop is hanging. Yeah. Unbelievable. Costa will win this game, and deservedly so. Yeah. All right, or now you just he? play bishop g3 check to push the king back. Um, this also works. You're just going to have an extra pawn. Bishop g3 check, and uh, you'll still maintain the e-pawn, and that'll be enough to win even after a trade of f and g. Just don't go king g7, because if king steps no! back to f4 and black king loses! F4? He, got, he got swindled! King g4, he got swindled! King f5! Oh my goodness! The trips up on the last roadblock! The but why wouldn't you? Last one. Why wouldn't you just insist on controlling the square? Why would you even tease it out at all? No, that was unthink. I I jinxed him, and he had the time to figure it out too. He rushed. The one moment in this entire game where he rushed was the losing moment. And past bonds, they're dangerous. Man, what? A, and that is the swindle that Lawrence needed. Now, for me, if I was white here, I'd just have all my pieces on light squares the whole time. There'd How be do you no win this? reason. <laughs> you bring your king to c8. Bring the king to c8. I'd have it all... Oh, okay, this also works. I would not put a single white piece on, on a dark square. Why? Why? No, do not, do not even give the opportunity for check. I cannot get past. I mean, the, the easiest defensive task of the entire game was what Costa needed to cross, and that was where he slipped up. That is the irony. That is the heartbreak of chess. You do all of the hard things, and... All of that effort nullified in the span of a millisecond, Casa. Who hasn't been through that pain? Yeah, it's it's brutal. I, I've I've actually been there in a classical game where you're like you're you're just miss a, you're controlling a square for a long time, then you miss a detail. It's brutal, and chess chess is hard. It can humble you quickly. And the challenge is you kind of almost have to be like a field goal kicker and just move on to the next kick as soon as possible. Yeah, I mean the the. When it happens in a classical game after four or five hours, that is why people describe the pain of uh, losing a classical game like this as unspeakable. Like you just, the feeling that that entire effort has gone to waste cannot be put into words. But even in a blitz game in the confines of an important match like this, you have to move past it if you're Costa. You have to say, listen, yeah, these blunders happen. I still defended like a monster and I'm going to take confidence at least from that. For sure. And we're back in something resembling a king's indian structure um the knight's coming to h5 f5 is a possibility um at some point later on this knight also can come to f4 and white is a decision to make about how to deal with this potential knight to f4 you can ignore it you can allow it you can prevent it with g3 um there's all types of concepts here but i think now this knight is going to get into f4 and it's annoying to deal with because it also hits g2 
Yeah, good position. Good position for Lawrence. He's kind of gotten what he wants out of the opening. Another one of these King's Indian structures. But obviously, Kostya uh, is not just going to sleep. He's going to try to orchestrate counterplay on the queen side and maybe stick a bishop on b6 and a knight on c4. And suddenly, d6 is hanging and the queen's almost going to be trapped. Yeah, it's 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 a really, really weird position because both sides have their trumps. White has definitely gotten some, made some in, inroads and is a little bit more entrenched on the queen side. Black has some targets to work with, in particular because h3 was played, and again, this light scored bishop is still on the board for black. There are hook possibilities all around, and I would not be surprised if g5, even inviting the queen into the party, uh, would, would happen pretty much immediately. Man, I'm just glad that there aren't, you know, men in suits walking around Lawrence's apartment like last time, uh, because back then he forgot to pay his Trent. <laughs> but I think this time he's taken care of it, and he's taken care of business in the previous game. It's 1-1, folks. This is the deciding match. The winner of this match will take Group D. Man, the nerves. Handling the nerves. And G5 played. Lawrence. Wow. Again, Knight takes G5. Looks very natural. Free pawn, but then Queen G6 where you're attacking the knight, you're also staring down mate. Black has excellent attacking chances here. This is a King's Indian dream. Kostya has nothing going on the other side. That bishop on b6, it looks pretty, but it's not actually creating any threats, and Black's pieces are flowing in so naturally. Queen g6 and g4, and White could get checkmated here really, really fast. Yeah, and I love the decision to not take the d5 pawn. It has been hanging the last few moves, but it gives white some counterplay against the king on g8. So you say, you know what? I don't even want to open up the bishop. I'm not being materialistic here. I'm trying to actually checkmate, and so we're going to keep the d file and this diagonal closed. But don't go g4 prematurely. I mean, maybe g4 is good, but you have to reckon with knight h4. I actually like uh, Kostya's last move from a defensive standpoint. I would play bishop f6 if I were Lawrence to prepare g4. Instead, he goes bishop e4. Weird looking move, but I guess it's effective. Yeah, maybe. Again, he's he's almost looking at the d5 pawn again. I wouldn't even really worry about the d5 pawn. I'd be more concerned about getting this rook in the game, rook c8. We've seen so many kings Indians where you're attacking on the, on the king side, but then there's a tactic on the queen side that just ultimately upsets the apple cart. He's going to elect to double the rooks instead. And an exchange sack by Kostya. Yeah, but you can't take on g5. That's the point because of mate on g2. Now Lawrence can't fall asleep. Knight takes g5 is now a threat. So queen back to g6 and you're just up an exchange. I mean, there, there's no comp. And black continues to attack. That's the worst part about it. Yeah, the question is actually if he could have started with bishop f1 and then he would have had that tactic if it would have been found or noticed by Lawrence. Who knows? This knight h2 is really bad. e4 is definitely on the in the cards just moving and removing the knight on f3 and there's going to be some breakthrough on f2 and so e4 here i don't know if it's the best timing but it makes sense there's going to be some sacrifice somewhere somehow and again lawrence has left himself with enough time to figure it out he's got over half of his time still on the clock and yeah. there's e4 knight the e4. wheels are turning is queen takes d5 just hanging stuff because the rook on yeah. b7 is unprotected um, there's some, uh, ideas looking at G2 later. Uh, Knight H3, wow, wow. I mean, I saw this, but I, I was struggling to find a follow-up in this position, because Bishop E5 is almost made, but White actually has this move Bishop to G2. You can play Queen takes F1 and liquidate into an endgame, but that endgame is actually far from convincing, uh, because White has that two-on-one -on, on the Queen side that he can convert into an extra pawn really quickly, uh, into a fast sure. pawn really quickly. So, Lawrence, I think that this might be an impractical move, actually. E3, okay, probably still winning. Yeah, E3 is really nasty because now you you freeze the knight on D4. Like, if you think about something like knight E2, maybe E2 actually works. Uh, or bishop E5 again. So, queen takes F1 is mate. Oh, rook G1, rook, rook uh, F2, rook G1 at the end. We have to show that if that doesn't happen. He's calculating it. And he does it! Brilliant, brilliant decision. It's just made in two. Wow. Wow. Beautiful. Really? Oh, he Bishop E5! One. But now it's, he's got made on the next it's move. It's going to be made on the next move. <laughs> wow. 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 I, I got a golf clap for that one. That was, that was pretty. That was, that was, that was beautiful. What um, a crazy turnaround to this match, Costa, because if... Costa had won the second five-minute game. We, it would have been 2-0 in his favor. Now it's 2-1 in Lawrence's favor. 
And when the time control shrinks, I think Lawrence starts feeling more confident because of his tactical style. Hey, when you have games like the one you just played, you start to feel yourself. I mean, it's only natural. Um, sure. I'm a little bit surprised with, again, this transition to potential queen trade. I don't think this plays to Lawrence's strengths at all. And so I feel like he would have done well to keep some dynamism in the position. These end games actually tend to be just fine for black. You, you play f6. At some point, you play c6. You put the king on c7. And you just have a really good footing in the center, and particularly because you control the business squares. Bishop d6 I don't like, though. Yeah, because now you can't play c6. I mean, newer players tend to put too much stock into the fact that black has lost castling rights. And with queens on the board, yeah, that's super important. It can be important even in this queenless middle game. And it is important now because c6 is impossible. Bishop c5, knight b5. I think Costa is ignoring the pressure on the d file and it's going to cost you. Again, knight b5 here, uh, is, or knight e4, just challenging this bishop on d6 makes a whole lot of sense um, because you can't, you know, Knight negate the pen easily. Yeah, even now, knight e4, it's, you still have this problem where the d6 bishop doesn't have many great squares. And if you try to move it off of this line, there's knight c5. Yeah, bishop c5 maybe also to clear the path for the knight. There's Costa some tactics on b7. On tactics on b7 too, right? If bishop if bishop c5 takes, takes, knight takes c5, b7 is just hanging. It's completely winning for white. Very, very unpleasant position. Very quickly, uh, Daisy Corey in the other match. Uh, she leads with a score of 2-1. to one. It was 1-1. One, one, and in the previous game, she was completely lost. She was down in exchange with no time on the clock. And Rakesh blundered checkmate. So he is trying to recover. He's got the white pieces in a really complicated perk. So uh, we will keep an eye on the score of that match. But obviously, uh, our main focus is still on the deciding matchup between Lawrence and Kostya. Yeah, and... Right now, I mean, it, you just you can't hold down the fort on d6. So it's like, what do you do? I think the the, the lesser evil is honestly to play something like rook d8 and just try to, to overprotect d6. But doesn't feel good to me. And already, Lawrence, a minute up on the clock. You have to go rook d8. You cannot afford to trade on c5. That loses on the spot. Rook d8, rook d2. I agree, Casa. White's position is so easy to play here. You're controlling all of the important squares. Wow, rook d2 Bishop is not H3. a move I appreciated. That that. So you're saying just keep the tension and double. And yeah, that would have made a ton of sense. Bishop h3 now diverts the bishop from b7. You wonder if there's some counterplay now. Ooh, that's another terrible arrow by me. I have to get better at this. <laughs> um, but there, you, you do have to wonder now if like diverting the bishop from the diagonal made sense given the pressure on b7. But I don't see a defense for Kavutsky because the what is the actual threat for White? The threat is Bishop takes d6, then Bishop takes f5, and then Knight takes d6 with a fork. So White's going to end up winning a pawn. That's going to be the result of all of this brouhaha. White's going to take twice on d6. And now the conversion begins. Can Lawrence cash this extra pawn into a full point? The reason I think this is actually not the end of the world is just Black is pretty solid on the king side, and the extra pawn... I mean, it's an extra pawn, of course, but maybe it lends itself to some activity for black with the king or the rook or something. And e3 now weakens some square. So I, I'm actually not so confident this was the best way, although, of course, you have to like white. Yeah, I know. I agree that black's got good practical chances here. One of the issues is going to be that white controls the d-file, so avoiding a rook trade is going to be very hard for black. Now, even after the rooks are traded... It's not like the game ends immediately, but typically night end games can be sometimes the easiest ones where to convert a material advantage in. Yeah, some folks say night end games are pawn end games, and and for the most part, it tends to be true. Now you could see here, wow. Okay, so the night trade happens, and but the rook end games are not pawn end games. Rook end games are a litany of them where you're pawn down and you hold it. And frankly, blacks space on the king side does distract white a little bit, and so that's kind of what why this is not, you know, totally over. I think f4 would make a lot of sense here. Just gum up the works, fix the g6 pawn as a weakness. Don't allow more activity with g5. Yeah, Lawrence slowing down, which is a great decision. He senses that if Costa develops counterplay on the king side, that might lead to a forced draw. Great awareness by Lawrence, but why give up e3? Why? He could have just gone and king Cost d2 first, and now he gets it. Wow. Missed opportunity for Kavutsky. Now the king gets fully active. b3 and c4 is in the cards. Should be a win now for white. Yeah, and you, you're going to play b3. You're going to break through. You're going to establish a protected passer. 
and eventually there's just going to be some type some form of distraction whether it's rook a1 hitting a6 or rook d1 and infiltrating on the d file rook g5 is not a place for the rook that rook is no. going to come back Why? shortly it what is no the sense. point of that the rook is attacking the same pawn from g1 that it is from g5 what is he doing rook d6 bring the rook just back just go c4 bring the rook back to g1 that's where it should, belongs anyway this is a little puzzling i must say and yeah, rook e6, rook g1, rook a1. And 13 Finally. seconds now for Kostya. Can he hold this one together? Can he pull out a draw? So the king probably should go to e2, where it's it's kind of secure from treks. And then the rook is free to roam. This You bring the rook back and then put the king on e2. And then all your pawns are secure and you <laughs> could start to Lawrence, attack the target. Lauren's doing everything to not win this game. I mean, rook g1, rook a1, c5. If you just create any intrigue in the position, I think Kostya's not going to have enough time to deal with it. Okay, rook e1. This I can get behind. King d3 and rook a1. Bring the king over. Good. And then or you e4. have... Or e4. Rook d1. All right, this is also fine. Will he play c5? Why does he keep going king d4? I'm worried about a repetition, Danya. You know, you know how this happens, right? They they repeat a few times, and then the computer just stops the game. Uh, this ha feels like that because the rook's not coming to d1. And uh, he's going to have to go c5, I think, to prevent a repetition. And I feel like he's kind of losing hope in his winning chances here. I would go c5, king d3, and then prepare the e3, e4 pawn break... But instead, he keeps shuffling his king and his rook. I think he's concerned that after c5, he doesn't have any active, like, winning plan anymore. And he does. So, again, king e2. No, rook e4 check. Again. Rook king e4 d5, check. though. There you go, king d5. But no, now but then, king d5, rook takes e3. Rook takes e3, yeah. Okay. Rook g2, rook e4, king d5. Just go forward, and Costa has three seconds here. But he's guarding, he's defending. Yeah, this is a tricky conversion now. King I, I, c6. King d6. Bring your king. Bring your king. Use use the use it as a, this pawn as an umbrella for your own king, and that should be Capablanca style enough to win, right? Exactly. King d6, c6, and then the king could have hit on b6. Lawrence is he still can do it, but it's not as convenient now because the b pawn. Oh my gosh! And rook g8, c6. Rook g8, c6 is winning. Yep, a hundred. He's got to see that. That that is really basic stuff. And he spots it. And then c7, and you cannot prevent a queen. Yeah, c7, okay. and obviously white is close enough to the pawns. Great stuff toward the end there by Lawrence. Just too low on time was Kostya. All right, can we breathe for a second? It's not even over yet. I don't feel like I can breathe. <laughs> <laughs> not um, after that bishop game. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Wow. Wow. No need to pre-move here either, uh, by the way, if you're white. I mean, you, you're up... A ridiculous amount of material. You have 30 seconds, and yeah, okay, he wins the game. So Lawrence now has a three to one lead. Kavutsky is in winner go home territory now. To extend this match, he has to get a W in the next game, and uh, we'll see. And speaking of Ws, Daisy got another W in her match. She is up three to one on the cusp of winning her match, but Rakesh is fighting. Uh, with some really good defense in their first bullet game. So we're going to go to the bird's eye view briefly. And we see Lawrence Trent knocking on the door. All he needs is a draw. But bullet is one of Costa's best time controls. Yeah, and I thought after queen d2, there might have been a castle's long dynamic. But now after a4, I'm not so sure. Um, now it seems more logical to play bishop b2 in castles because it'd be much easier to pry open the queen side. So, all right, knight a6. Okay, Aiming at b4 and c5. The a4 now makes b4 a little bit soft. Um, knight b5. I love this move. Defending the knight again so that exchange sacrifice with rooks take c3 are well met by knight take c3. Um, really like that decision. And now uh, a7 hangs. And you could capture it, but there is an exchange sack on c3. Lawrence doesn't go for it. He's just I, a full pawn down. Yeah. And by the way, folks, this is bullet. So let's be let's be real about how difficult it is to play super precisely and whether that even matters in this time control um, Rakesh, okay. Rakesh won on demand and he needs one more victory to force overtime in that match 
Yeah, and, and this one, white is still uh, uh, you know, pulling up, although the structure's been mangled a little bit. So black's going to have Beno uh, not Benoni, excuse me, Benko-style counterplay. We mentioned this before. Knight to c5 would have been a nice avenue in. Maybe worried about bishop takes c5. Yeah, I thought rook dc8 was more flexible because the knight could have jumped to c5. You might even get the knight back, back to d7. Good call by Lawrence. Knight c5. And knight b3 is a very nasty threat. d3 is also hanging. And I'm starting to get really worried for Costa's position here. I don't see a move. And the problem is if you take on C5 like before, after Rook takes C5, the edifice will collapse. All these pawns eventually are will just drop because this bishop on G7 can capture on C3 pretty much whenever you want. And then you can see all the pawns will be isolated and weakened. You start with the A pawn. And he's won the pawn back. This is almost unlosable. I would just take the knight, take the pawn on D5, make the draw, win the match... All that will save Costa right now is a full-on Rook blunder. Yeah, and the time is not helping either. Yeah, a and Rook that's trade. It. That's, that's it. it. Wow, the, what poise by Lawrence. And the reason we're saying that's it is because you're just a pawn up in a winning Rook endgame. And so, uh, King Pawn endgame, excuse me. So, yeah, that's this is just clear as day. You, no need to pre-move either. And I'm almost looking at the other match. Yeah, here, all you need to do is just get the King to D4. Actually, Lawrence is going to win this game. We're not even talking about a draw. Okay. And there wow. we go. Lawrence Trent has won the group. What a performance all around. Yeah, he had he got lucky at certain moments, but you know what they say, good players are always lucky. Yeah, and we see the smile on his face because you know, he does want to do well in this event. He does want to win in advance. And now uh, you know, Greg Shahadi might have to contend with him at some point, which uh mm -hmm. you know, he clearly didn't want to, uh, based upon <laughs> what he's saying in the chat. Indeed of it. Lawrence Strat all smiles. It was up and down at certain moments, but at the end of the day, he was such a good all around player today. Tactics, opening preparation, his time management was superb. And he wins the match 4-1. to one. The other match is still going. Daisy trying to hold an equal endgame to take her match and to take a victory. Looks like she is very close to doing that. But yeah, there it and, is. And Yeah, and let's not also forget, there was a huge turning point. I saw notice someone in chat mentioned this as well. That game 2, where Kostya could have controlled B, the, the, the queening square B8, and all of a sudden it was not the case, it was a huge turning point in the match. It, it made it... Went from 2-0 to 1-all. It was huge. It was absolutely huge. And here we have the final game between Daisy Corey and Rakesh. Rakesh has to win on demand in order to keep this match going. That'll force an Armageddon game. But he needs Daisy to blunder her queen. That's the only way that White is generating any winning chances. Oh, and now he's lost a pawn. Yeah, and the, again, it's, it's not losing for White here because Black's King is also exposed, but... Um, you know, a draw does result in match victory for Daisy. So, um, yeah, so Rakesh is going to play on and try and generate some chances, and uh, he's justified in doing so. For sure. He's repeating the position to gain some time, but it's one of those things where as long as Black keeps her queen on protected squares, there is no universe in which a queen trade favors white. Unless the king can... Okay, queen b5, queen a5, and now it's over. Yeah, I think before King B4, if you threw in C4 first, there was some opportunity um, to maybe bring the queen up towards the, the queen side. But Wait, King uh, F8? I don't know why Daisy's playing for a win here. This makes no sense, but she is probably going to win this game. Um, are ratings ref impacted by these by these games? Maybe they are. Um, and if that's the case, maybe that's why. Uh, you know, it's just a win's better than a draw. Uh, yeah, I mean, at this point, it's purely cosmetic, but, you know, it's a queen endgame. Anything can happen. Queen b8 and queen queen h1. It's not over. Queen d5. Now it's over. Yeah, and now we're going to take on c5 with check and then defend f7 and then start marching. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, a4, queen b4, queen b5. Queen d6, still, but okay, maybe some perpetual check. Yeah, but no. I don't. I honestly don't think uh, it's been realized that the that a half point is enough. Oh, don't get yourself made. Queen a8. Oh my <laughs> goodness. <laughs> Little bit scary. Yeah. And you can see here just from this game how tricky queen end games are because there's so many checks. 
I mean, Black literally is, uh, this position is the definition of unlosable. But if Daisy keeps getting her king to these danger zones, if she loses the A pawn, then we start talking again. Yeah, then the king pawn endgames, the king being far from the king side pawns, um, yeah, becomes a thing. But it's almost as if she's the one in a must-win situation here. Yeah, and again, I think sometimes you're just in the heat of the moment. You don't even know what the score is. You just know you, you want to do the best in that game. And now it's almost a sundial situation. Oh, my gosh. Can she go to E2 and F2? She's going to F3. F5? All right, Let's there has to be mate. some queen trade now. Or mate, yeah. yeah. This is mate on G2, and Daisy takes the final game. She wins the match, and she scores her first victory of Group D. Unfortunately, Chess.com's own Rakesh will end up winless, but he had some great moments as well. He put up great fights in all three of his matches. But the story of the day, Mr. Trent was unstoppable. Yeah, and uh, I mean, it was just impressive. I mean, especially the resourcefulness and trouble, the, the trickiness of that game too. Um, I think overall, Kasha was probably playing the better chess in, in, to a point, but then that final match, Lawrence asserted himself. He absolutely did. It could have gone either way. And it was a heartbreaking moment in game two for Kostya. But all credit to Lawrence. We will have both of these players, both Lawrence and Kostya will join us for an interview. So don't go anywhere. The I Am Not A GM SEC returns with the interviews in just a couple of moments. My name is Elwood Dawson. I'm from Chicago. I'm Seeker Blackman. My name is Roberto Beza, Jr. And what I want to share is I love tacos. Tacos and chess. So, yeah. With the chess program, really, even chess in general, like on the deck, you, uh, you kind of lose yourself. You don't really think about your case. You learn to think differently. You know, you strategize more. I sometimes come out uh, 7.30 in the morning, I'll probably play until lockup, you know, so it makes my day go by faster. It's competitive, it's a lot of trash talk, it's, it's, it's crazy, you know, like the chess players, we got our own little circle, you know, and all of us play each other, we talk trash about who be who, who garbage. Yeah, I never play that dude again, he garbage, I never play him, but yeah, it's real competitive. Looking for a new way to learn chess? Meet Dr. Wolf, the ideal chess coach and companion. Play against Dr. Wolf as he explains everything step by step, points out strategic ideas, and alerts you to your mistakes. Train with him and go over your past mistakes until you master them. Choose from over 35 lessons created for all skill levels. No matter your level, everyone could use a coach. Download Learn Chess with Dr. Wolf for Android or iOS devices today.
Welcome back to the I Am Not a GM Speed Chess Championship. We have Group D winner Lauren Strent and his opponent in the final round, Kostik Kavutsky, who just played an incredible match here for a quick interview. Lawrence, I'll start with you. Congratulations on your victory. Could you tell us what the keys to the kingdom were for you today? What are you most proudest of uh, in your performance as you won Group D? Well, a bit like my hairline, my performance got progressively worse as the uh, as the uh, day went on. Um, and of course, the turning point was against uh, Costa in that second game where I must have been dead lost. Um, I just I was doing very well. I felt like I had this knight on d5 and I was controlling everything. And Costa just found these resources. The knight came to e8, c7, b5. And suddenly I realized I completely messed it up. And then he found this brilliant uh, knight takes c3, rook takes c3, bishop takes e5, and now I'm worse in an ending. And if I draw, I'm thinking, oh my goodness, if I draw this, I'm lucky. And then I know I'm just completely toast. And then I just, he just blunders this horrible uh, e5 move where there must have been a win there. And, and once that happened, that was, that was the big uh, game changer. And after that, I felt like I had pretty much everything under control. The following games, I don't recall being in trouble but yeah it's very difficult to come back from uh from a loss like that because had he won that he'd be up 2-0 and massive favorite to win and with all the momentum so kind of hard luck for Kostya there uh but it was a mighty fun final in fact all of my matches were incredibly enjoyable so kudos to all of my opponents um but I think my score doesn't is a bit flattering I think I've got eight points lost one but that by no means is uh, is a kind of accurate reflection of my of my play. It was a, it was a lot closer, and uh, on another day, Kostya wins this tournament. Yeah, Kostya, we we were singing your praises throughout the event, and particularly you played really a, a ton of great games. You're up on time a lot. You were flexing. And this you're not you've not been a stranger to this format. So, what was your experience playing through this? group stage though that was a bit different than the the typical uh scc uh i am not a gm scc format yeah thanks actually i, I really enjoyed the the group format i think it's uh super fun sometimes in these um in these brackets you know you have these like huge lopsided matches that are kind of like over halfway through so it's fun you have like these short matches and that's very very competitive very fierce like every match is like it feels like it's brutal and uh, and you have to like you basically have to beat everybody to uh, to get through. So it's like the winner is very much uh, very much deserved. Yeah. And quick question for you: You definitely you know you had a tough match against Lawrence. It, it really could have gone either way at some point. And there was that swing game in game two. Um, I'm gonna two questions here. One is, do you do you feel like that was really the turning point, or was do you feel like there was an opportunity later that could have shifted things? And then second question, who do you have winning the event now? It's <laughs> a great question. Um, yeah, so definitely game two was was, was brutal, and um, yeah, that was that was just a big a big choke uh, on my end. Um, I do want to say though, I felt like Lawrence was outplaying me like basically every game. It's just I got lucky with like some tactics that he missed, and that allowed me to to get back into it. Um, but yeah, the problem was in that game too. It's like I realized immediately how I could have won that position, and I was trying very very hard to forget about it during the match because I, I okay still won one like everything to play for. Um, but yeah, that was definitely in the back of my my mind. Um, in terms of who's going to win the event. I mean, okay, I'm friends with everyone in the field except uh, Polina, so I'll take her. <laughs> she, she's super strong. Uh, but, of course, I, I would like to wish Lawrence the, the best of luck. If he wins the event, then I, I'd be very happy to see that. Well, Polina faces none other than Lawrence Trent in the next round. Lawrence, uh, what do you know about Polina, and what are your overall thoughts going into that match? Well, I mean, she's a better chess player than me, which is a big issue going into the match. But, um, you know, I think my style is going to be problematic for her. Uh, so I'm going to keep true, uh, mix it up, uh, play some unusual stuff. 
And uh, I think one thing I did really well today was my uh, my clock management. Um, I think I was ahead on the clock in pretty much uh, nearly every game. And I was, uh, I, I think that was a big factor. So just play confidently, quickly, uh, keep it messy. Um, and then I've got a chance against Polina. If I get to... Uh, if I get too technical with her, she's just going to beat me. So it's going to be an exciting match. Um, and, you know, I'm going to go in there, you know, with a smile on my face because the truth is uh, a few minutes ago, I didn't think I'd be here talking about me winning. I thought uh, once game two had gone, um, it was it was very unlikely. So I'm, I'm, I'm lucky to uh, lucky to go to the next round. Well, we have one last chat question before we let you go. It's to Lawrence from Max Mlinek. Will Trent Osk ever stream again? <laughs> um, never say never. Um, I'm uh, doing uh, working on another project now outside of the chess world, so concentrating on that. Um, but uh, for sure, uh, one day uh there's there's a very good chance i come back i i do miss it i i miss being with with you daniel commentating on all the great events i know i haven't uh commentated with you Casa before, but uh, you know you're a great great commentator so uh, absolutely never say never uh for the moment now i'm going to try my hand at playing a few games um we'll see uh watch this space We'll be on the lookout. Lawrence, uh, Kostya, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, you've earned your rest. We'll let you go. And Lawrence, good luck uh, in your match against Polina. Thanks, guys. Take care, fellas. Goodbye. Okay, that was Lawrence and Kostya, who just contested an incredible match. Lawrence wins it. He is the final winner. That determines the four players who advance past the group stage. It's Greg, Polina, Levy Rosman, and Lawrence Trent. Casa, we could not ask for more in the group stage. And I think we can't ask for more than these matchups in the bracket phase. Yeah, folks, we basically got through our group stage. And now we're going to be back in tr the traditional, more traditional SEC format that you see where they play extended periods of 5-1, 3-1, and 1 plus 1. And... I think we have a very, very competitive field and polarizing matchup. So I think the chat is also going to, you know, be quite polarized in who they think is going to win. Oh, absolutely. It's going to be two really close matches. Lawrence seems to have a great mindset and obviously Levy against Greg Shahadi. Uh, well, that match needs absolutely no introduction. Uh, what else needs very little introduction is something coming your way on October 15th. It is Judith Polgar's Global Chess Festival. Uh, it's going to be a really exciting event. You will not want to miss it. Tune in for an exciting triathlon where powerful teams compete in puzzle battles, tandem chess, and bullet chess, featuring our very own Grandmaster David Howell and other prominent players. Use exclaim chess fest in chat for details on the event. Coming your way two days from now. Okay, don't miss out on Judith Polgar's Global Chess Festival, and don't miss out on the continuation of the I Am Not a GM Speed Chess Championship. But for now, Casa, the time has come for us to wrap up. I'll throw the mic back at you one more time for your final thoughts on yesterday's action and today's scintillating series of matches. Yeah, I'm still kind of thinking about this King Walk uh, game we had much earlier in the group stage uh, that was just incredible. Um, I think, you know, this format just leads lends itself to really exciting chess. And again, there's all types of great players. I think so often we focus on the Magnus and Akars of the world, and deservingly so. But there's a whole another class of players that are way better than 99% of players out there and have their own chess to show. And I think we're getting a, a bit of that today and in future matchups. So stay tuned for the semis. You got some known names in there that you're going to enjoy, and we'll be watching. We will be watching very carefully. We hope that you were watching today and that you enjoyed the show. We'd like to thank everybody in the chat on YouTube and on Twitch for supporting your favorite player, our amazing production team, for all of their incredibly difficult work, including our producer, Hala. Casa, so fun to commentate with you as usual. But for now, Grandmaster Daniel Naraditsky, I am Casa Corley, bidding you goodbye from the I Am Not A GM Speed Chess Championship. So long.